All right, welcome to the Yahoo Finance Invest Conference live in New York City. You are seeing a bunch of amazing footage from inside Moonlight Studios uh, as our conference gets ready to kick off. Really, a lot of heart and hustle went into bringing this event to the investing masses. As you can see behind me, the crowd is starting to pour in. There's some Danishes off to the side. Very excited to get my eat on, but also very excited to talk to really an amazing, amazing group of guests. Join me on our pre-show panel here, pre-game panel, Brad Smith, Sean Smith, and our very own Miles. I forgot about that. No, two yeah. Smiths. Yeah, two <laughs> Smiths. No relation, uh, of Better. course, I should mention. Uh, but really, this is going on, guys. This is going to be an amazing day. Uh, of chats, the likes of Jeffrey Gunlock. The conference is starting with Hans Vesberg, chairman and CEO of Verizon. But for me, Shauna, it is some of the conversations that you're gonna have uh, and our very own Alexandra Canal with a Kevin Mayer, really investing in media. Jeff Zucker starting to merge after his time at CNN for the first time, uh, talking to Yahoo Finance and really getting out there in a big way, Brad, talking about the future of media and what he might be investing in. And let's keep in mind, this comes as shares of Disney, what, around a record low? Company reports earnings tomorrow. So who better else to talk to about the future of media than a Jeff Zarker? But of course, there's other themes at this conference as well. The economy, markets, Brad, I know you're looking at the labor movement. Of course, a big win uh, for the labor movement with General Motors and Ford. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and even as you mentioned, the media landscape, this is also taking place with the backdrop that there's still 160 plus thousand employees that are represented by SAG-AFTRA that are still looking for a deal. And so even as we think about the state of employment right now, it doesn't come without acknowledging that even within the most recent monthly jobs report, there was the acknowledgement of how strike impacted the numbers there. You mentioned the GM Ford Stellantis negotiations that took place for weeks and eventually netted out in a deal. But in that report, it showed up out of the 35,000 manufacturing jobs that were impacted, 33,000 of those due to the strike. And so ultimately, all that considered, we're going to be hearing more more about where wages stand, where that's continuing to moderate as a result of the strength in the employment and labor negotiations too. And that dovetails into the consumer as well, and how much people are feeling comfortable to spend. Yeah, it certainly does. We're going to be paying very close attention to what we're hearing from so many of these guests here today on the consumer, because we talk about the fact that the consumer has been so resilient, really putting so much more pressure on the Fed. And the commentary that we've gotten this earnings season, I think it's fair to say, has been relatively mixed. When you take into account what some of the travel CEOs, I talked to Southwest CEO last week, Expedia CEO during their Look at you name report. dropping, Sean. Uh, right? We're going to get everyone guy. in there as, right, big as, as much go. as we can. But they were basically saying that the consumer is very solid, comparing that to what we're hearing from banks. CEOs, they're starting to see some cracks in the consumer. And then, of course, Miles, there could be an event that maybe none of us even have on our radar. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the whole conference is very exec forward, very deals forward. But I am talking to Mark Spitznagel of Universal later today. Um, and of course, his fund is focused on black swan events. I don't think he cares for that characterization, but you know, maybe we'll get into that later. And it, it's sort of, you look at markets, they go up and down. We've been in a tough period, um, you know, for the S&P over the last couple of months. But Go back in time three years and you have this, you know, what, 30% crash in three weeks. Those are the kinds of events, you know, that Mark's really looking at in his fund to take advantage of. And I think what we've kind of seen in treasuries recently has been suggestive of that sort of action. What are the other pockets of the market? You know, I'm going to try to get this out of him that he thinks are interesting. Is it cryptocurrency? Is it the dollar? Is it gold? Where are we seeing right now the possibility, Sazi, for some of these bigger moves in markets that then feed down into the way that corporate executives, deal maker types, are, are evaluating their prospects? Miles, I look how what you write about markets in our morning brief newsletter. I encourage everybody to sign up. Josh Schaefer, a markets reporter for Yahoo Finance. Do you find it surprising that the market has reacted like this to a Fed that came out a couple days ago? I get what they said, but they still sounded very like we want to beat inflation into the ground. We're not, maybe we're not done, but maybe we are. Well, I think ultimately for markets, the thing that matters is like, it's the second derivative, the change in the rate of change. So the Fed right now is making fairly clear that they're not going to, even if they move once more, it's not going to be whatever it was, 425 basis points of rate hikes in a year, something like this. So if you can accept that we're going to be at five and a quarter, five and, you know, five and an eight, three eighths, for X amount of time, markets make their peace. You can do your math as an analyst, get to a number that sounds okay, and sure, a 6% move in the S&P in a week, uh, that's kind of a give back from I think what we've seen, but ultimately what the Fed is telling investors is something they can be more comfortable with, which is just a little more stability in what the next, call it two quarters, might look like. And I think 
I'm curious to, to see, if at all, how executives think about that in their business. They like to be very myopic, operator focused. They don't like to talk about macro, yeah. but the macro right now is such that it's hard to ignore it. I think you, it's hard to come on if you're the CEO of a big utility, a big railroad perhaps, yep. and say, I'm not worried about the Fed. I mean, they've got a lot of debt, they've yep. got a lot of operating costs, um, you know, vendors. So that all that stuff feeds down to them. Of course, I want to mention that uh, our pregame show is sponsored by our really longtime friends at Tasty Trade. They have a very big presence here. I'm very excited to talk to JJ Kinahan uh, very shortly uh, from the folks over at Tasty Trade, a uh, really great platform. But Brad, you know, outside of what Miles mentioned, the focus on markets, there's an undercurrent of leadership here. And I love that you start your day doing a Lindsey Vaughn workout. And oh yeah, Lindsey Vaughn is going to be in this room. But look, starting the day with a workout, Miles, as you know, it's very exciting. Look, I was drenched in sweat before 5.30 a.m. this morning, just getting pumped, getting amped. I wanted to give myself the full Lindsey Vaughn experience. And to do so, I had her send me her workout. She also posts them to Instagram from time to time. So I was drenched before I got here. I had to dry off, put on a suit, uh, and button up all my buttons, and then make it <laughs> make it here so that we can get some food and then get started. But I've never known more, and, and prepping for that interview, I've never known more about ski slopes and how that business is set up and how they play into that in the athlete side and how they prep for things like the Olympics. Well, I'm looking forward, of course, to uh, all things Lindsey Vaughn. But now let's get over to our very own Brooke De Palma, who's on the other side of the room, just, I don't know, hyping the action a little bit. Let's get over to Brooke. <laughs> Hype in the action indeed. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, friends. We're here at Yahoo Invest and guests are piling in. Verizon CEO Hans Vesberg just walked by me moments before. We're also waiting to hear from Marriott CEO later on in the day. And there's just so much excitement. As you can hear, the music is blasting. What a way to kick off this Tuesday. Something that I'm most excited for is I will be speaking to Kava CEO Brett Shulman ahead of their third quarter earnings report. We're going to hit on all things, whether it be consumer behavior, how much people are spending for their kava bowls and major growth plans from the company as well. We'll also be speaking to Subway CEO John Chidsey about that major deal with Work Capital that is yet to be confirmed. In addition to that, we'll also be chatting about ingredients within their Subway sandwiches, how the company is really bringing them into the future. In addition to that, we'll be hearing from personal finance gurus, one of my favorite, Haley Sachs, aka Mrs. Dow Jones. She'll be joined by her legacy media CEO. And all day today, as these guests pile in, we'll be hearing about how you can invest best into your portfolio. We have lots more coming, and the excitement has just begun. So stay tuned for a lot more. But in addition to that, as guests are certainly piling in, some major topics that we're really excited to hear about is consumer behavior. Are consumers spending less than maybe they were two years ago during uh, you know the height when so many were receiving stimulus checks? Are interest rates impacting consumer spending habits? And what exactly does foot traffic look like lately? So definitely stay tuned for lots more. Back to you guys up front. We're here, standing by. Brooke De Palma, great report spotting out Verizon uh, Chairman and CEO Hans Vestberg in the crowd. Brooke, loving the sideline report. Well, let's continue this markets conversation. Let's bring up our longtime friend, JJ Kinahan, CEO of IG North America. JJ, good to see you. Oh, it's, it's been a, pleasure, a while. Brian. Always appreciate yeah. your support here. You got the great suit memo. Yes, so we did. That is yeah, all that very good thing. Hashtag twinning, and I should say hashtag Yahoo Finance Invest. Uh, look, JJ, we just JJ, we just heard what Miles was talking about the Fed. Really, the Fed has, I think, made a decision to potentially stay higher for longer with interest rates. Is someone actively in this market, what does that mean to investors out there? Well, I think the biggest thing for investors is uh, the Fed may not raise rates because the market's done the job for them. But I think if you look back nine months, Brian, you know, you were reporting every day. People were talking about the Fed. OK, we'll have these rate cuts. We'll have these rate cuts. I think the plan on that is silly. So what does that mean for people who are trading every day who are or are managing their portfolios? Plan on looking at this. I think we're going to be stable for a while. I don't necessarily think that we're going to see rates go much higher. But on the other hand, being higher for longer could also mean steadiness. And actually, at the end of the day, I think that's what you're seeing in this rally we've seen over the last week and a half or so is the market is happy that for a while, perhaps, we can you, you can invest with a little more confidence. I think one of the things that the market lacked was real conviction because you're like, oh my God, what's the Fed gonna do? So if the Fed can keep us in an area where people can invest with conviction, longer term, that's what's actually really good. So do you think these gains are going to last? And I guess, what does that upside then look like? Well, I, I, I think we're going to last, I don't think we're gonna continue on this uh, great streak up, so to speak. Can we go up another uh, 100 S&P points? 
within the next six months? Yes, I believe we can. Do I think we're going to go significantly higher than that? No, but I guess the good side is I don't think we go, you know, significantly lower. I don't think we're going back under the, the 4,000 level on the S&P 500. How concerned are you, JJ, that so much wealth in this stock market is tied up in seven stocks? What is it, NVIDIA, yeah. Microsoft, Apple? What about the other 493 other stocks? Well, some of there? them, I think one of the good thing about the last week is some of them finally started to perform. Mm -hmm. What I'm really excited about right now, Brian, is think about this earnings season. We have had a lot of really positive reports. I know going into this week, and I'm sorry I didn't check the stat, uh, we had almost 80% of the companies beat. And so that's, that stat's normally around 65%. We had a few that didn't quite do as well this week. But that being said, uh, I'm very positive about that. I will say I do worry a bit as we have the retailers coming out, coming up, because I think they are in for a little bit tougher slog in the future. But at the end of the day, earnings drive markets. And so with that, when you continue to see good earnings, that will pay off in the long term. And I do think that it's been really nice to see some of the other sectors come out to play, if you will, which we haven't seen in a while. And the last thing I'll add to that is I'm really hopeful for the financials as we start to see perhaps the yield curve normalize that you know many people have been so disappointed in the financials. Well, they need to normalize yield curve even with higher rates in order to really benefit from this. JJ, where are you seeing the opportunity now then? You mentioned the fact that we're starting to see a little bit of a broadening out in terms of the outperformance that we are starting to see within the market. What do retailer, retail traders like right now and what do you like specifically? Well, I'll start with our, our, our clients overall. So not surprisingly, the main stocks are the seven we Still. just talked about, right? Uh, overall in terms of things they like. So as, as they start to go out, what's really been interesting to me is one of the stocks that's gotten a lot of love, and I'm going to use that one as a pun in a second, is Southwest Airlines. And so, I, I, in, in some of the you know about Southwest Airlines, I, did, I, I just talked to Bob Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. Oh, okay, Last there you go. Know. So, I think that that's to me a really interesting stock overall. And I, I will tell you, the opposite end of that is one of the stocks they have really not liked has been Carnival Cruise Lines. And so, what that starts to tell me is people believe that this travel boom will continue. And I think businesses in general are starting to pick it up. We've seen a little bit of love for the Delta Airlines also, but Carnival, we've definitely seen a lot of negative activity on. And so to me, that's been a really uh, a really big surprise overall, if you will. JJ, I have 30 seconds left. Yeah. A lot of focus at the conference is going to be on what's next for 2024. Big election season, likely more volatile markets. What's your best advice to investors watching on Yahoo Finance? Uh, my best advice to everybody is keep your trades smaller and more often. And the reason I say that is rather than buying 500 shares, maybe 100 shares, let the market move, then another 100, et cetera. I think the big mistake too many retail traders make is they're all or none. In this era of zero commissions, uh, I, I think that it really pays to let movement be your friend rather than your enemy. And that is one thing I would always advise people to do. And, and by doing it five different times, you also tend to get a better feel of what's going on in the market. It forces you to interact just like golfing. The more you swing, the better hopefully so you true. are. So true. Great advice. Is, you can relate to Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Great <laughs> advice as always. Uh, JJ Kinahan, CEO of IG North America. We appreciate your long-time support. Enjoy the conference. It was, it was really good to see you. Uh, great to be appreciate here. Thanks, Thanks, guys. so much. All right, guys. And now uh, we're getting ready to kick off our conference here at Yahoo Finance Invest. First up on stage is going to be Hans Vesper, Chairman and CEO of Verizon.
opening bell here. First one of the year. The stock has been on a tear this year. Silicon Valley Bank's collapse is the second largest bank in failure. Fight against inflation. Fixed mortgage rate 7. Let's look to the future. It's time to make big, bold decisions. And Yahoo Finance Invest is here to help. We're about to have a day of engaging conversations with top leaders, influential thinkers, and innovators on what's behind the headlines and where we're going next. The preeminent wealth building event of the year starts right now. Coming to you live from Moonlight Studios in New York City, this is Yahoo Finance Invest. This is so fun. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Invest Conference. So my name is Tracy Burns, as they said. I am a financial advisor with UBS. I'm a former Fox Business anchor. And during my journalistic tenure, I had the great pleasure of working with some of the journalists you're going to hear from today. Brian Sazi, Julie Iannuzzi, Kevin Burke in the back, Shauna Smith, you are in very good hands today. These people are some of the best in the business, and I had to make sure you knew that. So we're super excited to bring you this super timely event in person, in front of you, in a live studio audience. It's super cool. First, thanks to Tasty Trade, one of our sponsors. Thank you for spending the day here with us down in Moonlight Studios here in New York City. It is great to be out and in person. I'm sure you're all feeling that, and that's why you're here today. And also thanks to the millions of people streaming this event live with us right now on Yahoo Finance Live and engaging with us on social media. And speaking of social, if you want to engage with us on X, please use the hashtag YFinvest. All right, we should also mention that there's tons of new user experience on Yahoo Finance as well, so make sure you check that out. It's an exciting evolution for the online. Yahoo Finance Invest couldn't come at a more opportune time for you right now as investors, big and small out there. Look, there's geopolitical turmoil. I don't have to tell you that. In the Ukraine, in Israel, there's a war in the Middle East. I mean, it seems like it's deja vu. We've been talking about this stuff for years. It's all cooled investor sentiment. No one knows what to do in the uncertainty of these markets. Interest rates, of course, have risen. That's not news to anyone. Oil prices remain high. If you filled your gas tank on the way here, you know that for sure. And the average household is battling high unemployment and nagging inflation. Nagging, we have to underline and bold. And if anyone's bought eggs recently, they know what I'm talking about. The presidential election, of course, 2024, is already part of a concern for the market as well. Consumers don't know what to do. The markets don't know what to do. With all these challenges, there are pockets of opportunity. And that's why you're here today, because you're here to find them, I'm sure. AI fundamentally changing the way corporate America and market psychology interact. And of course, corporate profits are still robust, which is kind of an irony through this whole thing. The economy is still strong, minus Friday's jobs report, of course. So what do you do? This is why it's the perfect opportunity for you to be here and listen to some of the amazing people that will be on stage today. But to help us drive this discussion, the one, the only, your exec, uh, Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, my friend forever. Brian, the stage is yours, and it is well-deserved. Tracy, uh, you didn't tell me, uh, you know, eggs are really expensive. I, you know, I can't afford no eggs. What are you talking about? No eggs. There are no, no eggs. eggs. Well, Tracy, it's uh, really good to see you. Uh, it's been a while. Thank it's you for while. doing this. All right, we've pulled together uh, Yahoo Finance Invest Day to bring you answers to some of the questions Tracy just posed on this very stage and to get you thinking about your financial future and thinking a little bit outside the box as well. Uh, our newsroom is here to dig into the state of the financial world and its impact on the many decisions we make in our daily lives, such as buying eggs, like Tracy mentioned, with our incredible lineup of guests. Uh, we worked hard to make sure we packed the day with diverse perspective, always uh, very, very important. So you will hear from leaders like Double Line founder Jeffrey Gunlock, who is always 
very vocal on markets and the Federal Reserve. Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano and Skybridge founder Anthony Scaramucci, uh, who spent some time, of course, uh, very briefly in the Trump White House. And Olympic great Lindsey Vonn, who is just one of the greatest all-time uh, Olympians of our time. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with actor and tech investor Ed Norton, who I had no idea actually was investing in tech before this conference. I thought he just made movies we all spent, I don't know, 30 bucks to go see. And Grand Slam tennis champion Naomi Osaka. Very excited about that conversation. This is your chance to get their collective insights on where the markets and the world of business will move next and how you can make that work for you. Now, no stranger to navigating these economic ups and downs is Verizon Chairman and CEO Hans Vestberg, someone we know very well here uh, at Yahoo. From rolling out 5G in the United States to capitalizing on the latest iPhones to dealing with finicky regulators in an uncertain economy, Hans has been full steam ahead for the Verizon team, or as they like to say internally, the V-teamers. I've been so looking forward to kicking off Yahoo Finance Invest 2023 with this particular conversation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Hans Vesberg. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you. Appreciate you. you. Appreciate Thank you. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Hans, it's uh, good to see you, and it's still called V Teamers, right? V Teamers. That's the. <laughs> People work at Verizon, correct. <laughs> Everybody else that wants to be a V-teamer can be a V-teamer, so oh, that's okay. All right, fair uh, enough. It's good, it's good to see you here. And I think one of the things we're really going to be trying to get to the bottom here at Yahoo Finance Invest is what are leaders up against, not only right now, but for next year? As someone leading Verizon, what are some of the biggest challenges on your plate now that the year's almost over? If you look at the outlook, and I think that, first of all, I think the last five years has proven to be very uncertain, a lot of things that you didn't expect. So I think that leaders uh, need to have a balance between being in the front line sometimes and sometimes you'll stay back. And I think it comes up and down depending on what's happening and you need to be prepared for it. I mean, just think through the last five years with everything that's happened with the wars we have seen with the COVID and all of that. That's of course putting an impact on any corporation. And, and of course we are one of the biggest direct to consumer businesses in the United States. Uh, it, it's clear that you need to be very different. I became CEO the first time in 2009 for a public company. It's very different to be CEO of a, a large public company today than it was 2009. And, uh, but it's uh, all about having a, a diverse set of people around you that sees things a little bit different. I'm born in the northern part of Sweden, and there are few that are in Verizon that comes from the northern part. So you need diversity of other people with other experiences. And then, of course, seeing that you think about all the stakeholders you have uh, at the same time, because we are living in a in a time when you need to think about the stakeholders. Of course, shareholders are super important for us. Uh, customers ultimately pay the bills. You need to think about and how they are changed, and they have changed quite dramatically. I promise I'm paying my bills, Hans. I, <laughs> I promise you. Uh, I'm still making one, the payments. One of many doing really good <laughs> payments to Verizon. So, uh, and then of course the employees that are doing an outstanding job. And finally, we are. We're in every zip code in this country with infrastructure. We, we are in the local communities. See that that hangs together when you have crises, when things are happening is important. So when I look into next year, I mean, everyone that's an expert always tells me there's two quarters left, it's going to be an cri economical crisis. That has not been ongoing for quite a while. Uh, the only thing I can say, I came out my third quarter earnings for a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have the biggest uh, uh, consumer business in, in the country on telecommunication and probably direct to consumer. And so far, no, we haven't seen any payment issues. Uh, clearly, our consumers still continue to pay, our, pay the bills very well. We have the same sort of uh, bad debt as we had one year ago, two years ago, basically. So we probably have a little bit more high quality consumers in our, in our base. but. In general, we haven't seen anything yet. And I see everything, and I read everything, and I follow everything, but so far, nothing. So you need to be prepared. When you look at the, you also have a prepaid business. Yeah. Now, the prepaid business, the volumes have been under a little bit of pressure. What, yes. is, what does that tell you about the state of the consumer in this country? Actually, it tells you the opposite. So we have both the postpaid business and we have a prepaid business. We, uh, we have roughly 20 million uh, consumers in the, in the prepaid business. That business has been shrinking, and the main reason is that many uh, prepaid customers have be become postpaid on wireless. So they actually stepped up, because some of the offerings, and I think that was happening in 2022, and, and we, 
we had some challenges. I wasn't really happy with our performance in 22. We, we saw a sort of a leakage from postpaid down to prepaid. So the prices on the lowest uh, postpaid plans were basically equal or almost better than prepaid. So we saw a churn going upwards. Uh, and we were not part of that because we didn't have that possibility. Uh, so I think that's what we're seeing more. So that has been a pressure on the, on the prepaid business, has been much more that the step up to so postpaid has happened uh, in the market. But overall, if you take the overall wireless consumer market uh, in the United States, it's shrinking. It's less and less people. I mean, more and more children has a phone, uh, old people have phones. People like me. Or, you think people uh, are just taking better care of their phones? Is that is that delaying the upgrade cycle? No, oh. uh, no, it's not. I think it's two things, but it's, it's a little bit less upgrades. First of all, I think it's a, when you come to a mature market, we are very financial disciplined. Seeing that we have the right to offer in front of the customers, historically. The way to grow our business was to give a new phone for anyone. That, that model doesn't work when you're in a saturated market. You need to see that you have the right offering for every customer in every consumer segment. That's one. Uh, so I think that we actually consciously have decided to do less promotions. It was very promotion high in 2021 and 22 because 5G came out and everybody now going to capture new subscribers. That's less of that. Then, of course, we have also seen that the phones uh, they, they are more built on the software than the hardware, meaning you can keep a phone uh, uh, for much longer because it has the same performance as previous cycles. That is also br bringing down a little bit of up upgrade cycle. But all in all, it's very natural when you are within a mature 5G market. How would you grade the current upgrade cycle? Are you happy with how the iPhone is done? We, I think we are very happy how it performed for us. We, we continue to have very strong uh, uh, gross ads, new customers coming in in this cycle, uh, both on the business side and the consumer side. So uh, a fairly normal year for the iPhone 15 compared, you know, there's been year like uh, iPhone 12, which was the first 5G phone, which was a rocket. Uh, I think this is just a normal year. Uh, many people, be, or consumers being on iPhone 11, 12, has come up to 15. The ones sitting on 14 and 13, probably not moving. And then you have the sort of people that always want the new phone regardless of, which is, of course, doing it. But mainly... You always get the new phone, right? For some reasons, I do that. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why. But uh, of course, it's part of my job to test all the equipment, both the infrastructure and the phones. Yeah, Ver Verizon, of course, is uh, concentrated in the US, but Yuhans are very much a, a world leader. You have that really yep. world view. Yep. When you travel around the world, what is the impact you're seeing from higher interest rates, mostly out of the US? <sighs> So it's a little bit different. I mean, it depends on how much uh, in different com uh, countries, how much the, the, uh, the interest rates are hitting ultimately consumers. I mean, in the US, it's still so that much of the interest rate has not gone to the homeowners because uh, given how it is. In markets like in Europe, like Spain, it's an enormous impact because basically the, in the increased interest rates that passed almost immediately to the consumer. So then you see a slowdown much quicker than we see here because normally you would think about with all these interest rates going up, we see, would see a slowdown very quickly in the US. But we don't see it. And the reason is, of course, that not all that interest increase is going straight to consumers. It hits the ones that have variable interest rates, which corporations might have and, th uh, and things like that. So I see much more tougher in especially Europe. Uh, and then we see <clears throat> uh, the part of Asia uh, continue being very strong because they have st still a growth potential where when you grow very fast, then you can actually manage the interest rates in it, a better way. Is the rates at these levels, does it hinder how fast Verizon can grow next year? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have owner's economics on everything we have. Basically, we own all our uh, infrastructure, etc. So for us, it's basically, you think about it, we build one network, and then we, we want to have as many revenue generating uh, activities on top of the network. So it's a leverage model. So, so the more I, I, I can do with the network, the more revenues I can get. And then I have a scalable model where I have the best return on investment in the industry. So that's the whole idea for us. So it doesn't change. When my CAPEX in 22 was almost 24 billion. This year, I have my guidance between 18.25 to 1925. I'm going to end up in a higher range, meaning closer to 19 billion. 
so we still invest heavily in our business. And next year we have talked about our, our business as usual coming back now after a spike in five years, around 17 to 17 or a half billion dollars in CAPEX every year, which still is a sizable amount. So, uh, but it's not because of economy, it's more about the nature of how we have built the network and where we are in the build out. Hans, before I came on here, I went to the Yahoo, new Yahoo Finance launch today, amazing new platform, and I went to your stats page, and I was, look, I was surprised to see Verizon stock yielding 7.5%. I'm hearing, listening to you, talking about the consumer continues to be doing pretty well. I know you're cutting billions of dollars of costs. What's the market missing here? I think that, we, it, first of all, we, <clears throat> in part of 22, we, we didn't perform Perfect. I mean, we are the leader. We're the number one in the market. The expectation on me and my team is that we are so much better than anybody else. We had a little bit challenge the first half year. We didn't do re really well on consumer. We did a lot of changes in the company. Uh, basically, I changed almost the whole management team here in the beginning uh, in, in April. Uh, we start to be much more segmented in our consumer business. Now we've seen the traction the last two quarters. They're really good. On broadband, we do. Great, we have done, we do more than 400,000 new broadband uh, customers every quarter right now. Uh, we are positive on net ads on wireless uh, in this third quarter. Our cash flow, we increased our cash flow projection for the year to 18 billion plus. So a lot of things are going in the right direction. So I think we had a dip there. And then, of course, the whole industry, the telecom industry, has come down, uh, uh, especially on the multiples. So I think that's why we are. Uh, on uh, a very high yield. And second, the interest rate is playing a game for us as well, because many of our uh, retail consumers, of course, seeing us more sometimes as a bond, given that we have increased our dividend for 17 consecutive years. We're a really good dividend uh, yielding company. So of course, when interest rates come up, it's a trade-off. So uh, I think those are playing in, partly our own performance, which is going in absolutely that right direction right now, and then the uh, uh, the, the market, the, the financial market with a high interest rate is impacting it. But I would say it's a hell of a good deal. All right, fair enough. I want to leave, I want to leave a good amount of time seven here. Seven and a half percent. Is, that's, I mean, that's not when bad. Look what treasuries are. Seven and a half percent are. before. Yeah, you can say it's a denominator that is low, but it's still a good yield. Uh, I want to leave a good amount of time because a lot has been made recently about your how you approach leadership on how you grade. <laughs> for those not familiar, walk us through this because it sounds like uh, you've been doing this for a while. How do you lead and how do you judge yourself on a daily basis? Uh, okay. It started actually very early in my career to start focusing on what I'm really good at and then seeing that I have people that are really good on what I'm bad at. And, and my list of, of, of good is fairly short, and the list of what I'm not good at is really long. Uh, but one thing that I think I'm good at, and you have actually been a V-teamer, so you know it. I think I give energy, and I'm, 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 I'm good leading big organization. Uh, and that means that I need to have energy, I need to have, be motivated. So I started 2009 to <clears throat> to grade myself every morning the day after from a scale to zero to 10. And if I'm between zero to two, I'm usually in bad mood. I have a shit day, you know. Uh, I shouldn't be around people. I should tell me you're a seven right now. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, and I should not be on a stage here, because it might be the only time my investors see me or my customers or whatever. Um, I should be between three maybe eight, that's my sweet spot, and, and I bring out my best leadership skills uh, in order to see that I do the best for Verizon every day. I usually say, if I'm between nine and 10, I have too much energy, so people can be a little bit tired of me. <laughs> so I've been doing this since 2009, so I've graded myself every day since 2009. But it's just a way for me to see that I give the best I can to my shareholders and to my stakeholders every day. I know I'm here, uh, uh, it's an enormous platform, I have an enormous responsibility. If I can improve myself every day, uh, I have to, so that's why I'm doing it. What areas are you looking to improve on as a leader next year? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think that for me, the most important is to see that I get my team in harmony, they have the right uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, circumstance around them to execute well. I think what I'm put, them, put in place right now, the, I'm, I'm really uh, happy with assets we have all the way from infrastructure or things we have 
acquired, the things we have divested. Uh, I think we are in a really good place with assets. I think that's what I've given my team. And now we need to work together to see that we leverage that for our shareholders uh, the next uh, uh, couple of years here. But we have a very clear uh, path, what we want to do. We have a clear capital allocation uh, strategy in, in order to see that we both are, uh, can invest in our business, but also please our shareholders. So I think the team has those, and my job the next year is to see that the team really are using those assets to the best. You mentioned that you, you changed a management team. How difficult is it to do that as a leader? <laughs> it's part of life. Uh, <laughs> No, I think that sometimes you feel, I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm into my sixth year, you know, uh, put in a team from the beginning, and then suddenly many of them were, they wanted to leave. Uh, there were some exits that I wanted, and we did that in, in one way. Instead, in the piecemeal organization with new leaders every quarter, I said, let's do it all in once. It's worked extremely well. I moved people in, inside, which I think is, it's one of the best you can do. I took the head of business to be the head of consumer. I took my head of networks being head of business. And you see how good they are when they have diversity and view uh, of the whole business, and they know all the other functions. So they were very quick into uh, the business, very quick to execute. So I'm really looking forward to continue to execute with that team. And lastly, Hans, when is 6G coming? <laughs> Uh, right. no, that was off script. That's uh, just no, off script. No, no, I know that. There was a lot of off script here, actually. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't matter. I'm fine. Uh, 6G, I think that right now, I don't think it's maybe early 30s. Uh, the design principle is just happening, but I don't think that you will see uh, and have a 6G in the, uh, phone in your hand until 2032 or something like that. Wow, that is uh, fascinating. Hans, it's good to see you again. Uh, really, uh, really no stranger to Yahoo Finance. Uh, Verizon Chairman and CEO Hans Vesberg. Give it up to him. Appreciate it. Hans, well, good to see you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Hans uh, exiting stage left, as they say. Now, even with all this economic uncertainty, that little bit what you heard from Hans, of course, you heard about his opportunities uh, in phones and, and various wireless parts of his business. Uh, this year has been a, a really a strong and I would say great one for the lodging industry. Uh, the business travel is back in a big way post pandemic. Of course, a lot of these folks have been on the road using their 5G phones uh, powered by Verizon. Uh, consumers are opting for vacations instead of a new large screen TV. That much is for sure. Growth in China for the major hotel chains has also shot back to life in a big way. Marriott has strung together a host of strong earnings reports on the back of all of these trends. The question is, can it continue this holiday season and beyond? Joining me on stage is Marriott CEO, Anthony Capuano. <laughs> Anthony, good to see you. Good to see you. Appreciate it, appreciate it. So, uh, Anthony, I know you're excited about 6G, like Hans just talked about, right? Yeah. Yeah, 6G, 6G phones. You can use it out there on your trips to your various uh, hotels. But thanks for flying in today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Great to be here. So you, uh, I've known you for a while, and I think one thing that stuck out to me is that you are very much um, a road traveler. Uh, you're back on the road. You're traveling in these hotels. Let's start on the U.S. What is the vibe in the U.S.? We just heard Hans talk about the consumer continues to do well. Do you see cracks in that armor from your perspective? Not yet. And when you look at, at macroeconomic trends, you look at some of the headwinds, you might expect to see it. We're just not seeing it in the data yet. Uh, as you pointed out, we just reported third quarter earnings. We had a security analyst conference a few weeks ago, and we had guided for the third quarter 6 to 8% RevPAR growth globally. We actually outperformed. We hit about 9%. And that was a mix. We had about 4% RevPAR growth in the US and Canada, 22% internationally. So that 4% is a solid number, which I think reflects the speed with which our borders opened the speed with which domestic travelers got back on the road. And so the US travel market is really sort of settling into a more stable environment. But what's encouraging to me, we're seeing strength across all three segments. Uh, early in the recovery from the pandemic, it was a leisure-led recovery. And so there have been lots of questions about whether that would uh, continue. In the third quarter, 
We saw 9% revenue growth in leisure, so really strong continued demand on the leisure side. Group, which has been maybe the most remarkable story as we've watched the recovery. When we look at forward bookings in the group segment into 24 in the US and Canada, revenue's up 14% year over year. And even business transient, where most of the questions exist, Again, in the US, to your question, we saw revenue up 4%. So we're seeing consistent strength across the segments. Why? Well, a few reasons. Uh, I think maybe my wife and daughter excluded. Most consumers learned during the pandemic uh, they don't need another watch, another purse, another pair of We can all use another watch. Uh, let's, well, uh, perhaps. OK, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. But I think pre-pandemic, we had seen in the consumer data, we spend a lot of time with our credit card partners tracking consumer spending. And with some of the younger generations, we'd already seen a pivot away from spending on consumer goods towards experiences. It appears when we look at that same data today that the pandemic acted as an accelerant to that trend across generations. And so to your question, why? I think folks have concluded how much they love travel. And when that was temporarily taken away from them in the early days of the pandemic, it was a reminder of that deep passion to explore the world. And now that borders are opening, uh, they want to make sure they take full advantage of those opportunities. Uh, you mentioned forward bookings. How did the holidays look? Great. Terrific. In terms of leisure and business? Yeah. Wow. Can this continue next year? We sure think so. Uh, again, at our security analyst conference, we laid out a three-year model, and we uh, laid out an expectation of over a three-year forecast period, three to 6% global rev bar growth, which again, I think reflects, right now we're obviously benefiting from terrific year-over-year -year comparisons, particularly in the international markets. That three to 6% is more reflective of a stable growth environment. I remember before you became the CEO of Marriott, you came to the Yahoo Finance office in, in New York City. You were leading development. Yes. Uh, and at the time, we popped into a, one a huddle room. Then the rooms were actually open. And we were able to talk about the impact to interest rates and how you grow your business in a period of just fluctuating interest rates. Well, interest rates are likely to stay higher for a yep. long time. This has to be stunting what you do at Marriott. Yeah, although interestingly, I mean, you know our business model. We have nearly 8,700 hotels globally. We only own 20. So our net unit growth is driven on the shoulders and the balance sheets of our owner and franchisee community. The vast, vast majority of that community are long-term investors in the sector. So they don't tend to try and time their investments over a quarter or two. They tend to hold these assets for years, if not decades. So I would submit to you, of course, an elevated interest rate environment puts pressure on the, the unit uh, level economics of a development project. But today, the biggest impediment in the US market and in Western Europe is the availability of debt for new construction. And the irony, particularly here in the US, when you talk to regional lenders or even big balance sheet lenders, they will tell you when they scan their commercial real estate portfolio, often the hospitality loans are the best performing sector. The issue is concern they have about what liquidity requirements may be imposed by the regulators. And so they'll say, we love our partners, we love the hospitality sector, call us next year. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the reason you hear us and the other big brand companies so focused on conversion activity because the ability to source debt for existing assets with a track record of, of cash flow is infinitely easier than sourcing debt for new construction. Last week, Anthony, I got to, to spend some time with J.P. Morgan CEO J, uh, Jamie Dimon, and I didn't realize at the time, but I went back and looked at the transcript. He mentioned that banks are starting to pull a little bit back on lending. Do you see that? The people that are developing these hotels, do you see that they're, they're pulling back because of this new normal rate environment? Yeah, no question. Although, again, at least in the hospitality sector, I think it's a little less about the elevated interest rate environment and a little more about expectations that with pressure on the commercial office sector, uh, pressure on the commercial real, uh, excuse me, retail sector, that there will be increasing liquidity requirements placed on lenders. Do you see a lot of gloom coming in commercial real estate? Uh, I'm worried about the office sector and I'm worried about the retail sector. 
Do you think that depresses prices? Is it a widespread thing, or is it concentrated? Uh, I think it's concentrated in certain markets. Interesting. So you, as I mentioned earlier, are that road warrior. You're out there traveling the world. You have 27 hotels in Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. Before we dive deep into you know, what the longer term future, future might be for these operations, what has the near term been like as a lot of the geopolitical tensions have erupted the past month? So as you would expect, we're seeing a fair volume of cancellations in those markets as well as across our five hotels in Israel. Um, that, mar that set of markets represents less than 1% of our global fees. So I, I mean, I think we look at, at the tragedy there through two lenses. We look at it through the human toll, which is extraordinary, and we continue, like I'm sure your audience, to pray for a peaceful resolution. From a, a clinical business perspective, uh, today it's relatively modest impact on our business, but we do worry about the potential ripple effects across broader uh, markets in, in the region. What do you tell leaders in the region? Or what have you been telling them? Well, we tell them principally to be singularly focused on the welfare, safety, and security of our guests and our associates. Do you have to put in new safety protocols in these hotels? Um, you know, any time we see unrest, we tend to go to threat level red, and so those are well-established safety protocols, and those are all in place in those properties. Does this situation make you rethink the commitment to the wider Middle East region? No. Absolutely not. So you see, you think you'll still open hotels? Yeah, no question. I mean, we've got a robust pipeline across the region. And, and when you think about our core priorities, one of those core priorities is to keep our traveling public within the Marriott ecosystem. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to make sure I, I can offer you the right product everywhere you want to travel for every trip purpose. Because to the extent I fail in that regard, I'm almost forcing you into the arms of our competitors. I want to keep you in that ecosystem. Outside of the Middle East, of course, Marriott is no stranger to uh, China. How's that business doing? Terrific. It's our second largest market. We just opened our 500th hotel in China, a uh, beautiful Ritz-Carlton Reserve in the Rasai Valley. Uh, we've got another more than 400 hotels in the pipeline behind that. Uh, the operating environment in China is more than fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. And the thing that I think gives us so much optimism about the near-term future of the China market, that recovery is in many ways on the shoulders of domestic demand. Today, only about half of the international airlift into China has been recovered. And expectations are by the end of the year, maybe we'll get to 60%. And so as we look into 24 and beyond, we think there's still meaningful upside as more and more international airlift capacity returns. Uh, so we're quite bullish about China. And then on the development front, as you might expect, when the country was largely locked down, many of our projects were, were paused. Uh, we saw below historical levels of fallout from the pipeline. And the vast majority of those projects have restarted. Is it as tough to do business in China as many lead it to believe? Well, I, you know, I think we have a little bit of a, a different, unique, and advantageous approach there. Uh, again, we are an asset light model. So that 500 hotel portfolio did, that I described, that 400 hotel pipeline that I described, it is almost entirely China owned. A meaningful portion is state owned enterprise owned. The vast majority of our workforce across China is Chinese national workforce. And so I think we, we have the ability to navigate and, and maybe stay a bit above the fray of some of the complexities between the US and China um, geopolitical dynamic. You mentioned uh, a little while back your, your recent earnings. And I, I think I got this guy right. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, please do. You bought back $950 million of stock. That is about 7% of your market cap. What's the message there to investors? That is a very large number and a large percentage of your market cap. Well, and in fact, in the Security Analyst Conference, we talked about during this three-year period, returning between buybacks and dividends somewhere between 11 and $14 billion over that three-year period. To me, the message is the beauty of our asset light model. When markets are performing well, when the, tr the public is out there traveling, that asset light model generates an extraordinary amount of cash. 
and, and our broad philosophy about managing the balance sheet. And I know this from my days in development. I tried as hard as I could to invest as much of that free cash flow back into the business as possible. And we'll continue to take advantage of opportunities that we think are accretive to shareholders. But the model generates so much cash that when travel is strong, uh, we have the opportunity to return a lot of capital. Well, to will our you continue at that pace? Because some would say, and I've heard this in the past, that it's almost like taking the company private. Well, we're a long way from that. I think we've got 300 some odd million shares outstanding. So we're a long way from going private, but we will, uh, you know, sometime in the next year or two, probably have bought back the entirety of the shares that we issued to acquire Starwood. Several wow. years ago. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Starboard because you're no stranger to doing big deals. And as you know, we have Choice Hotels battling Wyndham out there. And, and that is going to be a, a, a merger battle, not unlike, I, I would say, uh, Happen and Marriott Starwood. What do you think about that battle? Well, I'd say they're very different circumstances. And as it relates to the Choice Wyndham deal, I know what you know, what, what you and your colleagues are reporting. Uh, I think the, the stark difference is. Uh, Starwood, I think, was quite receptive to our approach. Uh, the only difference was there was another bidder in OnBang. Here, you've got a, a more hostile approach. Uh, in the Starwood Marriott transaction, a big part of, of the acquisition was Marriott stock, which the Starwood board saw high value. As you've heard in the press recently, uh, I think Wyndham's leadership and board view Choice's stock and its relative value quite differently. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to watch how it plays out. Do you want to get involved? Do you have any interest in Wyndham? Uh, we're really happy with our portfolio. Would that tie-up have any impact to Marriott? Well, uh, they would be the second biggest lodging company in the world by room count uh, behind us. I think they'd end up with a million two or a million three rooms as compared to our million five. They'd be heavily concentrated in the lower quality tiers. As you know from our last conversation, we're now entering the mid-scale tier, uh, not just here in the US with the launch of Studio Res, but with Four Points Express in, in the EMEA region, with City Express in the Cala region. And so we would compete more directly with some of their brands. That would be the most obvious impact to that merger. Lastly, we just asked Hans a little bit about how he leads the company. He has a grading system, which I think I kind of need to start baking into my own life. But as they would say, uh, we'll take that offline. Do you have any system like that? Well, I, I mean, our system is 96 years in the making. Mm -hmm. And it's really a set of core values that were established by our founders. And it starts with putting people first. Uh, because of our asset light model, uh, our human capital is arguably our most valuable resource. And so it's making sure they understand our broad objectives, giving them the tools to chase those objectives and the support, and then letting them go do what they do every day. How do you stay sharp as a leader? Uh, what is your day-to-day? -day? Sugar-free Red Bull. Sugar-free Red Bull. <laughs> well, great. We got something in common. I knew I, knew I always liked you, uh, Anthony. Well, how do you, how do you manage your time? There's a lot of demands. And yeah, it's... I, I lean heavily on an extraordinary leadership team. On the long list of attributes I love about our company, we've got a long tenured, what I've called battle-tested leadership team that have been there through decades. They've been through recessions, global conflicts, the impact of 9-11, the, the Great Recession. And so that's a team that really helps me navigate all the opportunities and all the challenges that the company faces. Lastly, before we let you go, sugar-free Red Bull, really? That, that's Absolutely. Okay. One a day, right? As far as you know. <laughs> OK, <laughs> fine, fair enough. Uh, your biggest opportunity for Marriott in 2024? Well, I, I'd say it's three things. I, you know, Without question, uh, we want to make sure we have the, the biggest, most attractive set of brands and experiences of any company in travel. Number two, we want to build the most loyal, most engaged set of customers, and we do that through our Bonvoy loyalty platform. And then the third I, met, I mentioned earlier, I want to be everywhere our guests want to travel so they never have a reason to look outside our ecosystem. You know, I'm sending you uh, my best of list for energy drinks now after this. OK. <laughs> I appreciate it. It'll be it. hard to turn me. All right, I got you. I got you covered there. All right, great conversation there. Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano, thanks for coming down specifically for this event. Anytime. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Great to see you, my friend. Thank you. All right.
Note to self, I have to get off the Red Bull a little bit, but if it works for Anthony, maybe it is working for me. All right, staying with observations from the C-suite, I had the chance to catch up with JP Morgan Chairman and CEO Jamie Dimon, head of Invest, like I just mentioned. Jamie had a lot to say about the state of the economy and what the Federal Reserve may do next. Take a watch during our short commercial break. We'll be right back. NYU professor of economics and CEO of Rubini Macro Associates, and of course, Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman. Please welcome them to the stage. Hey, everybody. So we're going to talk about Bidenomics, the Biden economy, for a few minutes here. Uh, the Biden economy is not too shabby. Uh, we have been tracking the Biden economy in what we call the Yahoo Finance Bidenomics report card since Biden took office. We give Biden a grade of B 
on the economy currently. That does include inflation, but it also includes really strong job growth, uh, stock market performance, and a few other metrics. Uh, but we know that Biden is getting uh, basically no credit from voters for things that are going right in the economy. His approval rating is around 40 percent. That's very weak. Uh, his approval rating on handling of the economy is even lower than that. So we did this poll and we wanted to get into uh, what are voters and ordinary people actually thinking about the Biden economy. So here are just a few of the findings I want to go through. Um, we wanted to see if people accurately assess what is going on in the economy. So we asked about inflation. Um, do you think it's unusually high, about average, or unusually low? And you can just pay attention. Just, watch, just look at the top bar. The others are a breakdown by party. But on inflation, people get it. 88% uh, say inflation is unusually high, or it has been unusually high during last year. That is correct. Then we said, uh, would you describe job growth uh, during the last two years as weak, average, or strong? And here we had 79% uh, of uh, registered voters in this poll saying, uh, job growth is either unusually weak or only above average. And that is the wrong answer. Uh, job growth has been unusually strong under uh, Biden, and only 20% said that. Uh, we did ask, um, what do you think is going to happen in the next 12 months? Uh, we had 62% uh, saying they think inflation is going to go higher. Even though inflation has been coming down, voters seem to think it's going to go higher still. And then we said, what do you think is going to happen? Is the economy going to get, going to get stronger or weaker? And 56% say they think the economy is going to get weaker. So Americans are very gloomy about the economy. And Noriel Rubini is going to help us understand why. Noriel, do you understand these disconnects, why people are so bummed out, even though certain parts of the economy are doing quite well? <clears throat> Sorry, I have a bit of a sore throat. Um, um, well, as you, as you pointed out, first of all, the economy is doing reasonably well. You know, third quarter, quarter, third quarter growth was 4.9 percent. Growth has been above potential. Inflation has been high. Has gone from 9 percent towards 3 percent. Unemployment rate is very, very low, below the structural unemployment rate. And job creation has been robust, slowing down right now. So there is a clear disconnect between what uh, this poll suggests and what the actual economic data are. I think there are probably several factors that explain that disconnect. Factor number one was that inflation was uh, quite high until recently, and it eroded the real wages. And uh, wages were growing less than inflation. Therefore, there was a significant fall in the last year and a half in real wages. They're now going up again because wage growth is robust and inflation is falling. But for a while, inflation was rising. And people look at their pocketbooks, and they see that food is more expensive, energy is more expensive, a whole bunch of other services are more expensive. Uh, and that, that, that's part of the problem. Secondly, there is economic insecurity about the future. Clearly, the economy is doing well right now, but there is a worry that uh, eventually we may get into a recession. There is income and wealth inequality, and economic activity might slow down as opposed to picking up. Three, even if inflation is low right now, say 3%, the price level at which you're buying, say, food or energy or other services is higher. And the only way you could have a, a situation in which uh, prices are lower the way they were before, for example, COVID, would be if we had a recession. And that recession would lead to a deflation. But that's not the way you want to get lower prices. So at some point, when inflation occurs, even inflation is falling, the level price is higher, so real income might be squeezed. And that's something that cannot be resolved, something we have to accept. So there's a variety of different factors that explain this kind of a economic malaise in the polls. So we're not going to ask you to be a political prognosticator, but you are an economic prognosticator. Yeah. Um, what is, do you think is going to happen in the economy during the next 12 months leading up to Election Day, which is basically a year from now? Oh, well, there were. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. There are three scenarios about the economy. One right now looks like uh, highly unlikely, a real, say, hard landing, severe recession, and a financial crisis. Six months ago with the banking problem, that was a risk. A year ago with rising inflation commodity prices, that was a risk. That tail risk is lower. So the question is whether the economy is going to have a soft landing, where you go back to 2% inflation. Uh, without any recession, or whether it's going to be a softish, bumpy landing where in order to achieve 2% inflation, 
you're going to have a, a short and shallow recession. I would say that the, the jury is still out on that. The economic David actually right now look like in the direction of soft landing. Growth is still about potential. Inflation has been falling, and therefore we're going in the right direction. But interest rates are higher, higher for longer. That may slow down the economy. There are geopolitical risks that might lead to a spike in energy prices. And therefore, there are factors that could lead us to a short and shallow recession. And now, from a political point of view, even a short and shallow recession will be very damaging for Biden. Because if there was a recession during an election year, of course, his popularity will further decrease. Yeah. So uh, we, political polling is, is one thing which is not an, eco an economic indicator, but consumer confidence surveys are an economic indicator. And many of them are terrible. I mean, they are, uh, they are re re recessionary. I mean, it, people's attitudes are similar to what they are like during a recession. Do you see no um, uh, way in which people are going to feel better about the economy during the next 12 months? Well, it depends. <clears throat> if in the next 12 months we have a soft landing, if growth stays above potential, if inflation falls further, if real wages are increasing, then I think the consumer confidence is going to be increasing over time. The consumers, by the way, have still a buffer of about a trillion dollars of savings. 5% of their disposable income they can use in case there is a slowdown in the economy. And that's one of the reasons why the economy is going to be stronger than otherwise. We have the CHIPS Act, we have the Infrastructure Act, we have the IRA. Those are going to be fiscal boosts to the economy and to real incomes. So as long as the economy is going to do well and avoid the recession, I think consumer confidence is going to likely improve over time. Uh, you, I mean, you think it'll improve over 12 months, enough to move the needle in the presidential election? Um, let's put it this way. Sentiment matters, but uh, people look also at what's happening. If there is a soft landing, if economic growth is above potential, if job creation is still robust, if uh, inflation is lower, if unemployment is low, I think at some point people are going to realize that their economic conditions are better than their foul mood. And some of that foul mood is also partisan. If you look at these polls, most Republican, regardless of the economic conditions, think the economy is poor. Most Democrats think otherwise. So there's also a little bit of a partisanship. Yeah. I think there's a bit of a bias in these polls. So you mentioned those, uh, the, some of the, that big legislation Biden has signed. Um, there was the Infrastructure uh, Act in 2021 the so-called in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act in 22, which had really nothing to do with inflation. That was about green energy mostly, the, the Semiconductors Act also in 2022. Yeah. Um, some of this is, is, this is not business as usual. This is a more robust government role in, yeah. in the economy. Um, what are your thoughts on how this is affecting the economy and is it address, is it gonna do anything about income inequality, which you just mentioned? Um, well, I would say that <clears throat> there was an economic doctrine of neoliberal policies that was actually bipartisan when George W. Bush was president, when Clinton was president, when Obama president. That was the view. Uh, and that was more, glo more globalist, engaged yeah, with China. Yeah, free trade, engaged yeah. with China, open up, free migration, uh, small budget deficits, deregulation, and so on. For many reasons, this has led to income and wealth inequality and economic malaise. So it's out of the window. It was out of the window even before Biden came to power. If you think about Trump, his policies were completely different from traditional GOP that used to be in favor of big business, big tech, uh, Wall Street, and you name it. So that movement towards more neo-populist policies, protectionism, a more uh, government intervention in the economy, more subsidy to the private sector, more regulation, bashing big business, started under Donald Trump. The problem with Donald Trump was the Iran as a populist and Indian government as a, as a plutocrat, tax act for the rich, bashing labors and so on, while Biden has become a true neo-populist and his economic policies, whether it's on trade, whether it's de-risking, whether it's controlling China, whether it's uh, restricting migration, whether it's stimulating the economy with infrastructure, reshoring of manufacturing, French shoring, and so on, go in the direction of rebuilding the economic and the job base of the United States. So in some sense, conceptually, Trump and Biden are close to each other, but one pretended to be a populist, while one is a truly an economic populist. 
So is that, what is the uh, outcome going to be of what Biden is doing with the economy? First of all, is it, does it stand to think that this, could, this will last even if we have a change of administration? Because as you know, administrations flip-flop on policies. Is this, is this sort of the new uh, uh, neopopulism here to stay? And is it going to address income inequality and many, th many of the problems that Donald Trump actually kind of put his finger on in 2016? Well, I think that regardless of whether Biden wins or Trump, uh, uh, policies that are of the risking of protectionism, of deglobalization, of decoupling on one side, restricting migration, a greater role of subsidies to favorite sectors that are strategically important, whether it's uh, uh, semiconductors or others are going to remain. Of course, the policies of Biden and Trump on climate change are very different. Biden has passed the IRA Act, but the IRA Act is actually very popular in uh, red states that are investing massive amounts of money into all this renewable energy. So it's going to stay. Those subsidies are going to be there regardless of who's in power. So I would say there'll be more continuity in terms of economic policy rather than differences between Trump and Biden. I mean, you're and on income inequality. I would say there's been a massive rise in income and wealth inequality. That's why even the GOP has become populist and against Wall Street, big business, big tech. It's not very easy to address income and wealth inequality, but if you can invest in your country, invest into infrastructure, invest in manufacturing, invest into reshoring, over time, those types of policy can help blue collar, white collars, and those left behind, regardless of who is in power. You are, I mean, you're endorsing protectionism to some extent, correct? I'm not endorsing protection. I'm saying there are some elements of de-risking or decoupling that for geopolitical reasons we have to do. As Jack Sullivan said, we want a small yard with high fences to see what's actually truly strategic. And paradoxically, when Trump imposed tariffs against Chinese goods, those were just consumer goods. They were not strategically important. While in the case of Biden, is semiconductors, technologies, and other things that are strategically important to the United States. So even if you want to do the risk, you have to do it in the right way. Um, is, there, is there anything that you feel Biden should be doing in that regard that he is not doing? I think that the biggest problem that we're facing is the one of our large budget deficits. Some of the strong growth is coming from very loose fiscal policy. It started under Republicans, first the tax cuts of Trump and then the stimulus during COVID, and it was continued by the Democrats. The trouble is when Republicans are in power, they cut taxes, but they're unable to cut spending. And when Democrats are in power, they increase spending, but they cannot raise taxes as much. And therefore, we have structural large budget deficits that stay regardless of either the Republican administration or a Democratic. And now these large budget deficits are leading to a rise in interest rates, nominal real, both on the short end and long end, and that can crowd out economic growth over time. So that's the biggest risk we face. So whoever is going to be in power, eventually fiscal consolidation is necessary. But because of the partisanship between the two parties, we're not going to have a resolution to this problem, especially of entitlement reforms, because our social security system and our Medicare, of course, are not sustainable. Pay as you go system with large unfunded liabilities. Yeah. OK, good. I'm glad you got into that. Uh, in just a couple minutes left, let's see how much we can cover on the bond market. How, can you tell our audience how much of the recent increase in longer term rates, the rates that affect mortgages, car loans, and so forth, how much of that do you attribute simply to the size of the U.S. Uh, budget deficits, which is uh, ongoing treasury issues? Because there are other things going on. China is not buying U.S. treasuries the way it used to. It's actually selling and things like this. So can you isolate out for us, for us the effect of the U.S. fiscal situation on rising interest rates? Well, the short rates have been rising because of the Fed yeah. tightening. Uh, long-term interest rates have been rising in part because of a tighter monetary policy, but those in part because we have now larger budget deficits. The Fed, instead of buying the bonds, is doing quantity tightening, selling them passively. The demand for treasuries from our strategic rivals, of course, is falling because they worry about us seizing assets of China like we did for Russia, Iran, and North Korea. 
as the Japanese normalize policy rates, money is going to flow back from treasuries back to Japan. So the supply of treasury is going to be large because of the large budget deficits. Demand from actors, whether it's the Fed, foreign sovereign wealth funds, or private investment is falling. And therefore, the new equilibrium is one in which nominal and real yields are going to be higher for longer. I would say the equilibrium 10-year treasury is not anymore 1%. It's probably something like 5 to 6%. 2% inflation and at least 2.5% real rates. So you wrote the book Mega Threats, uh, which is out in paperback today, I think. Yes. Um, is this a mega threat? Yes. In, uh, in the first two chapters of my book, the first two chapters, the first one is titled The Mother of All Debt Crisis. And I pointed out that debt to GDP ratio, private and public, implicit and explicit, have gone through the roof for the last 40 years. However, until 2020, while debt ratios were high, debt servicing ratios were low. Zero policy rates, negative policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing. There were $18 trillion equivalent of public debt in Europe and Japan, up to maturity of 10 years at the negative nominal yield until 2020. That part is over. As interest rates rise on the short end and on the long end of the yield curve, debt servicing ratios are now becoming higher and higher. And whether you are a household or a corporate or a business or a bank or another financial institution or a government or a country that has too much debt and leverage, eventually you're going to end up into debt distress. Now, if you're an emerging market, you have to default. If you're an advanced economy, uh, borrowing local currency can always wipe out the real value of long duration fixed income through unexpected inflation. And that's what I think is going to happen. We're not going to default on our debt. We're going to wipe it out away with inflation over time. Okay, I hope President Biden is listening. We have outlined the problems, started talking about a few solutions. Noriel Rubini, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so our live stream is going to take a break. Think, think of being at a football game. They're going to commercial break. We're not. We're still going to be here. So for those of you that are still here,
we'll bring them back. Scott Sperling is co-CEO of Sperling Partners. He's been in the, the firm's been in the market for decades. Consider this stat. THL Partners has spent almost 40 years investing, been an operator, and raised 35 billion of equity capital in the process. So at this point, please, let's welcome Scott and Shauna Smith of Yahoo Finance to the stage. Thank you, please. Thank you. Well, Scott, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us very here welcome. once again. So as Tracy just laid out, it's a very tough time right now for investors. When we talk about all the uncertainty that's still ahead, yep. we have inflation that's still too hot for what the Fed would like at this point. The Fed warning for this higher for longer type of scenario. Yep. Yet we have earnings season, which actually is shaping up pretty well. What's your assessment of where we are today? So I, I would agree with a number of the, um, uh, of the folks who've gone on earlier this morning. I think we're in for a very choppy time. Uh, I think when you look below the surface, um, where we've had some encouraging data, the, um, the numbers don't look uh, nearly as good. So I think the economy has benefited from the fact that savings um, accumulated during the COVID break through a lot of fiscal stimulus, as well as just not the ability to spend, grew to two times what it normally was. That is now 90% gone. Uh, the consumer is continuing to spend, but they're doing it by borrowing and using credit card uh, in ways that take that to uh, very strong highs. You're already seeing slowdown in m many of the key metrics uh, for businesses. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the leading factors that, that um, we look at is uh, boxes mm -hmm. are down 8.3%. That's a great leading indicator to future activity. So, you know, you have to look below the surface there. Uh, the pressure on the consumer continues to grow. Everything is much more expensive. So while inflation has slowed to around 4%, 4 uh, which is a place where it may stay for a while, given the nature of the forces that, that um, we're dealing with. Uh, that's twice the Fed um, uh, objective, and so I think it's appropriate to believe that the Fed funds rate will remain a bit higher longer. Um, I think you have to ask yourself the question, though, longer term, is that the most important factor driving rates, or is the kind of fiscal spending that we've seen the accumulation of 33 plus trillion dollars of debt growing significantly. Um, the CBO projects it to grow to 181% of GDP by 2050, 2053. Um, how is that going to get financed and what does that mean long term? Now, the flip side is the United States is still the best place to put your money. It is where people will go uh, even if you have political differences when times are very difficult. And so I'm not projecting a return to the, the kind of rates that uh, my wife and I paid for our first mortgage in 1981, which was a 17% mortgage rate. But I do think it's likely that we're going to stay in the 4 to 5% range longer term. What does that mean for the market? It means that multiples will be under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, we can see a little bit more downside there. Um, the very nature of the companies that you pick is crucially important. Now, one of the things that makes me optimistic in this scenario is that innovation has always re-enabled growth in the United States, and that has tended to mitigate some of these fiscal and monetary problems that we have. And as I look at the nature of technologies that have been developed, generative AI really came out of almost nowhere for most people, and the promise that it has for increased productivity and more of what it can do is uh, very significant. Um, if, you, if you look at what's going on for um, life science, I think that uh, there is enormous, enormous potential in life science to not only better people's lives, uh, but to do it in ways that are longer term, much more cost effective, and also add to productivity. So um, I want to couple the warning about the fundamentals that we see with the nature um, of optimism that has always characterized this country's um, 
uh, act, business and uh, fiscal activity. So talking a little bit more about how then you're approaching investment opportunities, you just mentioned some of the key areas where you're seeing some opportunity for growth here going forward, but identifying what makes the most sense right now. Walk us through that playbook sure. and how you're exactly evaluating some of those more attractive opportunities today. So, you know, the reason that private equity has benefited even in these difficult times, and in fact has outperformed more, sorry for the commercial, but just the data, um, is that we can be much more selective about what we're buying, right? We're not trying to buy the market as a whole, we're trying to buy individual companies, and if our firm, for example, likes to buy four to six a year, so you, you, you pick your spots very carefully. Looking for places where the secular growth drivers are very strong and sustainable for 10 to 20 years I think in this environment provides a lot of opportunity. Whether or not the pricing is yet there to give us the total upside of that, I think is a reasonable question. The markets are, have been a little slower to adjust, the private markets, than we've seen in the, six, the I think this will be my seventh re recession in the 43 years I've been doing this. Um, but the adjustments are occurring. And so I think picking those sectors with very strong secular tailwinds is really important. You mentioned that this would be the seventh recession, I yes. think you just said. So how does this, what we're seeing today, compare to what you've seen in the past? Um, so we, one thing that we've often seen at this point in time, and, and I think it's interesting not to be critical, but um, you know, Janet Yellen said, um, we're definitely looking like we're going to have a soft landing. Yeah. Now, she said that when she was vice chair of the Fed in 2007, two months before the great financial recession happened. So one thing that we're seeing that I've seen all the time is the expectation that we're gonna have a soft landing. Mm -hmm. But I think it was Larry Summers who basically said, I don't understand why we're talking about this because it's never happened. So I think we should be very careful that it's very, very difficult, given all the complexities and everything going on in the world, uh, to navigate to a so-called soft landing. So I would expect that it's going to be difficult. They're always difficult, no matter what the causal factors are. Um, hopefully relatively short-lived, and many of them have been more short-lived than, than not. Uh, but it's going to be a difficult and choppier economy uh, going forward. So um, my expectation is we're gonna continue to hear the hope. There may be data points that give the market some ability to, to rise, but that you know, uh, we're, in, we're in a relatively um, difficult period over the course, I would suspect, of the next 15 to 18 months. And then there'll be a lot of opportunity beyond that and I think as you look at it during the course of when things go down, as I said to some of our younger partners, you can't imagine how much worse it's going to be right now as you look at the world. Uh, but then there'll be a point where you can't imagine how much better it's going to get. And we need to look, look through that with the perspective of, of having um, uh, a uh, whole series of these things to uh, look back on. I'm curious to get your thoughts just on how Fed Chair Jay Powell has handled this right now in terms of the pace in which he has raised rates, the fact that he has uh, held rates now for the last meeting. When you talk about looking ahead, I know many people are saying it doesn't really matter at this point whether or not we see another 25 basis point hike, 50 basis point hike yeah. in the grand scheme of things. But in terms of what he has done and where we are today, I, What's your you know, look, I, I, he, I think he's the first to admit they were slow mm -hmm. to react. They let it go on too long. There was too much monetary stimulus. But he, they were dealing with a world we'd never seen before. We'd never had that kind of COVID shutdown. So mm -hmm. let's, let's give them a little bit of a break on that. I think this, that because they were so far behind, they had no choice but to move as quickly as they have. And this is the fastest increase that we've seen across any of the recessions since the Second World War. So, you know, they've moved quickly. Um, the, the economy is incredibly complex and there's a lot of different forces. So again, the forces dealing with long-term treasury rates is different mm -hmm. these days than, than just what the Fed does. And so I think it's not inappropriate to basically say, look, Let's understand how everything is working through the economy before we continue to go in one direction or another. I think they're very mindful of the lesson uh, of the 1970s when you, um, 
tightened and then you loosen too quickly. So I think they don't want to repeat that. Uh, but they don't yet have all the data that looks at what are the implications of long of the 10 year moving on its own upward because of a different set of forces than just the forces of the Fed. So I, I'll, I'd, I'd give them a break and say what they're doing right now seems reasonable. Let's understand what the lag times are and what the impact is on the economy. Um, and my hope is that they don't move too quickly to do some things that uh, put us in an e even worse long-term um, situation. But I think that what does that, that worst case scenario smart. look like? So I think the worst case scenario is um, a level of inflation that is not controllable. Um, I don't anticipate that to happen. I, I think you know, inflation is probably going to end up about where it is mm -hmm. with perhaps more risk to uh, upside than, than potential benefit for downside. Look, there were a lot of disinflationary forces that occurred over the course of about a 20 year period. You know, we, we, we created an enormous amount of low cost energy. That filters through the economy in lots of different ways. We had deregulation um, under certain presidencies that I think reduced the cost and helped business uh, you know, get better. We had very little pricing power. Um, and then we had massive fiscal and monetary stimulus uh, that uh, came into, into play. And that, that monetary stimulus lasted a long time because of those anti, those disinflationary forces that were very powerful. And during a longer period, we had massive globalization to move the cost of things down dramatically by moving to lower cost manufacturing geographies. Every one of those has now either ended or been reversed. And so we don't have the benefit of those disinflationary forces, which means the base level of inflation is likely to be higher than what we saw in the last decade as those things have unwound. Scott, let's talk a little bit more about what has been happening down in D.C. And you talk about some of the proposed changes that have been put forward from the DOJ and the FTC in terms of some of the changes that they would like to see made uh, for the merger review process. I'm curious from your perspective in regards to the Biden administration, had they made it tougher for PE? Um, yes, uh, they've made it tougher all around. To what extent? Um, I think uh, in a significant way. Um, you know, obviously, the debate is, are, are you doing this and breaking, effectively creating new law that was not authorized by Congress, and therefore we need to go to the court system in order to do what Microsoft just did, which is to basically make the appropriate argument that, uh, you know, this was inappropriate law. Um, but the reality is there's a significant cost to that. And I think that's what, that's what the uh, antitrust regulators are betting on, which is whether or not they get overturned, there's um, significant costs that may cause people to not do deals that, quite frankly, I think are probably better for the country if they were done uh, in terms of bringing the cost down for consumers and the long-term sustainability of businesses that may otherwise be uh, be subpar competitors, particularly with foreign competition. But nonetheless, I think there's a strong belief on the part of the people leading um, the FTC and DOJ antitrust that what they're doing is, is the right thing to do, regardless of whether or not it's consistent with past antitrust practice. Has that caused you to reevaluate how you are potentially looking at various investment opportunities? I, I think we have to keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. um, we, ge we generally are not doing things that would trigger the, the kinds of issues um, that they've focused upon. I think there are situations, obviously, we did, we, we, we've seen a couple of situations where private equity firms' uh, uh, strategy of buying a platform and then building on it uh, by uh, doing some consolidations has now come under scrutiny by those, uh, those authorities. And so I think we all just need to be mindful of that uh, in private equity as we look at, at uh, investments we're making. Um, but uh, you know, it's definitely a significant factor. And it's, it's one of the re-regulations that I think increase the cost of doing business in the country that, again, is more inflationary than certainly not disinflationary. 
We only have about a minute here, and I want to go back to something that you quickly touched on uh, towards the top of our interview. You mentioned one of the reasons that you are optimistic, or you're talking about you're seeing some opportunity out there right now, is AI and yes. how much focus we are seeing there. A lot of people are saying that maybe some of that hype has been overextended. We really need to find what makes the most sense when it comes to AI. So I'm curious so, how you're looking at that. So though. we're looking at generative AI over what was more traditional AI. Mm -hmm. Um, because of its power to do certain things that we've never seen before uh, available. And where it is actually appropriate to utilize that technology to dramatically reduce the cost and improve the efficacy of efforts to provide a more automated way of doing a, a, a large number of business processes. And that that will be uh, very powerful in terms of the productivity that it can provide, as well as enabling new, new jobs and, and um, new companies to come to the forefront. But we've never seen anything move so fast from a technological perspective. And we spend an enormous amount of time evalu evaluating both the opportunities, but also how this may challenge some traditional business models in uh, particularly the software uh, industry and again, may also, in and of itself, be a very powerful force for being more efficient in the creation of software. Mm -hmm. Because interestingly, one of the areas that it's probably most powerful is in code writing. All right, well, Scott Sparling, unfortunately, we're out of time. We have to leave thank it there. You. But thank you so much for taking the time. Co-CEO so of THL, thank, thank, thank you, Scott. Great to see you. Me thank too. you so much. Okay, gosh, what's great conversations. Okay, so our live feed is going to take a break right now.
Edward Norton is one of the most recognizable actors of his generation. You know him from films like Glass Onion, Fight Club, and The Grand Budapest Hotel. But what you may not know is that he's also a successful tech investor and entrepreneur. He was an early investor in AI data company Kensho, and he co-founded both media measurement firm EDO and early crowdfunding platform CrowdRise. He's here with us now to talk about his latest venture, board presentation software startup, Zek. Edward, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure, yeah, thanks for having me. So let's start with the basics. What is Zek? Zek, um, we, we, we call it death to the board deck. The, the quickest way to say it is that this is a, this is a cloud-based uh, platform for companies and nonprofit organizations to, to put together their board meeting materials um, in a way that's just massively more dynamic and efficient. The dynamic of boards was a really broken one. We thought that this was something that we actually knew how to address. What did and you come up with? If you think about a board, it is often composed of people who have invested money in a company or made big donations. But really, what's happening is monitoring and, and protecting the investment, right? We definitely noticed that that it was a very toxic dynamic that companies essentially say, hey, we're going pencils down to prepare for this meeting. That, you know, that the idea that in 2023 we're building 93-page PDFs in slide. PDFs of doom, yeah, essentially. the PDFs of doom, less than 48 hours before you're expected to read this mm -hmm. thing. And then you get there, and what happens? It gets narrated to you. And we really thought, we can, we can crush that down, make it easier on all sides, and, um, and bring the best of what, what kind of always-on cloud-based platforms can do. What's the long-term ambition? Can board meetings be not terrible? They, they ought to be things that people leave saying, that was really, really good. That was constructive. A, a board should be an asset to an organization, not- A hall monitor. Not a hall monitor, yes. Now for you personally, why tech? Of all the things you could be doing in your spare time. You know, it's funny, I, we're in the era of tech, so people kind of use it as a catch-all. I, I, actually, I actually don't relate to the things I've done in an entrepreneurial sense in the category of tech per se. Like CrowdRise was really innovative in terms of social fundraising. Were we bragging about our tech? Like not, not particularly, we were solving a problem. But I think some things I've been involved with do involve what I would call sophisticated tech. How do you, you define know? that? Well, what Ken Show was doing in terms of application, long before ChatGPT, Ken Show's work on large language model AI application to financial market data was you know, best in class. This is Daniel Nadler who founded Ken Show yes. and founded EDO with me and, and now has founded this incredible large language model AI application for health uh, medical research called Open Evidence. If you imagine the capacities of ChatGPT but applied to the incredibly important uh, uh, problem of how do people keep up with the pace of published medical research so that clinicians are able to fact check themselves through plain language query on, in a way that is tr truly unprecedented. Real, that gets you excited. Yeah, that's what about that excites you? Liminal. Because, because I think um, what I think is really promising about AI is not the replacement of people mm -hmm. at all, but actually the enhancement of our own capabilities. My friend Bennett Miller, who's one of the great, a great filmmaker, he just did an art show of photographs that he created using Dali. AI did not create these images. It was this obedient servant that let a great artist like Bennett compose and curate images um, through thousands and thousands of iterations it's interesting because now we have this moment. You have writers and actors striking and worried about things like AI. It is the right moment to negotiate these things. So what makes now the right moment? Well, there's two things. One is that the technology, the technology is hitting this kind of, this liminal edge where amazing things artistically are being generated. How good can it be? And you know, does it fully wipe away the human input or not? I really don't think so. And I think that these things will largely be, come to be seen as tools, um, much like CGI, right? Computer graphics didn't ruin photography. 
The business landscape of media is changing right now a lot. I think what we're going to see very soon is that there is no linear television at all. Everything is everything everywhere all at once. The big seismic shift is that people are realizing it can't all be through subscription, and so that's why all the streaming platforms are moving to ad-supported models. You will stream on demand whatever you want, and if you don't want to pay for premium ad-free, you'll just watch it with ads. And what that means is suddenly Netflix is one of the largest television ad-supported networks in history, and that means that that's why it has to be negotiated now. The pie is about to get bigger. Mm -hmm. I bet Netflix is... Netflix's market cap will go higher than anybody thinks it's going to go when people realize how effective an advertising platform that company is going to become. When you look at what the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild and the Actors Guild are actually negotiating for, it's like 0, .0 per, you know, you're, it's tiny percentages. Bob Iger has literally said it. He, when a guy who says, I'm not an advertising guy, says ad-supported streaming is about to become one of the biggest growth centers of it. Disney. So you basically have the granularity of targeting that you get with Facebook mm -hmm. and Google, but with Disney's content. And, and that's going to be insane. I actually think the issue of the moment for the artistic unions is not AI. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a little bit of a boogeyman. Then what is it? It's, it's what's about to happen in the revenue structure on content through ad-supported models that's going to be a huge windfall. And that, that's why the agreements need to be recalibrated right now. The new lifetime value of content made by streamers is about to tr change completely. Edward Norton, <laughs> we have to leave it there. Yeah. Edward, thank you so sure. much. Pleasure. All right, that was Ed Norton with our very own Ali Garfinkel for Yahoo Finance Invest. I'm Diane King-Hall with Rochelle Akufo. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange. And we just want to dive into some of the themes and topics that came up uh, in that exclusive interview with Ed Norton. One of the things that stood out to me, Rochelle, is just AI and how much he has utilized it in the businesses that he operates. Many people know Ed Norton for his films, yes. uh, as we just talked about, like Fight Club, et cetera. But uh, to know how deeply entrenched he is in the business world, and particularly within tech, as a big tech investor, he's already had platforms take off in the past. When you think about Kensho, which was sold to S&P for some $550 million. So he has the experience there. And then his latest thing, Zek. Exactly. And I thought it was interesting that when he talked about AI, he talked about more being a supportive tool mm -hmm. and focus more on the problem solving, because a lot of this FOMO that we saw with, as, as we saw, you know, right. open AI take off, investors are now at the point where they want to see proven use cases. How are you actually right. going to use this in your business? So I love the fact that he was focused on the pro problem solving aspect. I will say the biggest standout for me was his commentary on Netflix. Right. And so when you think of where Netflix was at first, obviously it was just a streaming giant. And then you add in the ad-supported revenue aspect mm -hmm. of it. And he talked about this seismic shift from st of streaming on demand versus subscription and how well positioned Netflix is. In fact, he said Netflix is one of the largest TV ad-supported networks in history. Yep. So this could be something that really hasn't made it to the radar yet. But look at Netflix's stock price up more than 46 percent right. year to and date. And to your point, the other thing that stood out when you think about Netflix is its market cap, predicting that its market cap will double. Right now it stands at around $189 billion. So think about it doubling within the next five to ten years uh, with the expectation that Netflix is so well positioned within the framework of having this strong uh, ad supported model and the everything everywhere all mm -hmm. at once people getting subscription fatigue we've seen some of that data play out with some of the analysts that we uh, that we talk to regularly um, and then the, just the overall business landscape of media changing his commentary on the strikes which are happening right now and you know just where ai factors into that conversation that both sides of the table are having it's true because it really is about future proofing mm -hmm. where media is going as he's saying no more linear tv some right. of this is lifetime content here so the stakes are a lot higher than sort of you know just you're not an odd series here this is about a life yep. a lifetime of content yep. here so we've gone from these subscription services saying content is king yep. 
to then building subscribers and now all the different streaming services getting into the ad supported mm -hmm. tiers. And now that even could go away in terms of subscriptions. And it could be just literally pick and choose what you want. It feels a bit overwhelming, though. Yeah. There's so much content out there. Indeed. The other thing that stood out to me what, with what he said with regard to the strikes is basically the, the, you know, the fact that both parties are still kind of going back and forth, um, even though the studios had come back and said that was their best and final mm -hmm. sag after saying, no, we're still in this. And that conversation about AI and him seeing AI as not a threat, yes. uh, but as a tool to enhance capabilities in general, but still playing on the side of actors and saying, hold your position with regard mm. to the case for how much AI can be a part of this negotiation, this new deal that's on the table. The other thing that stood out to me that he talked about his own um, investments is this medical aspect, the medical research, open evidence, another AI company that he's investing in. So he's really going big in tech um, and the use case for AI in the medical field and how do people kind of keep up with this data upon data upon data. Mm -hmm. You know, would it eventually, this is my kind of thought process about the use case, do away with that form that you have to fill out every time you come in, although sometimes now they ask, has any information changed, which is a side sigh of relief when that happens. It's true. I mean, it's, it does seem to be never ending, all these advancements and still filling out 10 million forms. But it does speak to this hyper personalization, mm -hmm. whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in the sort of media we consume as well. Let's also give you a check of the markets at the moment as we're about an hour into the trading day here. Let's take a look at how we're, we're looking at some of the damage here, at least um, well, mixed market in terms action. of the Dow. Relatively flat, though, uh, to open. And we're seeing the S&P also just barely, barely in the green, up about three points on the day. Take every Nasdaq seeing the strongest gains, though, up about 68 points. So a bit of a mixed picture here, although the Dow just sort of toying with, uh, toying with the negative territory, just down barely a point. So as we can see there, a mixed picture as we continue our coverage here on Yahoo Finance Invest. Stay tuned, more coming up next.
Hi, welcome back. Hope everyone got coffee and you're settled in for our Newsmakers Power Hour. This is actually going to be great. I, for one, am super excited about this next interview, as it is, as I mentioned, a fan favorite in my house. First up in the hot seat is Kava, one of the busiest and most talked about IPOs um, this year, quite frankly, on its debut in the New York Stock Exchange. June 15th, Kava shares shot up, actually finished up 117% as Wall Street and the kids in my house actually grew very excited about the next generation of uh, fast casual restaurant dining. As I was saying, that you can't be a working mother and actually expect to cook as well, right? So if it weren't for Kava, there would be no dinner in my house. So let's dive into the future of Kava with CEO Brett Shulman, alongside with our mod moderator, Yahoo Finance, senior reporter, Brooke De Palma. And by the way, Brett, please all shout out to Brett. He supplied lunch. We are all super excited about our uh, hummus bowls or whatever else is out there. So welcome, Brett and Brooke. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I guess it is still morning. I'm looking at the time to say it's flying by. Brett, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Of course, I know that you're quite busy. You guys are reporting earnings after the bell. And there's just been so much momentum, so much excitement about Kava. I do win a hit on the valuation that we saw on the IPO day. It's since come down since June. Break down why you think that is. Well, we're focused, uh, Brooke, on the, the next 10 years plus, not the next 10 days. Stocks will go up and down. Really excited with how the market received our offering and mm -hmm. how it's been received since. Um, you know, continues to trade uh, well above our IPO pricing. And I just think it's a reflective of the broad appeal of our Mediterranean cuisine and the tremendous white space opportunity we have in front of us as we create and define what we believe to be the next large scale cultural cuisine category. Right, and many on Wall Street, when they initiated coverage, they said that Kava is the next Chipotle in terms of growth and scalability. How do you feel when you hear something like that? Well, we want to be the next Kava. And again, <laughs> that's defining the, the next uh, large-scale cultural cuisine category, which is Mediterranean. Certainly sim uh, similarities in the operating model and its high praise, tremendous business that they've built. Uh, so we're focused on really delivering that Mediterranean cuisine and doing it in communities uh, across the country as we grow. Right, and growth? is a key component of Kava's growth story. If some of you may have saw, there's a new Kava being built right outside yes. the Moonlight Studios. How challenging, though, do you think that it'll be to reach 1,000 locations by 2032? Quite, quite ambitious. Yeah, well, we've actually grown at a higher growth rate in recent years as we uh, transformed our acquisition of Zoe's Kitchen and used that real estate to convert alongside de novo growth. And so we're actually uh, downshifting our growth rate in the coming years to be a very manageable uh, outcome that we believe 1,000 restaurants by 2032. And one of the big markets that you guys are hitting next is Chicago. Break down why Chicago, how long you've been going there, and also when they enter a new location, you guys have these huge parties, it almost seems like a community day. Yeah. How does that sort of build loyalty and then transfer to sales for Kava? Yeah, we're really excited to enter the Chicago market. We don't have a presence currently in the upper Midwest region of the country. So we operate in 24 states and the District of Columbia today. So this is a, a great new region for us to enter in. Chicago, great food town. And as you noted, when we open in a new market, when we open a new restaurant, we have what we traditionally call our community day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sharing a meal is the oldest social act known to humankind. And we're really in the hospitality business. So when we go into a new community, we want to introduce ourselves to our new neighbors, mm -hmm. and we welcome them to our table to have a, a meal on us, a free lunch or free dinner. And we recommend donations. We don't require it. But if you donate, we'll match that donation. Oh. And we partner with a local philanthropic food partner uh, addressing food uh, insecurity in that market. Market. And you also are bringing a manager up to Chicago to kickstart their breakdown. Is that a source of how you instill new labor into the markets that you enter? Do you tend to lean on managers from other locations? Well, in general, when we open new restaurants, we really want to focus on internal promotion. So this year, we have a 75% internal uh, placement target for new restaurants. That means that Every uh, three out of every four restaurants will have someone that grew up at Kava that was internally promoted at Kava. And to really build that pipeline, we have what's called our Academy GM network. Mm. So this is the cream of the crop general managers that we basically uh, have created a farm system to cultivate that talent. So we certify these Academy GMs. 
We have, uh, as the end of uh, last quarter, we have about 39 Academy GM certified. And this starts to give us a training Academy restaurant in every garden of the country is what we qualify roughly a span of eight restaurants to not only train in those local markets, but to cultivate new talent that can go open restaurants in that market or go to a market like Chicago and open a restaurant there. And I think what we've seen, especially with these new restaurants, is that labor continues to be at the forefront for Cava, that family atmosphere with people serving up front. Are there ever going to be robots at Cava? <laughs> Are there ever going to be uh, automated assembly yeah. lines? Well, our, our mission is to bring heart, help, and humanity to food. And if <laughs> it was all robots, I think we wouldn't live up to that humanity piece. And we've always looked at technology to enhance the human experience, not replace it. Mm -hmm. You know, even going back to our early days, back in 2013, we, had, uh, we launched our mobile payment loyalty digital order app. Mm -hmm. In 2015, we put second dedicated digital make lines, production lines in every Kava restaurant. So all of our restaurants have that dedicated digital production. In 2017, we built our internal digital order platform. And recently, we re-platformed that digital order environment to a microservices architecture for our highly scalable environment. So we've always been uh, digital forward. But again, how, how do we use that to enhance the guest experience as well as the operator experience? Are you guys trying to understand how exactly this could help increase throughput? Is there any sort of technology that you may be working on? We're always looking at different opportunities to uh, optimize our operations, enhance the guest experience, make it more frictionless, more convenient. I mean, you think about our digital order platform today, we now have over two dozen uh, digitally enabled pickup by car lanes, mm. right? So the idea is that we create this multi-channel environment and give, we give you the control, you the remote control to decide which channel you want to engage with us on, whether that's ordering on the phone and picking up off our shelf, ordering on the phone, driving around and picking it up at one of our pickup windows, or having it brought to your doorstep through delivery. Right. And menu innovation also is at the forefront for Kava. I know you recently had the spicy falafel, the fiery broccoli, steak you're also looking into and testing. Where are we at with that test right now? Yeah, that will go into test next month in two markets, in uh, Boston and Dallas. So we're excited about this. This has been highly requested. We don't currently have a beef item on the menu, but we want to do it in our Mediterranean way. So really Mediterranean-inspired flavors and give people another option on the line. We have 38 ingredients on the line over 17 billion combinations, wow. and a way for you to opt in. Do you want a light meal? Do you want a heartier meal? Do you want a mild meal? Do you want a spicy meal? Or do you want to eat vegetarian? Do you want to eliminate gluten or lactose from your diet? Or do you just want spicy lamb meatballs and crazy feta? <laughs> right. Um, you know, when you think about the current environment that we're in, something that's been getting so much attention in the restaurant industry at large is the potential impact of weight loss drugs. Yeah. Are you seeing any impact? Is Kava planning for any impact? I'm not sure which I hear more of today, AI or Ozone. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, if we look at it, everything we've seen so far, it's still in the very early stages. But what we've seen anecdotally, as well as some of the early data, is that what gets eliminated in folks who are taking the drug, taking Ozempic or some of these weight loss drugs, is they're eliminating salty snacking. They're eliminating fattier foods. They're eliminating late night eating and alcohol. And it's recalibrating their diets to live a more healthful, balanced uh, diet and lifestyle, which really lends itself to our cuisine. Mm. So our unique Mediterranean cuisine where taste and health unite. Satisfying, flavorful food that you don't have to make compromises or sacrifices eating. So we think it could be a net benefit for us. Very interesting. And are you seeing any impact right now, though, or nothing, nothing yet? No impact. I think it's too early to really determine. Mm. And I do want to go back to the labor front of things. Of course, you're, you're seeing rapid expansion in U.S. You have about 20 restaurants in California. Yes. Now there, we're set to see the FAST Act yes. take effect on April 1st, 2024. That will raise minimum wage to $20 an hour. How are you working with restaurants there? Are you going to perhaps increase prices there to offset these higher costs? Well, we have traditionally had higher than market wages, so we wouldn't have a lot of room to make up. We haven't made a final determination yet, but we have great success in Southern California. It's a great market for us. We've got great expansion plans there. And the FAST Act itself, I think, is interesting. You know, it's targeted at larger chains like Cava, 60 or more units. But what I believe happens is it will have an indirect, more negative impact on smaller operators. Mm. Because the larger operators that will be paying at minimum $20 an hour, 
if you're a smaller operator or you're even in the hotel industry or another one of these hourly uh, service industries and you're not competing with those wages, you run the risk of losing good employees walking across the street to make more money, which forces them to compete from a wage perspective. And with scale and the resiliency of our business model, we're able to adapt and really not have to pass along all those costs to our guests versus smaller oper operators may have a more difficult time. And you know, I don't necessarily think it's a great thing for our industry. We all love our independent restaurants and our small restaurants and a diverse industry is a more healthy industry. So you know, we'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but I think this legislation could have unintended negative consequences. Mm -hmm. So no plans yet to raise prices there specifically? No, no plans yet. Another thing that I want to talk about is the new food production facility you guys yeah. are creating in Verona, Virginia. Now I know that we've discussed that CPG is a small part of the business. Do you have plans to expand that with this new production facility? And is there demand for your dips and your spreads in grocery stores? Yeah, so we're currently sold nationally in Whole Foods markets. Mm -hmm. We've been a partner with Whole Foods for over a decade now. Our dips and spreads actually preceded, predated our fast casual business. And we're excited to have that new facility come online, slated to come online in Q1 of, of 2024. Soon. Yeah, 55,000 square foot production facility, which will unlock significant additional capacity to support our restaurant growth to at least 750 restaurants. Mm -hmm. Plus, give us that optionality to get more intentional about growing our CPG business, because mm -hmm. currently our manufacturing capacity is really absorbed by the restaurants. And I think it's a unique aspect of our restaurants where we have this vertical integration, where we're using fresh dill, fresh cucumber, fresh garlic in our production, but we're able to centralize it, bringing consistency, cost effectiveness, and high quality to our restaurants across the country while taking that complexity out of the four walls of our restaurants, making it easier for our team members to deliver on that great Kava experience. Right, and also I do want to hit on the loyalty program that you guys are unveiling next year, I believe. How will that loyalty program be different than the past? Yeah, so I talked about, uh, you know, we, we originally launched it in 2013, so it's a decade it's quite old. some time. Yeah, and uh, we would have loved to kind of reimagine it sooner, but we had a few things we had to take care of with the Zoe's acquisition and the transformation, <laughs> and then that pandemic we all had to deal with. So we're really excited to now get uh, after really reimagining it. We'll go into test pilot next month in the Houston market with the goal of uh, relaunching it late in 2024. And right now it's a very transactional uh, loyalty program. It's not very value added, we believe, for our guests or for the business. And we want to shift to something that's more value added that will really drive better frequency and incentivize lower and, and middle frequency users and really empower our high frequency users with the optionality to opt into their rewards of choice versus being on like the current autopilot of spend uh, $88, get an $8 credit that automatically hits against your next check. Do digital customers tend to spend more? Loyalty yes, members. we do see digital customers uh, have a higher check average. Yes. All right, now the rumor the rumor is out, but we are having Kava for lunch. So I need to ask: Are there any menu hacks that you uh, love at Kava? Or any go-to orders? Well. Uh, I think one of the things people like to do is our pita chips are a cult favorite. Mm. And uh, people like to get the pita chips and then actually eat their bowl with the pita chips. That's I'm a pretty, pretty, that. pretty strong <laughs> move there. <laughs> um, go to order? Yes. Yeah, so my go to order shifts about every six to 12 months. As I mentioned <laughs> earlier, <laughs> we have over 17 billion combinations. So it evolves over time. Right now, I get half arugula, half saffron basmati rice, so a little greens and grains, a scoop of hummus, a scoop of crazy feta. I think you always have to get a scoop of crazy feta. <laughs> Uh, we get half uh, harissa honey chicken, half spicy falafel, so that's a limited time innovation item. <laughs> I like some spice in my bowl. Some roasted corn, pickled onions, feta, pita crisp, and then top it off with tahini Caesar dressing. Did everyone get that? Okay. <laughs> well, I'll get that for lunch. Um, when you're not eating at Kava, where's yes. your go-to? Uh, we cook at home a lot. Ooh, uh, favorite we, thing to cook? Um, favorite thing to cook is, um, I don't know, you know, it's probably, we cook everything from a roasted chicken is a, is a great kind of classic with the vegetables underneath and you get it, you know, absorbing in all the juices. Mm. Uh, we, we like to, uh, we like to do a lot of, um, you know, vegetables and rice. Uh, basmati rice is also mm. a favorite in the house. Sounds really good. I'll be coming over for dinner. <laughs> Last question here. It's been 13 years since you started yeah. the company. 13 years, it's quite a long time. Would you say that now you're at a turning point for Kava? Is this a pivotal moment for the company in terms of growth, in terms of future plans? Where are we at? 
Yeah, it was certainly a seminal year for us in 2023. We had our initial public offering and we completed the transformation of our Zoe's acquisition. So we're back to a single brand state. And as I said to the team the night before the IPO and what we truly believe is the IPO is really not the destination, it's the beginning of the next chapter of our journey. Mm -hmm. And so it really now catapults us to bring this idea of Mediterranean cuisine to communities across the country and define and create the next large scale cultural cuisine category. And when you think about what investors should be looking out for, is it that long term growth that you're really weighing in on? What should they be keeping a close eye on? Yeah, we're focused on our long-term plan, 1,000 restaurants by 2032, uh, and continuing to hone our powerful unit economic model that's uh, helped fuel us to where we are today. Great. Brett Shulman, Kava CEO, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for having me, bro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone's excited for lunch, I'm sure. All right, so let's stay on these pressure-packed situations. So changing the mood a little bit here, this year has been very challenging for one of our railroad giants, Norfolk Southern. In February, Norfolk Southern train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, unleashing toxic materials into a near nearby community. Norfolk Southern has had to spend millions to clean up the site, which also and they're also promising to make things good in the community. The company has also looked to AI to find better ways to improve rail safety. But achieving an operational rebound, not going to be easy right now for Norfolk Southern, as the wider rail industry is experiencing basically a renewed down cycle. Leading the company through all this, though, is Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw, who comes on stage back with Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi. Well, Alan, I want to mine another kava bowl or a kava bowl. Yeah. That guy was really selling that stuff. I dig it. I mean, kava bowls are good. But, uh, so are the pita chips. Yeah, right? Uh, well, good. Thank you for doing this. I know it's been a, an incredibly busy time for your company. Now, I was thinking back, like, how do you prepare for a segment like this? And I think it starts with understanding you as a human, as a leader. Of course, the train derailments were very much covered throughout news in East Palestine. Take us through how you were raised, your family upbringing, and because I think that tells a lot on how you respond to the situation. Yeah, I was, um, I was, my father was in Vietnam. Uh, he was a Marine Lieutenant, did two tours. And I was raised for a number of years by my grandmother, my aunt, and my mom. Three really strong-willed women. And my grandmother worked as an assistant in the financial aid office and put four kids through college, right? And she paid it forward and she kept her promises and that's, that's one of the things I learned is, is trust, accountability, and keeping your promises. And that's kind of the North Star, and that's what we followed as we went through this crisis is, you know, we said we were going to make it right. We said we were going to do the right things. And each and every day, we've kept our promises. When you get that call that a train derailed in East Palestine, toxic chemicals going into the air, who is Alan Shaw one minute after that call? Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about the community. I'm thinking about the safety of our crews. Um, I'm thinking about the safety of the first responders. You know, your immediate question is any injuries, any deaths, any hazmat releases. And um, we were really fortunate that there were no injuries or deaths. Um, I pulled the team together immediately afterwards, and I said, look, we're going to make this right. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do the right thing. And I didn't know what that meant. I, I'd never been to East Palestine. It's a wonderful community of about 4,700 people. Um, but what I knew is I had to listen, I had to learn, I had to act with humility, and I had to take decisive action. And so I would go to the community. I've been there multiple times a month. I was just I was there just last week. And um, you engage with the community. You go into listening sessions. You go into the churches and in the schools and the family rooms and then to the businesses. And you ask them. What can Norfolk Southern do to help? I knew that we would bring Norfolk Southern's resources. We're a strong company um, to, to bear, and the community would direct where it would go. And so we've already committed over $100 million to helping the community recover and helping the community thrive. And there's more work to be done. As a leader, public company, forward, or, or the face of the company in many respects, what is it like to take that criticism that, that you've gotten, even despite all the efforts you've been trying to put forth on the ground? But, um, 
we're a safe railroad. Uh, and I knew that, right? Last year, the number of derailments on Norfolk Southern was the lowest in two decades. Um, but I know we can get better. And as I, as I look through this crisis, a crisis is an opportunity to really kind of like test your leadership um, and your resolve. It also is an opportunity to accelerate change. And I knew that coming out of this, we were going to be a stronger company. And so one of the things I did is I looked outside the rail industry for inspiration. I used to work um, at Newport New Shipbuilding in the nuclear department installing nuclear reactors and aircraft gears. And so I had a really good idea. That's a of, pressure cooker. Yeah. I had a really good idea of the, um, the safety culture of the Admiral Rickover's nuclear navy. And so I reached out to a former admiral who used to run the Navy nuclear propulsion system and asked him to put together a team of former Navy nukes reporting directly to me as an independent consultant and help us with our safety culture. And they've been on the ground for about six months. They're going to be here two to three years. Uh, they're engaging with our employees, our craft colleagues, and they're going to make us a safer railroad. We're so going to be the gold standard of safety. So three years from now, how do you, how is Norfolk a safer railroad? Well, we're going to continue to invest in our infrastructure. We invest over a billion dollars in safety every year. Uh, we're going to continue to train our employees. We're going to use um, technology. You know, we have partnered with the Georgia Tech Research Institute on, um, on a machine visioning train inspection portal, which is basically a shed that goes around the tracks. The train goes through it, track speed, about 60 miles an hour. It's got 38 cameras that take about 1,000 pictures of each rail car and immediately uses AI to, to spot potential safety defects. And you know, that, that's something that I know that a conductor in Chicago at night in February just won't catch with the human eye. We are using technology and um, automated intelligence to enhance our safety. What are some of the specifics that Norfolk is doing on the ground in East Palestine? And how are you putting the capital to work to rebuild the community? So a uh, number of things. Uh, we just achieved a pretty significant milestone just about a week or two ago as we exited the most intense phase of the remi environmental remediation. Brian, we moved 170,000 tons of contaminated soil off site to EPA approved landfills, which are specifically designed to handle that. We've moved 36 million gallons of contaminated water off site. So that, that's, a, that's a big move for the community. Uh, we've announced a $20 million um, park improvement project. You know, one of the, the first times I was there, um, I met with some community leaders in, in someone's basement, and they talked to me a lot about the park. And so I went to the park. It's an 81-acre facility in the middle of the community that's a source of pride for them. And they asked me if I could help them improve it. And so I brought Norfolk Southern's resources to bear. Uh, I was just at a groundbreaking ceremony a couple weeks ago for a regional first responder training facility. We're committing $20 million to that. And that really, that's important to me personally because I wanted to express my appreciation for the first responders from Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia who rushed to the scene. You know, they're, they're the heroes here. And first responders are, are folks who devote their entire career to protecting the communities we serve. What do you think when you hear politicians say railroads are not safe, they're just trying to jack up their profits by taking away safety standards? Well, I, I, railroads are clearly the safest form of transportation across land. We're also the most efficient. You know, what we're focused on on Norfolk Southern is enhancing safety and enhancing service and really competing in that $860 billion truck and logistics market. You know? um, we want to have top tier revenue growth in the industry with industry competitive margins. That's the strategy that we announced about seven months after I became CEO last year. There are a lot of lawsuits uh, regarding this situation. Is there, do you see an insight to them being settled in one fell swoop? You know, I'm, I'm leaving that up to our, our legal team. Um, there are a number of lawsuits, and I really can't comment on that. What I can tell you is we're going to continue to get better coming out of this. We're going to be a stronger company. Um, we're advancing safety. We're advancing service. I'm really proud of the way that we've responded to this. The entire organization has become aligned around our new strategy, our new vision, and, um, and our response in East Palestine. Is it right that the total cost so far is and it was it $966 million? Is yeah, that we, the running we've, uh, we've estimated around $900 million so far. Now, there could be additional lawsuits. There could be additional fines. There could also be insurance settlements. In fact, we've already started to, 
to pull those in, and there could be third-party claims as well. So for an investor looking to put money to work in Norfolk Southern, is that, should they expect a similar number? I mean, this imagine this weighs on, on the finances of the company. Is that number similar that might pop up next year in terms of total cost? You know, um, much of that cost has been the environmental remediation. As I noted, we've exited the most intense phase of that. But you know, there, there are other things that, that could come up with lawsuits or fines. But again, insurance settlements as well. A lot of focus so far at the conference uh, on the state of the economy. I heard Hans Vestberg, uh, the Chairman and CEO of Verizon, talk about the consumers doing well, the lodging industry, Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano talking about that doing well, but maybe just a little bit of a slowdown. The rail industry is in a down cycle. Why? Uh, what industry do you say? The rail industry, rail industry down yeah. cycle. You know, what we're seeing is a really weak truck market, overcapacity in trucking. And so there's been kind of a freight recession in the truck market for about 22 months. There's some indication that that's ending, right? Spot markets are no longer on the decline. As I talk to customers, um, we're seeing inventory destocking come to an end. And Brian, as you know, we serve 5,000 customers, so we got this really unique view of the U.S. economy, and we touch about every market. And as I look around, you're, you're starting to see this consumer do fairly well, as, as you noted. I believe we're in a manufacturing super cycle, right? We've seen investment in new factory builds triple and so far in 2023 relative to they were the run rate they were in the previous decade. And it's really in our service region. It's in the Midwest and it's in the Southeast. And you know, I was talking to the CEO of a European automaker and he was talking about how if he wants to sell production in the United States, he needs to produce in the United States. And there's a lot of advantages for onshoring and um, in the United States. And it's, it's uh, cheap and reliable electricity it's a logistics infrastructure that's already in place, and it's a talented workforce. And that really plays to the strengths of our strategy going forward, which is to use service to drive top tier revenue growth and industry competitive margins. Important distinction there. So you're saying rail has been in a down cycle, but that's not the same as a recession. No, I don't, we're not, I don't believe we're in a recession. I think we're in a, we've been in a freight recession freight because recession. there's been overcapacity in the truck market. And that's, that's our primary form of competition. Now, we've got the most powerful intermodal franchise in the East, and so it's only a matter of time when that recovers. Um, and when the U.S. consumer does recover and the truck market can, recovers, you know, we're going to be coiled up and poised for growth with high incrementals. Have you had to furlough any workers? No, we're, we continue to hire. Mm -hmm. right? um, we're building for the long term at Norfolk Southern. We're investing in our future, and we're investing in locomotives and intermodal facilities and freight cars that help us compete with truck and technology and safety and our people as well. That's been my commitment. And day one that I became CEO about 18 months ago, I was out in the field and I was visiting with our crews in the crew rooms and in the locomotive cabs because I wanted to express my deep appreciation and respect for what they do for Norfolk Southern, for our customers, and for the U.S. economy. What it's like, you're still, you work your whole life, Alan, uh, and I think a lot of people watching this can relate, and a lot of, probably a lot of people in this room, you work your whole life to get to this top spot. And with, within 18 months, you're dealing with a major crisis. What has that like been, been that for you personally? How, what has that been like? You know, is you, um, the first day you sit in a seat, you understand it's about accountability, right? And I just knew that each and every day, we were gonna do the next right thing. Um, I was gonna follow our North Star, I was gonna follow our values, focus on the long term, and my goal for my team is, was that five years from now, 10 years from now, when, um, when we look back on this, we can have a response that makes us proud and a response that makes the folks in East Palestine proud. At the same time, we're implementing this unique vision, better way forward in the rail industry. Look, if you think about rail, rail has seated shared a truck for the last 25 years, despite being lower cost, higher, higher safety, better, much better safe, safety metrics, um, better sustainability with respect to the carbon footprint. And it's because rail hasn't delivered consistently a good service product. And so when I became CEO about 18 months ago, we went on a hiring spree. We started hiring conductors. Uh, we're investing in the future and then we're investing in service because I've got so much confidence in the unique strengths of our franchise and our customers and our employees that I know that we can deliver that top tier revenue growth with industry competitive margins. That's what's gonna drive 
long-term shareholder value for Norfolk Southern. Lastly, Alan, we're about 15 seconds left. Throughout this crisis period, as a leader, how have you stayed centered? These have to be incredibly challenging periods. I've got a lot of confidence that I know we're doing the right thing. Um, and so that allows you to block out a lot, of, a lot of the noise and focus on the mission. And when you get up the, every day, you just say, each and every day, I'm going to do the next right thing. And I'm going to see this thing through. Well, I look forward to uh, continuing to track this progress. Uh, Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw, thanks for coming down. And, and really, it's uh, good to see you again. We appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Brian. Thank you Thank so you much. We appreciate time. it. Thank you. All right, well, the challenges in media land have been well documented as well. Discovery is still trying to integrate Warner Media, at the same time trying to figure out what to do with CNN. Disney reportedly has ABC on the chopping block still, or shopping block, I should say, or maybe both. Paramount stock has been hammered on losses tied to streaming uh, media operations. So what's next for this industry? And is media just non-investable at this point? We're going to find out. Candle Media's co-founder, co-CEO, former TikTok CEO, and former top Disney exec, Kevin Mayer, is here with us now. His resume is like this long, my goodness. Um, coming on stage, of course, with fi uh, Yahoo Finance senior reporter Alexandra Canal. We should also note that Kevin is serving as a key advisor to Disney CEO Bob Iger at this moment. So please welcome them both. Kevin, Here we are. let's get into it. Let's so we it. have media stocks severely under pressure. We have a lot of cord cutting trends escalating. Will all of these challenges lead to more deal making in the industry? I think it's inevitable. You know, um, streaming was a growth industry for, long, for, for its whole life, actually, yeah. until last uh, 18 months or so. And when things are growing and, you can, and new entrants can find traction and get customers and, and actually make money, that's great. Then that's just, that's, you can have new entrants and you can have multiple, uh, multiple uh, competitors. As industries start to mature, and, and streaming, at least in the US, is definitely maturing. Adding subscribers is difficult. People who want you know, streaming services, by and large, have them already. Then you start to see consolidation because people are competing, spending a lot of money. There's multiple overlapping infrastructures, which are very expensive. When that happens, growth slows, consolidation follows. It's just economics 101, and it will happen in this industry, too. So who are the buyers for these types of assets? And where does big tech play into all this? I know we saw the recent acquisition of MGM from Amazon. But considering how much cash these companies have, why haven't we seen more tech-driven media M&A? Well, it's, there's an interesting combination between the tech culture and the Hollywood culture. And I think there's a little bit of nervousness there. How will the two? You know, intersect if they're actually under one roof. I'm not sure that it's an obvious thing that a tech, that a high growth, tech focused um, company that's really about its engineering at its core and its product at its core is going to be a great home to uh, for for creativity, the type of storytelling creati creativity that Hollywood represents. So those cultural mismatches, I think, make buyers nervous. And also, if you're Apple TV Plus. If you're Google, you have access to pl plenty of programming from people, you know, like Candle Media, my company, who independent producers of content. And if you want stream, if you want content for your streaming services, services, you can always buy it under arm's length. So this combination of tech company and, cre and creative companies, you know, under you know being, you know, one buying the other, not obvious to me that that's going to happen at scale. It very well might, but it really might not. Also, mm -hmm. one CEO who has preached creativity is Bob Iger, your former boss. And Disney is a big story right now. We have the stock trading near multi-year record lows. Another activist investor fight with Nelson Peltz. You're serving as a strategic advisor. So, in what capacity are you working with Iger, and what advice are you giving him right now? Well, I can tell you what capacity I'm working to some degree. I can't tell you what advice I'm giving him. That's between can't give between all the Bob, secrets. Between Bob and I, I suppose, and, and the board. But um, look, he needed, he needed um, a, some, peop, some part of his team back. He came back to a company that had vastly changed. Um, the, lead, you know, the previous leadership I got you know, under Bob Chapek had making some decisions that probably Bob Iger would not have taken. You know, he was CEO, free to do that. Um, but when you come back into a situation that's vastly changed from what you left, and a lot of the team, team that you had before and relied on before 
were gone, I, I left him in a position where he really wanted to have some people that he trusted, you know, tell them what, what they thought. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not spending an enormous amount of time, but I was at the company for a long time. I've seen a lot of the dynamics that are happening out there in the world, and have he trust my judgment on some things. So I just I talk to him from time to time. So through your conversations with Iger, what do you think he is most focused on right now? He's definitely most focused on um, making sure that ESPN, a, a company that he really believes in strongly, is well positioned for the future. So ESPN, he said this publicly, ESPN is his first priority, and he has uh, ideas to fix that and to, and to strengthen it and to change his business model over time. He's, they're talking publicly about taking it out of the linear TV, TV bundle where it has been exclusively the main part of ESPN, the flagship, and moving that to also exist in an over-the-top world. So that's going to be a really interesting transition, and if, it can do, if, it, if that transition can be helped by parties that could be partners in a substantial way, that's what he's looking to do. So let's talk about this transition because there's a lot of talk on how much this service will actually cost the consumer. Some analysts out there have said maybe 30 bucks a month, possibly more just to break even. How realistic is that price point when we're seeing prices balloon across the board? People have always paid a lot for sports. They didn't always know it because if, if you're back in the days when 95% of this country had pay TV uh, bundles, probably 40 to 50% of the cost of that bundle was sports programming. Now, a lot of people didn't watch it, which that's created, that was part of the impetus for this whole bundle kind of collapsing the way it is now and that pay TV business suffering. People have always paid a lot for sports. So um, now they can do so explicitly. If, you, if it goes over the top, you don't have to buy sports if you don't want it, but if you are a fan of sports, I don't know, those price, the price that you just discussed, that's a reasonable price to get the full suite of sports that ESPN, for instance, would offer. It's expensive, it costs a lot. People have always paid a fair amount of money for it, although they, you know, it, was, it was hidden behind a wholesale uh, price. But I do think that the kind of number you just talked about would be entirely reasonable. So that's fair, Thir 30 bucks a month. I think so, yeah. All right, is there I'm not saying that's how, how ESPN will price it. I don't know. Is I, there a know. ceiling? I mean, you just mentioned consumers are willing to pay a lot for sports. You have a lot of experience in the sports sector, streaming in general. Well, let me tell you a story. So yeah. I was at DAZN, this company called DAZN. Yes. Some of you have heard of it, some of you haven't. It's, it's a streaming service that exists around the world, but it's mostly centered in Europe. And we bought these rights. When I was chairman of, of DAZN, I, I thought the right strategy was to do some basically make it the ESPN of Europe, buy the rights that really matter in the countries where they matter. And in Europe, it's what we call soccer, they call football. Those are the rights that matter. So we went and bought in Italy something called Serie A, which is the EPL of Italy. That's where the, high, the best soccer clubs are. La Liga in Spain, uh, this thing called Bundesliga in Germany, which is the German equivalent of the EPL. In those countries, we had the sports that matter. So people, you know, we had the subscribers. I mean, I, my idea is, having launched Disney Plus, was let's go in at a low price. <clears throat> maybe we can get some of these people that are pirating signals to buy it legitimately, and maybe we can expand the marketplace if, at a lower price. So we, we, they, people were used to paying from Sky, which was the previous broadcaster, about 30 to 35 euros a month. We went in at 19 euros a month. And in Italy, we were expected to get about 2.3 million subscribers. We got 2.3 million subscribers. And so they were like, wow, there was like very little price elasticity here. We didn't win over any, any pirates, and we didn't expand the audience as much as we thought we might. In fact, it was imperceptible. We took the price back up to 35 euros, and there was 2.3 million subscribers. So I'm not saying there's infinite price elasticity in sports, but by that one experiment that I actually undertook recently, there's a couple years ago, I can tell you that sports fans who really want their sports will pay a lot for it. There's a, if we priced it at 60 euros, of course, it would have, we would have seen a right. collapse in subscribers. And if we priced it at five, maybe we would have gotten some subscribers in. But in that sweet spot, 15 to 30 euro type of site, and you can translate to, to dollars almost one to one, I think that the elasticity is, is pretty forgiving. I think we, it could be priced at that level. And you mentioned those strategic partners. Who do you think would be an ideal partner to take ESPN over the top? I know that Disney was having conversations with major leagues like the NFL, MLB. Are those types of partnerships still in play? You know, we haven't talked um, publicly about the partners that we're, that we're, that we're talking to. There have been some hypo you know, people hypothesizing about who those might be. I'll leave it at that. Um, and the press is often pretty accurate about things like that. Um, but we look, we want to have content partners who can really strengthen our hand and allow us to create multiple tiers of offerings. And we want to have distribution partners. So you think digital, you think telcos, those types of players. So while ESPN definitely uh, committed on the part of Disney, ABC, maybe not. Bob Iger said himself he's looking for you know, strategic options there. But you've just said yourself that linear TV is in its final death throes. So what does that mean? When you want to sell dying. a network, it's, it's a dying. Um, Who wants to buy a dying linear business right now? Well, 
it's like these linear businesses have, have historically been very profitable. Profit margins in the you know, 30 to 40 plus percent, which is incredibly high profits. Streaming will probably never get to that profitability level. Netflix, of course, is zooming into profitability and it has a nice operating leverage, meaning a lot of fixed costs. So when its revenues exceed its costs, pro, the profit margins can grow quite dramatically um, with, with, with small revenue growth. So they're in a great position with this operating leverage and I think a lot of the other streaming services are too. But to get to a 40% margin or 35% margin like broadcasting and cable used to get to, not gonna happen. But those, those. Netflix said it, it, it could. Yeah, no, may, maybe it could. You know, Reed Hastings is a, he's not he's the chairman now. Who knows? I don't see it. I see maybe t maybe mid twenties to high twenties margins. That's probably where, where it will top out. I think because of the competition between these services. But look, um, um, it's just hard to say where where it's all going to end up and 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 where the pricing can can go and. So you don't know, who, know what type of a buyer, like you think it's another media, it's a distributor? I'm trying to avoid the question Someone like Candle, I don't know. <laughs> You're inartfully not letting me avoid the question. <laughs> Look, I don't know who, who's, who, who the buyers are. You can, you can see consolidation among these big media companies happening. You can see uh, Warner Brothers combining with a NBC Universal or, or with a Paramount. There are some combinations to be had there. Stars is still, still sitting out there, mm -hmm. you know, owned by Lionsgate. That needs to be consolidated with someone. Maybe a big digital player will buy a, a, a really a, a Hollywood player. I do think the dissonance between cultures, as we talked about previously, makes it a bit difficult, and not to mention the regulatory issues. Whenever these big digital companies do almost anything, the regulatory scrutiny is massive. So digital to Hollywood, maybe that vertical integration might make sense. Horizontal integration, you know, Hollywood players getting a little bigger through consolidation to play so that there's more leveling up against, you know, in the competition, big against big against big instead of all the small guys, probably more likely. Mm -hmm. right? Well, let's talk about the future of Disney succession down the line, because whoever is the next Disney CEO is not going to run the Disney that it is today, that we all know today. So whoever that person is could possibly be you. Would you be open to that? If Bob Iger <laughs> called you right now and, and asked you, would you hesitate? I'm, I'm, running, you I'm, running, my other, I'm running companies, and you know, Candle Media is doing great, and I have a, a tech fund that I've invested in. So, so you know, no obvious answer to that one. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that Disney then? Whoever takes over the company, what does that look like? Well, it depends on what, what, how Bob Iger ends up reconfiguring it. Uh, it really does. It could be a Disney that has a majority ownership of ESPN with some really great partners on ESPN. Uh, and still running ESPN as, a, as an over-the-top service and in the bundle. It could be, mean the linear channels are either, are either part of Disney or, or aren't. And what I mean by the linear channels are the, the cable-only channels like A&E and Freeform and Disney Channel and then the broadcast channel, the, you know, ABC and its, and its, and its um, stations. Those may or may not be part of the company. They may be, maybe they're, they're put in some sort of joint venture of some sort. You can imagine all sorts of different dispositions for those assets. But then you're left with the core of the company, which I think is an amazing core. You have Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, and Pixar, the four brands that mean anything in entertainment, I think. We ran the table on those brands. You have the franchises that exist beneath those brands. You have all the different, and they're hugely powerful business platforms on which those brands are exploited. There's streaming, which I think will become profitable very, very soon. I'm, I told you, I'm a total believer in that. There's streaming, there's theme parks. People forget about consumer products. It's a massively uh, profitable business for the Walt Disney Company. So there's, you can exploit those franchises like no other company along those business platforms. And then you have theatrical releases and all the other ways to exploit content before it goes into streaming. And then games is the one place where I think Disney has not yet made mm. substantial investment. It's also a place where people can interact with and spend a lot of time with their favorite, favorite characters in context. So in a game context, so they're, they're, in, they're in the places that you want to see them and you can interact with the characters, you can control them, and you can monetize it. So gaming is the last big um, sort of business platform. You plug that into those core assets, no matter what happens to those linear networks, and you have a really great growth company sitting there. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a really bright future for Disney. So bright future for Disney, still unclear on succession. Why do you think it's been so difficult to find a permanent CEO for this company? It, it, there's a tradition at Disney that it's been difficult to do. Um, people thought, if you go back to Michael Eisner's tra transition to Bob Iger, that was forced by the board, first of all, that Michael had to leave. And I'm a, I'm a huge Michael Eisner fan. I think he did a great job. And people had their doubts about Bob Iger at the time. He turned out to be one of the best CEOs in American history, frankly. And I had the you know, front, 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 front row seat to that, and I can attest to it. Um, but that looked like it was a tough transition at the moment. 
And it's just hard. I think people, um, you know, especially if you're a CEO as successful as Bob, I think it pained him to see the company not live up to the standards that he had set for it. So stepping back in is something I think he felt he just had to do. Um, it was, you know, it was his, his, he had to step in to save the company. I think he'll do it. I'm a huge believer in Bob Iger. He will pick the, the, the he and the board, by the way, it's really the board's decision, not just Bob's, will pick a great successor. They have several of them in the company, the people outside the company that they could go to. I think this one, will, the, the next one, will be a, a good, a good process. Mm -hmm. And you've held a lot of C-suite positions, executive positions. How do you lead a company that's the, the stock is struggling, morale is low, you're fending off activist fights? How do you determine long-term decisions when you're dealing with all these short-term problems? It's Bob has his hands full. I, I, I got to say, you take someone like Bob. He's very capable. He's multifaceted. He can, he can. You know, he has a lot of range, so he can handle it. Not everyone could handle a situation like that. But I think you have to be disciplined. And Bob's always been very strategic. So um, when we did M&A, we were very much about, let's look at the strategy, let's look at the context, look, look at where we want this company to be, and then look at what assets can plug in there to get us there. And we were very urgently, we urgently wanted to have brands, because we felt brands were the most important thing that could ever, that, that any company can have, but especially in entertainment. So that's something that we really felt was important. And he's very disciplined about that. So I think he's going to, Look at all his options. He's going to stack up where the endpoints where he wants to be in the end, and he'll do take the actions that he thinks will provide the most value to shareholders in the end. And he'll he'll look at it that way. And when you do the right things, strategically for the long term, that don't harm, don't impair you too much for the short term, I think you can work through these multiple issues. I think people like Nelson Peltz will acknowledge, okay, that looks like the right strategic move. When the stock market starts to see. Um, less uncertainty. One of the things that they're reacting to the stock market is what's happening with Hulu. So we're about to find out what's going to happen with ESPN. What's going to happen to linear networks? What's Bob's vision for the overall company in three to five years? When, they, when all those uncertainties starts getting knocked down and they're starting to get knocked down, I think you'll see the stock price react. So I think that when the stock price goes up, he articulates a great strategic vision that'll take care of most most of the problems he has. And real quickly, with your work at Candle Media, you've made a lot of investments. Would you ever consider selling yourself? Well, we're, run, we're owned by private equity by Blackstone. Great partners, mm -hmm. for sure. And private equity wants an exit. In fact, you have to have an exit. Yep. So look, there's three things that could ha happen to Candle. We're, we, we are at a scale right now. We could be a public company. So I guess we could IPO at the right time and the market's allowed and, and when the strikes are over and mm -hmm. our, we have our growth footing back and everything like that. Um, we could be bought by a strategic. You know, a Disney or Warner Brothers, any of those, any of those would be happy to have, especially Moonbug, which has Coco Melon, which is the biggest kids property in the world right now. So it really fits with any of these media yeah. companies, and we bring a little bit of a new media mindset to it, also, which I think modernizes whoever buys us, and we bring that perspective. So it could be a strategic buyer, and private equity companies often recapitalize and sell to other private equity companies. So you know, who knows? Maybe KKR owns us in, in three years or four years, but. Um, look, we're, we're set up for any of them. Uh, Tom and I are not are, are working with Blackstone, not out of ego or anything else. We want to create a new, a great new company. We want to provide value to shareholders, and whatever that path is, that's what we're going to do. All right. Well, we'll see. Kevin Mayer, co-CEO and co-founder of Candle Media. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate. I love the sports conversations because uh, my son is one of those people that would pay just about anything to make sure the red zone goes around and around and around at the end. Um, so thank you to Alexandra and Kevin for all that. All right, so we have to stay in the media space. I'm super excited about this next guest, actually. Jeff Zucker enjoyed a stint as a producer on NBC's flagship Today Show, which he turned into a raging success killing it, making it the key morning show. Then he went on to launch The Apprentice, starring, of course, our former president, Donald Trump. He, Zucker then became the top man in media, turning CNN into a global media powerhouse. Since leaving in 2022, Jeff has assumed the role of Redbird IMI CEO, and he's now on the prowl, not my, not my words, those are theirs, on the prowl looking for investment opportunities. It's an honor to welcome Jeff Zucker along sta on the stage, of course, along with Yahoo Finance uh, anchor Shauna Smith. Thank you both. Oh. All right. 
Well, Jeff, let's start by taking a step back and okay. talking about where things stand in the media industry right now. We were just listening to Kevin Mayer. He was on stage just before us talking about some of the disruption that's happening specifically at Disney. But when you take in, into account what's happening across the landscape, where do you see the future of media going? Wow, OK. Um, well, look, I mean, obviously, this is a very uh, uh, transitional time for media. I mean, obviously, every uh, legacy media company for sure, but even many of the newer companies are facing challenges uh, you know, with distribution, with advertising, with the macro economy, uh, how people are consuming. Look, this is, a, this is a difficult time in media. But the one thing that you know is that people are always going to want to watch great entertainment, and they're going to want to watch sports, and they're going to want to consume news and information. So that is always going to be uh, there. The question is how. And I think that we're in, a, we're in a transition time that takes three, five, seven years. Nobody knows for sure. Um, but the reality is great content, great information, uh, great sports will always win out. How it's distributed is, is the question. And uh, there will be new uh, combinations, new forms of distribution over the next three, five, seven years, some of which we don't see today. Um, and, and so, but right now, clearly, it's a, it's a difficult time for all, all media companies, both legacy and, uh, uh, and new, if you're not named Netflix. Yeah, exactly. We talk about the future of cable, a lot of the debate out there is whether or not cable is going to survive. You mentioned the fact that there's a lot to be excited about in terms of how certain things are obviously very valuable still. Mm -hmm. Is cable going to survive? Well, I mean, look, I think cable will be here for the next, you know, cable will be here for the next decade. Yeah. It obviously will continue to diminish. Um, uh, by the way, beyond the next decade, nobody knows what anything will look like, right? But, but cable will be part of the landscape for, for the next decade. It will obviously continue uh, to have fewer and fewer uh, subscribers. But you know, even at 45, 50 million subscribers, cable is still a very powerful uh, distribution outlet. So yes, cable is not what it was when we had nearly 100 million subscribers uh, a decade ago. But even at half of that, it's still powerful. Beyond a decade from now, I don't think anybody has any clue. So Jeff, let's talk about what you're doing right now. CEO of Redbird IMI, you've made three investments so far, Front Office Sports, Hidden Pigeon, and Everwonder Studio. Why do those investments make sense, given the changes that you were just talking about within the environment, within I think, the industry? Yeah, well, I think that they make sense because, uh, go back to what I said before, great content will win. And no matter what the distribution mechanism is, you're, you're going to want great content. And so what we're looking at is trying to build over time, build, uh, invest in, acquire uh, platforms in the entertainment space and in the news space. and. Um, and scale them uh, and grow them globally. So global platforms on the news and entertainment uh, sides. And within entertainment, that'll be scripted, unscripted, children's, gaming, whatever. And so you know, the three investments that we've made uh, thus far, uh, Ever Wonders, a, a nonfiction studio producing documentaries and, and series uh, on the entertainment side. Um, Hidden Pigeon Company uh, is the uh, intellectual property of the incredible children's author, Mo Willems. Anybody who has kids ages four to nine will know that Mo Willems is the you know, leading author. And, and so that's an opportunity to uh, further uh, push his great intellectual property into, into video. And, uh, and then Front Office Sports uh, is really uh, a, a new digital outlet that's covering the intersection of sports and business. Uh, and so that, that moves us into the, the digital news and information space. So that's really how they play into our hopes to build over time uh, two platforms, news and, and entertainment, uh, that are global, independent, and scaled. So let's talk a little bit more, more about some of the disruption, not to focus on Disney once again, but I'm curious to get your perspective on what is happening right now. Bob Iger, back as CEO, he's laid out a number of initiatives. Uh, changes that he has already made to the company. I'm curious what your advice would be to Iger today. Oh, well, first of all, I, I am in no position to, to give Bob advice. And, and Kevin was just here and obviously knows uh, far better than I. But look, you know, uh, as Kevin noted, uh, Bob has been one of the, uh, the greatest CEOs in all of industry. He, he'll, uh, you know, clearly he has challenges, as, 
as they were just discussing, as, as we were talking about, every media company faces them. I'm in no position to offer advice, um, uh, but clearly they are going through that transition that I was talking about. And you know, even Disney is not immune to that. And so I think that shows you that uh, everyone is really uh, struggling. We're in this transition period of the next few years where, where what we have known will be very different. Uh, um, the one constant will be the great sports that are on ESPN, you know, or the great content that's on Hulu or uh, the cable networks there. And you know, that comes back to, I think the thing that will, will succeed is great content uh, uh, no matter what the distribution mechanism or platform is, whether it's you know uh, something like TikTok or something like ESPN uh, or one of the legacy cable outlets, they all need great content. Jeff, when we talk about ESPN and really sports just in general, when you talk about the rights deals that have come up, the NBA coming up next, obviously costs are exploding. So when you take a look at ESPN, that division within Disney, I guess, is there a sustainable path when you're trying to balance some of the costs and what's necessary in order to get that great to great content that you're saying is so valuable? Well, I mean, look, I mean, uh, people are going to have to uh, pay for that content. And if, if, as Kevin was discussing, it goes uh, all digital and it goes to ESPN Plus, there will become a price point uh, that, that uh, they'll need to charge in order to make a sustainable business that will allow them to continue to, to pay those, those costs. Look, uh, um, there is always going to be great demand uh, to watch great sports. And the NBA will be the beneficiary of that in the next uh, contract renewal. And, and, uh, and I think Adam Silver uh, is in a great position. And, and uh, they'll reap the benefits of that. I think that uh, uh, sports rights are worth it. And, uh, and I think that's what we've continued to see. There's nothing stronger. There's no brand that's greater in the, in the United States uh, and now uh, beyond the United States shores than the NFL. And you know everybody uh, always worries about how much that was going to cost. And yet, it, it's, the, uh, it's the single most important asset for many of these media companies. Yeah, certainly, and obviously attracting huge bucks. Jeff, let's talk about where you were before Redbird IMI, and that's CNN, mm -hmm. president of CNN. There was a story that ran over the summer talking about if CNN were to ever be put up for sale, that you would potentially be interested in buying it, a potential suitor. Any truth to that? Well, what that story said was that we were trying to uh, trying to buy it, and there was absolutely no truth to that Why whatsoever. Not? Would you ever be interested in, in these cases? You know, look, I mean, I think what we've said on that, we're, we're certainly not looking at it. It's not for sale. Um, you know, I think what we've always said is any asset uh, of that stature, CNN is a fantastic asset. Uh, anything that, that came to market, we would obviously look at. Um, it's not something that we're uh, actively thinking about or pursuing. It's absolutely, as far as we know, not for sale. Um, uh, so there was no truth uh, in, in any way whatsoever uh, to that uh, Variety report this, uh, this summer. Um, uh, someday, if it were uh, available, like any other great asset, we would look at it. And, and that's not to uh, um, say yes or no. It's just to say it's a great asset. If the time came, we would look at it. How does a company like CNN, obviously they're pushing into streaming as well as CNN Max now, how do they walk that fine line trying to maintain those lucrative cable contracts but also making sure that they're positioned to be a dominant player when we talk about the transition to streaming? Yeah, well, I mean, look, this is something we were thinking about when we were there. Um, and obviously, uh, it's a, a major focus for them today, as it needs to be. I mean, the reality is uh, you have to meet the consumer where they are. And um, uh, you know, I think that the linear uh, aspect uh, will continue to be important, but they have to, you know, they have to play digitally, they have to play in streaming, and, uh, and, and they're going to have to balance that transition. It is going to be difficult. We, we saw that that was going to take some time, and we, we were uh, conscious of that. Uh, I'm sure that you know, they've got uh, a very good management team in place there. They'll, um, they'll have to navigate that. You know, it's obviously going to affect the bottom line in the short run, but but that's what's going to have to happen as all of these companies uh, make that transition. Um, uh, but they have to. So uh, if it's inevitable, they need to do it. 
When you talk about that transition, more specifically the timeline, I guess what does that timeline look like? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, I mean, I think it, we've, it's begun, mm -hmm. right? Um, how long it takes and how quickly you get there. I don't think you can fully uh, give up on the established linear audience uh, that's there. I think you're going to have to play in, in multiple uh, arenas for uh, a little while, and that, you know, that will, uh, there is a cost of, of doing that. Um, and uh, I think that each of these companies is just going to have to, to navigate that, that transition. Um, that's something that we were thinking a lot about as we were, we were uh, prepared to make that transition at CNN. And uh, you need uh, patient ownership um, that will, you know, you will win on the other uh, on the other side once you get there. But it's all about the transition. Jeff, let's turn to the 2024 election. Here we are, just about a year out. There was a New York Times poll earlier this week talking about the fact that former President Donald Trump is leading in key swing states. When you think about another potential Trump presidency, the risks that are associated with that, and what you learned or your biggest takeaways from covering 2016, his presidency, obviously, and then the 2020 election. Yeah, 2016, 2020, and now 24. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, I think that, um, I think a couple of things. One, um, you know, there's a lot of people in this country who don't see risks associated uh, with that possibility. And I, I think that you have to acknowledge that as well, right? I think that the reason that a lot of people woke up in 2016 and were surprised that Donald Trump had won is because they never really uh, took that seriously. And, and I think that anyone who doesn't think that, that that's a, a distinct possibility here in 24 uh, is fooling themselves. So that, uh, that is real, and, and you have to acknowledge that a lot of those people who support him don't see it as a risk. Now, on the other hand, uh, uh, I think that the key uh, in preparing for that possibility, and, and I think you have to acknowledge it's a real possibility, is, um, is not to get caught up in the, uh, in the polls that came out yesterday. There's so much attention uh, attendant to that, uh, and I, I think that continues to be a huge mistake uh, in, the, Why is uh, that? in the media. Well, because, you know, first of all, uh, if you went by the poll in 1983, uh, you would have thought that there's no way that Ronald Reagan could win re-election, or, or the poll in 2011, there's no way that Barack Obama could have won re-election. Now, obviously, things are different now where, you know, this is not 1983, this is not 2011. Uh, uh, the media is different, social media is different, the world has changed a lot. Having said that, I think that, you know, I made this mistake, uh, so I always try to, like, be, uh, you know, be self-aware of these things. You know, listen, we would often uh, pay too much attention to polls as well. So this is not like, oh, they're, they're doing it, but we never made this mistake. Of course we made this mistake. Uh, I'm just saying that I think that, you know, I think that this is a time that requires much more reporting. I think I look at the piece, uh, you know, that the New York Times did last week on, on the people that the Trump administration would hire or is working with now uh, to, to set in place their plans. I look at the piece that the Washington Post that Josh Dossie and Devlin Barrett wrote over the weekend about what a Trump administration would look like. That's the kind of reporting and, and, and uh, discussion that I think needs to be much more vigorous. Not like, not don't take me through the horse race for the next 12 months. Take me through what, what it will be. And you know, for some, that will then portray the risks that you talked about. And I think those risks are real. I think that we are at a critical time uh, in America. And, uh, and I do think American democracy uh, is very much uh, uh, on the line. You just need to look at uh, the interview that George Stephanopoulos did with uh, Majority Leader Steve Scalise on Sunday uh, uh, to see that election denialism uh, is incredibly uh, strong and rampant in this country and, uh, and a huge issue. So then how does the media then win back that lost trust among some? Well, I mean, I think that, 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 I think that is a, that's an issue. Look, I, I think we're at a unique uh, time uh, in, uh, in America. The media has always, uh, you know, everybody's always wanted to beat up on the media. Uh, yes, people say they hate the media, but or they don't trust the media, institutions in America uh, in the last five, eight years have come under huge uh, uh, assault. Uh, 
much of that from Donald Trump. And, uh, and I think that that has torn down many of our great institutions in this country, including media. And, and I think that we just have to recognize that, that there's a reason that they want to take down the media, because they don't want uh, the media to, to do those stories that the Washington Post did or the New York Times did. And they don't want the media to ask Steve Scalise five times whether or not uh, uh, Joe Biden won the election. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, if you focus on how do we win back that trust in the media, then you might be afraid to do your job. Mm -hmm. I think the key is do your job, seek the truth, uh, don't give air and time to those who lie, and, uh, and uh, you know, over time, the truth will win out. But if you don't allow, uh, but if you don't keep going, uh, then I think we could be in for a huge issue, and I think this is as serious a time for American democracy uh, as we've seen uh, maybe in 250 years. You mentioned the factor when you alluded to some of the misinformation that's out there, disinformation. I also think about the coverage and what's happening right now with the Israel and Hamas war, and specifically the role that X Twitter, former Twitter, has played with it now as with Elon Musk as CEO. How, I guess, taking a step back, the media's coverage of the war. What are your thoughts on that? And then trying to police some of the misinformation out there, like what has played out on X. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I, think, I think by and large, the media coverage uh, uh, of the war has been, um, has been very strong. There, is always going, there are always going to be missteps and, and mistakes. The fog of war is real. The fog of war is very tough. I think acknowledging those mistakes as quickly as you can is really important because uh, um, you know, things do take on a life of their own. And, and so I think there is incredible pressure on the media. By and large, I think that they've done a, a very good job. Um, I think that one of the problems of covering the war, uh, which is incredibly hard, I mean, you never had social media and Twitter slash X and, and all of these other outlets on a uh, you know, a minute-by-minute minute basis uh, uh, criticizing everything that gets said and reported. And so it's really hard in that respect. I do think that one of the things that I think as time goes on that gets forgotten is how this all began and what started on October the 7th. And I think remembering that context in the, uh, in, in the coverage of the war is incredibly important. And, uh, uh, you know, just as I don't think there are two sides to an insurrection in America, and just as I don't think there are two sides to uh, American democracy, uh, I don't think there are two sides to, to terror. And, uh, and I don't think you can ever forget that. There is still misinformation out there and, with and Musk at the helm of yeah, X. Well, is he in at, danger then to this, well, at this point? <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, um, I do think that um, Twitter uh, X um, does need uh, to take a look at, uh, at what has happened in the last year. And, uh, and I'm not sure it's uh, the, the reliable source of news and information that we always thought it could, it should, and would be. Unfortunately, Jeff, we're out of time. But thank you so much. Thanks for having for me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank Pleasure. You. wise words, the truth prevails, and they, I am a firm believer that it will. So thank you to Shauna and Jeff for that. All right, what a great morning this has been. At least I, for one, I'm certainly enjoying it. I hope you have too. We're about to break for lunch, so we invite those of you here at Moonlight Studios to enjoy your kava bowls, because he really did leave us lunch. It wasn't a, wasn't a joke. Um, and be sure to check out the company's stock while you're at it, Yahoo Finance, all new. Check out the site, check out all the really awesome features. We're gonna to return to the main stage in about a half hour. If you are watching today's event on Yahoo Finance, we're gonna to toss you to our halftime report, which is down at the New York Stock Exchange, hosted by Akito Fujito and Josh Lipton. But first, we're gonna take a word from our sponsor. Rock, paper, scissors? He just played paper. 
he'll do it again. No, Rock. Men statistically play Rock, but he played paper and lost, and the mind works in patterns. He's going scissors. He knows I know he'll go scissors, but knowing I know, he knows. Scissors, shoot. I thought we were doing rock, paper, scissors, shoot. It's always rock, paper, scissors. Think like a trader? Join the club, genius. Tasty trade. Normally, you would think about with all these interest rates going up, we see, would see a slowdown very quickly in the US. But we don't see it. And the reason is, of course, that not all that interest increase is going straight to consumers. It hits the ones that have variable interest rates, which corporation might have and, th uh, and things like that. So I see much more tougher in especially Europe. I think it's a little less about the elevated interest rate environment and a little more about expectations that with pressure on the commercial office sector, 
uh, pressure on the commercial real, uh, excuse me, retail sector, that there will be increasing liquidity requirements placed on lenders. The economic David actually right now look like in the direction of soft landing. Growth is still about potential. Inflation has been falling, and therefore we're going in the right direction. But interest rates are higher, higher for longer. That may slow down the economy. There are geopolitical risks that might lead to a spike in energy prices. And therefore, there are factors that could lead us to a short and shallow recession. And now, from a political point of view, even a short and shallow recession will be very damaging for Biden. I think it's not inappropriate to basically say, look, let's understand how everything is working through the economy before we continue to go in one direction or another. I think they're very mindful of the lesson uh, of the 1970s when you um, tightened and then you loosened too quickly. So I think they don't want to repeat that. Uh, but they don't yet have all the data that looks at what are the implications of long of the 10 year moving on its own upward because of a different set of forces than just the forces of the Fed. So I, I'll, I'd, I'd give them a break and say what they're doing right now seems reasonable. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Akiko Fujita alongside Josh Lipton. You've been watching our biggest conference of the year, Yahoo Finance Invest. Let's bring in our very own Brian Sazi, our executive editor, who has been on the ground for us. Um, Brian, we were just hearing uh, some of our guests talking about really the impact of higher rates. That seems to be the real focus, at least in the first half of the day. But what's been the big takeaway for you so far? Uh, you're right on, Akiko, and uh, good to see you and Josh there for us. Um, big takeaway for me, guys. Uh, Anthony Capuano, CEO of Marriott. We, him and I have something in common. We both like sugar-free Red Bull, so that was a big development for me. I had no clue that he was a Red Bull drinker. You know, I take great pride in getting to know leaders that I talk to, but I did not know that. But yes, lots to focus on higher interest rates for longer. What does it mean for capital investment? What does it mean to markets? What does it mean to just everyday investors out there on the new and improved yahoofinance.com trying to figure out what stocks to invest in, what companies to invest in, and then of course, what leaders to ultimately invest in. But I have to say, guys, uh, we just heard two amazing back-to-back -back conversations. Kevin Mayer, uh, who is now advising Disney, of course, he was a longtime Disney executive, advising CEO Bob Iker on how to turn around that company. Uh, Kevin Mayer, now the CEO of Candle Media. I encourage everyone to hop on Twitter slash X and consume that clip and listen to what Kevin Mayer just said about the turnaround plan that he is trying to advise CEO Bob Iger on, which comes as Disney shares are really at record lows. And oh yeah, Disney earnings are tomorrow afternoon. And then just moments ago, uh, I know you can see the crowd out here. They're all looking, uh, getting excited for their Kava bowls. We talked to Kava CEO Brett Shulman. Uh, the crowds here are packed. Those bowls are free. So I'd be online too, and I will be after this. But it is what Jeff Zerker uh, just told our very own Shauna Smith on stage just moments ago, just on the, the, the how the media may cover the election next year. Of course, Jeff Zucker led CNN. He uh, helped really launch NBC's morning show. And what people don't realize, he helped launch The Apprentice with former President Donald Trump. So he has had that firsthand look at how the former president, in fact, operates, telling our very own Shauna Smith, democracy, quote, democracy is on the line. Powerful quotes, guys, from Jeff Zucker. And Brian, you know, another interesting theme, I think, from this conference so far has been the read on the consumer. You know, we have these CEOs on stage. They have such important lines of sight into the state and health of the consumer. And it's, it's interesting what they're saying, Brian, what they're telling you. You know, Verizon CEO Hans Vesterberg saying, listen, we haven't seen any payment issues, he told you. Consumers are still paying their bills. Granted, he said we have, you know, more relatively higher quality consumer, but haven't seen deterioration there. Sees it can still consumer doing okay. Marriott CEO Anthony Capuano echoing that same thing, Brian, not seeing real cracks there. He sees strength in leisure, he told you, strength in group, uh, even strength in business. I thought that was a really interesting theme because here on Yahoo Finance, we're talking a lot about these sort of storm clouds for the consumer, rising rates, elevated inflation, but at least some of these CEOs saying, you know what, the CEO right, the consumer right now looks pretty good. Josh, I need to, I need to channel my inner sponge right now. I can see our, there's our senior columnist, Rick Newman, uh, had a great conversation with Noriel Rubini early on, really awesome chat on Bidenomics. But nonetheless, I need to channel my inner sponge here and really take in 
what some of these top leaders said about the consumer. Yes, to your point, we had uh, Hans Vestberg, chairman and CEO of Verizon, telling us that people are paying their bills on time. That's always a good thing, especially when your phone bills are very, very high uh, in the likes of what these telecom companies are charging. So that is good. Marriott CEO, Anthony Capuano, struck a bullish tone on holiday season bookings, which I think dovetails nicely with the strong lodging season Marriott and others have in fact seen all year long. Kava CEO, Brett Shulman, I was mentioning Kava Bowls. We talked to Brett Shulman, people are paying 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 dollars, even 20 in some cases for an overloaded Kava Bowl. That is all good, but I will note this. I did have a conversation with Norfolk Southern CEO, Alan Shaw, just moments ago, noting that the rail industry has been in a down cycle in large part because of pressure on the truck industry. He says things are starting to turn the corner, but anytime I hear a rail company, which is always a forward-looking indicator, that is the railroad industry, anytime I hear the CEO of a rail company tell me, and from a global audience of millions, that there is a freight recession and they are in a down cycle, it's a red flag. So I have a lot to think on right now, guys. Yeah, Brian, also interesting uh, to get so many of these executives in the room to kind of weigh in on what's happening on a global level. Anthony Capuano is saying that he's still very bullish on China, which is not necessarily what we've heard from other businesses as well. So a lot of interesting insight coming out of Yahoo Invest. Of course, we're going to check back in with you uh, in the afternoon. A jam-packed session there still ready to go. Uh, Brian Sazi, thanks so much for that. Well, there is more news out there today, obviously, in the market. Let's do a quick check of where the majors are right now as we go into the afternoon session. All three majors in the green, the Dow up 99 points, the S&P 500 up 15, and the NASDAQ up 126. Uh, we are like, taking a look at some... Bigger movers today, though, Uber shares are on the move after seeing revenue rise 11 percent from last year, but missed analyst expectations. The rideshare giant saw gross booking for its mobility segment jump 31 percent. Gross bookings from delivery climbed 18 percent year on year. The headline coming out of here, Josh, you could argue second consecutive profitable quarter, but they are seeing slowing revenue growth. Yes, it was up 11 percent year on year, but growth was its slowest pace of growth in Roughly 10 quarters. Yeah, one thing to note is, I mean, the stock's up today. It has been a monster this year. The stock is now up 100% so far in 2023. And, and the street's reaction, just digging through the analyst responses here, it seems broadly positive. I mean, bottom line, Uber's forecast for booking and profit beat the streets consensus there. I think a key metric there, total gross bookings, so that's ride hailing, food delivery, freight, estimated hit 36.5 to 37.5 billion in Q4. That's the forecast. Street was actually at 36.3. Initially, the stock dropped because Q3 revenue did come in a touch light there, but then Uber kind of explained, listen, that, that was due to some, some model changes here, some accounting changes, and now the stock higher in today's trade. Hi, um, let's take a look at another stock. Uh, we've been watching oil really closely. Yep. Saudi Aramco, big beneficiary yeah, listen, on the back of that. Saudi, that is another one to watch here. Aramco saw net profit slip 23% in the third quarter to $32.6 billion. That was actually down from $42.4 billion from the same time last year as the impact of falling oil prices hitting the sector. So we watch Aramco, obviously, because it, it is Saudi Arabia's national oil company. Um, highlights, I think, their decline quarterly profit, net profit, $32.6 billion. That was down about 20% from a year ago. Of course, a year ago, higher energy prices, as we noted, as Russia invaded Ukraine. Free cash flow, though, $20.34 billion. That was nearly $45 billion a year ago. And revenue, revenue did rise in the quarter, and capital expenditures increasing, too. Maintain the dividend, looks like, to the Saudi government. Total payout, $29.4 billion. Yeah, I mean, the context in all this, as we look at oil prices, Saudi Aramco pumps out more than 10% of the world's oil supply. So this is a big one that we watch really closely, uh, up about four tenths of a percent here. Profits, as you pointed out, down compared with where it was a year ago. But but we're still talking about uh, the second quarter coming in higher than expected. And by the way, it is a state owned enterprise. We have seen the Saudis, along with Russia and OPEC plus, make these steep cuts of one million barrels per day. And that is a big beneficiary on the back of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, Saudi Aramco sort of highlighting that as well kind of goes along with the larger discussion about whether, in fact, the price moves that we have seen in oil really do match where the demand picture is. Yeah, and also, listen, it is just so critical and important for the Saudi government. I mean, it, at a time when we know Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is trying to diversify his economy, so he's, he's making these purchases of sports teams, he's thinking about futuristic cities, Aramco is certainly part of that narrative. Yeah, the revenue is all going to come from 
something Aramco. like an Aramco. Right. And so obviously they, they've got this timeline they're working with to really bring in that revenue from oil. Let's talk about another stock that we're watching today. UBS also on the move after reporting a net loss of $785 million in the third quarter. Its first quarterly loss in nearly six years. But it did see stronger than expected wealth management client inflows after some stabilization at Credit Suisse. This is a company that is very much in transition after integrating Credit Suisse. And the company making it very clear that they are going to have to increase some of those costs. But for the long term, it is about really creating this powerhouse in wealth management. We did hear from a CEO, Sir Jeremody, saying specifically that 2024 would be a pivotal year for the takeover. But he said, this is going to be a one time we're going to incur the cost in order to achieve the synergies that will really start to show through in 2025 and 2026. So the company's saying, look, we're playing the long game here. You're going to see a hit because of credit suites. Yeah, the integration hit is there. I mean, so as you mentioned, swung to a third quarter loss. That's that Credit Suisse integration in full swing. That, that's having an impact. I mean, close that acquisition, remember, in June. So the net loss clocked in at $785 million versus $1.73 billion in net profit in the prior year. And you can pin that on those operating expenses. They surged more than 90 percent, it looks like. Revenue, though, we should you note know, that that did jump. It looks like more than 40 percent, $11.7 billion. So beat expectations. The stock has enjoyed a nice run, by the way, nice, strong 23. It's up about 30 percent so far this year. 30 percent. Not yep. a bad pop there. And most analysts, it looks like fans. I mean, most here, it looks like 54 hmm. percent say this one, Akiko, you should own. Okay. All right, think about it for your portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about another story that uh, we are watching or we have been watching very closely, and that is WeWork now officially filing for bankruptcy. The once $47 billion company back in 2019 has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection for its locations in the U.S. and Canada and reported liabilities from $10 billion to $50 billion. That's at least according to the initial filing. When we were talking about yesterday, Josh, this has been very uh, highly anticipated for some time. Um, you have to wonder what this means for the property market. You know, we've talked about what the impact could be potentially in New York, where they had their biggest footprint at some point. Uh, at the end of the day, this is about the downturn that we have seen in commercial real estate. We work taking on a big load and they're getting hit at the very end of the day. Yeah, we talk about the personalities too. We talk about Adam Newman. Of course, we worked one time CEO, uh, co-founder, dynamic personality, gifted salesman, won over a lot of venture investors, <laughs> raised a ton of money, right? But then, of course, you know, we had the $60 million jets, what was described as sort of erratic person, you know, management style, deported in 2019. It's not that this is a, an Adam Newman story. I mean, listen, it's a business model story, but he was certainly the face of it. And, and let's talk about one that we haven't heard so much, right? You talk about gifted salesman. I mean, he did sell. He sold. We work on, you know, Masayoshi Son yes. and SoftBank left with a lot here. I mean, yeah. they were the ones that essentially pushed that valuation to $47 billion. Bloomberg now estimating that this decline that we have seen where we work roughly $11.5 billion in equity losses for SoftBank, another $2.2 billion in debt still on the line for SoftBank. Masayoshi Son coming into this really seen as the guy who could sort of, you know, identify early on what those big companies were going to be. Alibaba was a big bet. Now you've got to wonder what his reputation is when you think about the biggest bet he made on WeWork yeah. now filing for bankruptcy. It's remarkable. And some of these numbers, just per the journal, WeWork saying that the company owns, owns 15 billion assets. But here's the other side, carries debts now. Akiko totaling nearly 19 billion. It owes nearly $100 million in unpaid rent and lease termination fees. So just a, a historic collapse. I mean, again, worth remembering, this was a start of it once it was valued at $47 billion. 2019, that was it. We're yeah. just talking four years ago. Raised billions from investors, grew fast, signed hundreds of office le leases. The 2010s just built an empire, but as you noted, it was predicated on the office space sector remaining healthy. Then came the pandemic and then came COVID-19 and it crashed. Yeah, and worth noting that we're talking about this bankruptcy filing only affecting the U.S. and Canada offices. But this is a global operation. You know, they've got office spaces in Europe. They had office spaces in Asia. You know, what does this mean for the overall footprint? A story that I think we will continue to watch as well. Yeah, for sure. All right. And getting back to the theme of Yahoo Finance's Invest, I had a chance to sit down and speak to Klarna CEO Sebastian Shimatkovsky about the space. Take a listen. No, so it's actually very, very strong. And I think that this is one of the things where, you know, 
people may have not entirely understood buy now pay later. I mean, a lot of things get labeled buy now pay later nowadays, but our core model has been to do something very different to what the credit cards do, right? So the credit cards en encourage you to put all of your uh, spending on, on credit. We encourage you to do debit or credit. Actually, 35% of our transactions are debit. And then we offer you a fixed installment and we charge zero interest. And what this means, it attracts consumers that are very thoughtful about their spending. People are tired of credit cards. They know that they're there to maximize your balance, to charge you as high interest rates as possible. Um, and the more cautious, more thoughtful consumers are choosing Klarna because they're seeing it as a better option. You can see that in our losses. They're 30% below credit card industry standards. So these consumers are very thoughtful. Uh, they want to use this kind of alternative product. And, and they're tired of the old credit cards. And since you also see actually that they are in general doing better during more uncertain times like we're going through right now. And that's what, what we can see in our number. Our losses are down. We are uh, returning to profitability uh, uh, this, this quarter. And so it actually looks fairly well from that perspective. But at the same point of time, we can definitely see that consumer spending in general is weaker. And we see that among our merchants and our retailers that you know compared to a year ago, there's definitely less spending online in particular, but also in general. So that's interesting because you do have a really interesting insight into the consumer, Sebastian. So you're saying your take on the consumer here, you do see some some caution creeping in? Yes. I think what has happened, right, is that we're coming from we're coming from COVID. We're coming from in the US distributed checks, people, you know, money coming from from the sky basically, right? And and then we had inflation. And, but we also had a little bit of that additional spending that happened when people were, you know, coming out of COVID, coming out of those restrictions. And now people's savings have, you know, come down and their credit card debt has come up again. We're over a trillion dollars of credit card debt now in the US again. We're seeing, you know, an average $5,000 in, in credit card debt. So now people are starting to see the price differences. They're starting to cut back on some uh, discretional spending. And uh, yeah, and it is definitely a difference. And it always takes a little bit longer than you expect these changes in the market, right? And let me, uh, let me ask you also, Sebastian, about this just rising rate environment we find ourselves in, because that can pose a, a challenge for the buy now, pay later segment. You know, one, pressures consumers, but two, you know, raising funding costs, pressures margins. How are you mm -hmm. navigating that challenge? Well, that's another thing that surprised you with the buy now, pay later. I mean, again, uh, there are other buy now, pay later people out there who are actually borrowing, you know, big amounts, big ticket items, and mattresses, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. And that's different. In our case, our average balance is only $100 to $150. And people pay it down. So we turn around our balance sheet 12 times a year. So actually, the cost of funding that balance sheet per loan is very, very small part of the cost. And this means that even in this in interest uh, environment, actually, our costs have risen very little. Uh, and at the same point of time, obviously, our offering has become more attractive because the credit cards have taken the opportunity to increase their rates. And so offering 0% interest-free credit right now is even more attractive than it was a year ago. So you, you, you see it's also a surprising part of the robustness of this model. And let me ask you about the, the regulatory landscape as well, Sebastian. You know, obviously, you're where regulators are taking more of an interest in the BNPL, the buy now, pay later market. How much of a risk is that for Klarna? And what do you see on that front coming up in 2024? Yeah, so we have gone through the same shifts in, in Europe. Uh, we've seen this in the UK. We've seen it in uh, in Brussels, in Europe, and so forth. I think a lot of this is obviously when there is a new form of credit coming, uh, Yeah, I think it's thoughtful and it makes sense of regulators to be a little bit skeptic. We've seen all types of uh, you know credit forms that have come that hasn't always been in the benefit of the consumers. So a lot of our work is just educating and showing uh, the regulators that this is actually an advantageous alternative to credit cards. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because many years ago, when you used to swipe your card, you would press, press one for debit, press two for credit. And then all the banks removed that. Why did they do that? Because you had a smaller balance at the end of the month if you also put some purchases on debit. And, and we're just trying to get back to those days. Um, and it turns that consumers, when they get those options, are actually spending more uh, safely and more thoughtfully. And so when we get the chance to actually sit down and show those numbers and have those discussions, then regulators, uh, you know, very quickly see this in a very different light. But obviously, if you're against credit altogether, if you don't believe people should ever use credit for any purchases, I'm not going to win a fight with you, right? So you have to recognize that still. Uh, but we think it's a better form of credit than the one that dominates the industry right now, which is the credit cards. I always recommend people to, sorry if I'm making a you know a competitive a potential suggestion here, but do watch Netflix credit cards explain. And I think you'll get a good summary of all the bad 
tactics that cons- uh, credit card companies have applied uh, the last decades. All right, a little plug there for Netflix as well. Let, let's talk, yeah. um, Sebastian, about the history of Klarna, because you know, 2022, it was a tough year for Klarna, but as it was for many companies, inflation, rates, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I know you guys had to lay off people. You posted a $1 billion loss, reportedly cut the valuation. As an executive, as a CEO, Sebastian, what did you learn from that experience and what adjustments did you make to the business because of it? Well, I think first and foremost, right, I mean, the, the odd thing now is I look back at it, to your point, the fact that we were investing so much that we were posting a loss of a billion dollars a year, right? It may sound a lot, and it is a lot, but you also have to put that to some perspective. As valuations were that high, Klarna was valued at $50 billion back then. This means that this is about a 2% dilution on an annual basis. And this is still, and I'm still very committed to this idea, Klarna is challenging the retail bank industry. This is a trillion dollar market opportunity. So there is very much real potential that this business could be worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillion, uh, if we accomplish what we've set out to do. And so I think, uh, but obviously investor sentiment shifted. Um, people weren't leaning as much into the future and wouldn't be, you know, wasn't willing to give you that credit for that future case. And they wanted to see profitability now. And that unfortunately then forced us to have to take very difficult decisions. We had to make a change, but I am quite proud of the fact that as an organization, everyone came together. Um, we m- turned around what was, you know, our worst month a negative EBITDA of $150 million. And then 12 months later, we posted our very positive EBITDA since 2019. So I still think that's a pretty impressive feat by the team here and all the people that contributed to this, who did all that work. And, uh, and obviously now we feel also encouraged that we, when we realized that things were changing, actually, you know, um, took that, realized it was tough. We had to do it, but we did it. And now we're benefiting from there because other companies who didn't act and, and they are in bigger trouble now. And, and Sebastian, I want to ask you some, at some headlines as well, get your response that Klarna could face a strike at its Swedish headquarters if a collective bargaining agreement isn't reached with these two employee unions. Just walk me through that new Sebastian and what could it potentially mean for the business? Right. So um, this is a, a, a Swedish uh, thing where in Sweden, uh, most companies or a lot of companies have what we call a collective bargaining agreement. It's actually, if you would take, you know, top hundred, uh, there are only a few, us and Spotify, who do not, um, uh, are not participating in that. Uh, it's not from a legal point of perspective, you know, uh, the Swedish law doesn't mandate you to sign this, but it's, uh, it's uh, expected. Uh, and, uh, but I think from our perspective, what we've been trying to do is create something even better. I mean, we pay our employees above what a collective bargaining agreement would give. We have better benefits, better, uh, we offer them um, better, um, all, all kind of employee benefits, so to speak. And, um, and in addition to this, um, you know, we have created a very attractive environment where people want to work here. Uh, people who work at Klan are sought after in all of Sweden, all of Europe, and internationally nowadays as well. Um, so we will see how this uh, plays out, but we're hopefully that we will be able to come to a good resolution. Now let's talk about competition as well, uh, Sebastian. There's a lot of it, as you know, including a firm. Much is often made of the Amazon Affirm partnership. I'm interested, you know, are you all talking to big tech companies, big big retailers about any kind of similar arrangement? Uh, for sure, all the time. I mean, if you look you know, uh, at the U.S. market, over of the hundred top 100 U.S. retailers, more than half of them are working with Klarna today, and many more than are working with a firm, right? So I think a firm has been wise to strike a partnership with Amazon, obviously, with Shopify. But I think if you look at the rest of the market, Klarna has been extremely successful. And again, a firm is slightly of a different business. It's more of a fi- traditional finance lender uh, in the sense that there's more high ticket, uh, big ticket value. Klarna is more focused on kind of an average $100, $150. So actually, from the outside, we've been kind of put in a box and said, this is the same thing. But if you actually look at the businesses much more closely, you realize that we are very, very different. And looking ahead now, uh, Sebastian, any interest in, in bringing Klarna public? And do you think that could be a, a 2024 event? Um, I don't think it's uh, unthinkable. Um, I mean, to me, I've been very consistent when I've been getting these questions a few times. And that has been that I believe that, like, you know, uh, in order for Klarna to be ready, there was always a few things. I think there's a fantastic opportunity to build a global retail banking in the, uh, company 
um, hasn't really existed. Yes, we do have some international brands in, in retail banking, but they're mostly just a conglomerate of local systems and local solutions under the same brand. So there's this fantastic opportunity to do that nowadays. And I think they're going to be the first banks that are going to have 500 million consumers or a, a billion consumers. And we want to be that company, but we always recognize that in order to do so, we need to be successful in the US. Uh, and successful in the US obviously means a few things. It means have significant presence, which we now do with over 30 million users, to be profitable and show that the business model work, which we're now on. We have three consecutive quarters of uh, gross profit in the US. And, and, and so those have been you know, critical elements. And then the third thing is just more about market conditions. We are a bank, we're fully regulated. We already you know, have to report on a quarterly basis. We have actually publicly traded uh, debt instruments and so forth. So it's not as big of a step. Uh, and I think now we're better positioned than ever to do it. So I wouldn't find it unlikely, but there's no commitment to a date or anything like that at this point in time. So an IPO is a possibility. I would think, Sebastian, what about selling the business? If you know Apple or a big bank came calling, would you take that phone call? <laughs> Look, I think it's my duty to my, my shareholders to always listen, right? But I think with, with that said, I, again, I feel that we're only at the beginning of this journey. Look, in a few, we've all, we had this vision that we formulated back in 16, which said that at some point of time, you're going to wake up in the morning and your computer slash financial assistant will say, hey, I analyze your mortgages. And I realized I could switch from bank A to bank B and save you $10 on your mortgage. And um, it will be as easy as saying yes. They will do, you know, the computer will do all the work for you, right? And this is where we think uh, retail banking and financial services is going, right? And so in that, in that future vision, who do you want to be? Well, obviously, you want to be the financial advisor that gave you that advice. Because if I do, maybe you tip me a dollar for doing it, right? And I think that's the only role to play in the future. That's what banking was supposed to be. Somebody to care about you, not themselves. Somebody that cared about your finances, somebody that helped you, right? And when I see ChatGP and how we're applying AI now, I finally feel like, wow, I can actually see that coming to fruition very soon. And this is going to have a dramatic impact on this industry. I think it's ironic to see what fintech is going through right now from a valuation perspective, considering the fact that we're on the cusp of this transition that will seriously change this industry. And I am more convinced than ever when I see what we're building internally, what we're launching and what we're doing. This is coming now and it's coming soon. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. And that's why I think, you know, right now, I'm not convinced that would be a great idea to consider such strategic options as there's so much potential and it's really happening right now. All right, Sebastian, we'll be watching. And thank you so much, Sebastian, for your time and your insight today. We really appreciate it. Our thanks there to Klarna CEO, Sebastian Shimakovsky. So a couple points um, on, on there, Akiko, that I want to, well, first of all, you heard us talking there. Was this kind of risk there may be a, a strike by some staff in Sweden, but the company now telling me they've actually put that to rest. They, they did sign a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement with an employer's association. So that issue does seem to be in the rear view mirror. The other, of course, we talked about an IPO for Klarna, whether they'll make a public debut. Talk of that has kind of been heating up, and, and you saw Sebastian there did not rule out that possibility. Yeah, I mean, you get the sense that uh, a lot of these companies have sort of been waiting out, right, for the market to, to maybe become a little calmer, given the pipeline that we've seen so far. Maybe that's on the cards as well. What I thought was kind of interesting here, number one, the higher rates being a potential tailwind for the company. Yes, we've seen credit card companies with those higher rates. With that said, will consumers increasingly move towards buy now, pay later? At the same time, he kept talking about that 100 to $150 sort of, what is it, the, the, the average payment or the average usage for Klarna, which is a little surprising to me because you wonder, well, if that's the case, you know, how big of a bump are you likely to get out of the higher rate environment? Because what we keep hearing is that it's the bigger purchases that are being placed on credit cards. Yeah, exactly. So we asked him about that because I think investors have been nervous about that rising beta market. If they had money put to work in BNPL, buy now, pay later firms, you have seen that nervousness. I think what he was trying to do there is say, we're all not credit equal. We have different models. We're serving different customers who are making different kinds of acquisitions. So so when I asked you know, about rivals like Max Levchin's Affirm, he was very quick to say, listen, yes, we're in the same space, but there are some important differences here. Well, and part of that is also that a lot of these companies, the buy now, pay later, the BNPL companies have received a criticism, right? Especially during the pandemic, when they saw huge growth to say, look, you are allowing the consumer to load up on debt, making it so easy to, to have those 
to use that in their purchases. I mean, that's partly the argument that he's making, that that's not necessarily what they're going for, because these are smaller purchases in the grand scheme of things. You know, it's, it's interesting, because that is a common criticism you hear. I checked in with Dan Dolev over at Mizuho, covers this space, knows these companies, and I asked him about that criticism, and his point was he thought, you know what, I don't see that in the companies that I cover, at least the way he covers. For example, he said a firm, which he knows well, he's got to buy in a firm, and Dan was telling me, listen, the delinquency rates for a firm are low. If it was true that they were all and yes, and they are often, in terms of the industry, younger consumers. If they're really getting loaded up on debt, you would expect to see higher delinquency rates, even in this high interest rate environment, he says, not seeing it right now. Yeah, and he did say what uh, Sebastian did say, trillion dollar market opportunity. So we're still talking about infancy. If we're talking about a trillion dollar market, potentially not just for Klarna, but for the overall BNPL space. Yeah, I, I, and I thought, listen, I thought it was interesting too, this talk of IPO, they just this week released their little, their recent financial results. And I thought what they reported was interesting, operating profit equivalent of $12 million for the, for the three months through September, they said. This is the company's first profitable result since the second quarter of 2019. If you were thinking, if you were thinking of making a public debut, that's the kind of results you think public market investors right now might want to see. They might want to see a decent bottom line. Just saying. Again, he didn't rule it out. He didn't rule it out. Now, a spokesperson did tell me, listen, no immediate plans. Yeah. Of course, immediate is a flexible word, a key go, as we well know. <laughs> it's sort of like valuation. It's in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah. 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 Consider that on our watch list yeah. coming into 2024. Yeah. Josh, thanks so much for sure. bringing that the conversation. And we've got much more to come at Yahoo Invest. Coming up on the other side, Meredith Whitney is going to be speaking with our very own Jen Schomberger. Much more to come on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.
How are the kava bowls? I mean, I'd come to seminars every day if there were kava bowls, right? <laughs> Excellent. All right, good. I hope everyone's doing great, ready to settle in for an amazing afternoon. We're going to dive back into the state of the economy. We only got a few left weeks left. I cannot believe we're talking about the holidays and in my world, you're in planning, financial planning, tax planning. It's crazy. So our next guest is no stranger to making big calls. This is why we love her. She is brave as the day is long, even smarter, quite frankly. She sounded the alarm on the housing market blowing up well before it crashed. This is more than a decade ago. Meredith Whitney, LLC founder, Meredith Whitney herself, is here and moderator Yahoo Finance senior reporter Jennifer Schaunberger are about to take the stage. Listen and enjoy. Welcome both of you. Thank you. Mayor, thanks so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thanks so much and thanks everyone for having me. Yeah, it's great to have this audience out here live. I want to kick the conversation off with your outlook for the economy. It's been more resilient than many folks would think. Do you think it could last? Well, I have never been one to say that we would go into a recession in 2023, and I don't think we're going to go into a recession in 2024, and here's why. Um, I divide the economy into two sectors. Um, those uh, under 38 years old, I call them the avocado toast generation. So that's Gen Z and the lower uh, cohort of um, the millennials. Um, they have jobs, they're employed, but uh, so they have money, they have income, but they don't have wealth, they don't own homes. And then you have 38 and above, which are the homeowners. And so. What's staggering is um, uh, the 38 and below are ha own less in terms of U.S. real estate than they've ever owned before, and um, those over 50, over 70 percent of U.S. housing is owned by those over 50. So if you've owned a home for the last 10 years. Um, you've made $21, million, $21 trillion in equity. So you're sitting on, so when we went to the housing crisis, um, equity levels were very low. Mm -hmm. So equity levels were in the 40% range um, in terms of uh, to loan, to, uh, loan to value, um, uh, and or equity to, to value. And today, that's gone up, up over 70%. So Americans are sitting on a tremendous amount of equity in their homes. It's a question of when they tap into it. And I think that um, you do not see credit card debt rising as fast as you would think it was. It's rising at about 24% of total spend, uh, consumer spending over the last 10 years. Um, the U.S. consumer is delevered dramatically. So at, like I said, 70% equity in homes, they can tap that at any point. Home equity lines of credit, which you would think they would tap, haven't been touched. They're actually lower than they were last year. Fed Chair Powell last week left the prospect of further interest rate hikes on the table. Uh, we heard this morning from Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed voter, uh, saying that he would rather over tighten. If we were to see rates move higher from where they are right now, does that change your forecast at all? Or on the flip side, to your point on home equity, the fact that homeowners are now sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or lower, 80% of Americans, I should say, are sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or lower, does that make the economy uh, more immune, perhaps? to the Fed's blunt interest rate tool? Surely it's going to have an impact, but it has the most direct impact on asset prices. And so I think if you look at the housing market today, um, and I think this is so critical with the U.S. consumer, which drives two-thirds of the U.S. economy, uh, you see home prices that are roughly at, at 20, 21, 20, 20, 21, 22 levels, maybe a little bit higher reflective of a very different interest rate environment. So when you have interest rates go higher, home values have to go lower. And I think something else is going, so that's just, net, that's just math. Mm -hmm. So I think something else is going to happen too. So when I say that um, over 70% of homes are owned by people over 50, um, AARP estimates, and this is a long-term estimate um, of multi-decade, that 51% of people over 50 downsize to smaller homes. Um, that's over 30 million units of housing. And it's, uh, I think it's rate agnostic because older people have lower mortgages, if any mortgage at all. Last year, uh, you had record uh, ho all cash deals in terms of home, um, home purchases. So in Naples, 58% of the homes that were transacted were all cash. So I think what happens is you have high levels of, of equity, 
um, when people want to sell, they will reduce their home prices and sell. That means the sooner you sell, the more you, the, the, the higher probability that you lock in the paper equity gains that you have, the later you sell, there's going to be, what today there is a uh, demand supply uh, imbalance where there's too much demand, not enough su supply. That's going to invert um, as boomers, more and more boomers start to sell and downsize or over 50 start to, to downsize and that's the vast, vast majority of, of homes that will come on the market, then you'll see a supply demand dynamic uh, shift. Now, because what, so what's going to drive homes. that? Because as I just mentioned, 80% of Americans sitting on fixed rate mortgages of 5% or less, you're saying all, they bought all cash, they don't have mortgages right now, but no, no, mortgage what, rates what right now is, are prevailing at 8%. So what's the incentive? Sorry, sorry. What I'm saying is that the cash, that the deals last year that were done um, had the highest cash components um, in over 10 years. Um, today, if you look at the homeowners, 66% of homeowners, the older cohorts don't have much of a mortgage at all. They're sitting on so much equity. So when they sell a larger house and take out their equity, cash in their equity, they're going to be buying a smaller house, likely for all cash. The risk here is um, the ability of the buyer, the younger buyer, to buy from the boomer. And that's why I say prices have got to come down to be commensurate with rates. And there, there's a mismatch here now. So when do you see this playing out? I What's think it starts timeline? to happen in 24. And when do you see the reversal of more supply on the market? Because I think it's 24, 24 into, late 24 into 25, and it's a multi-decade cycle because um, the peak of uh, existing home sales was around 7 million in 2005 at the peak of the housing um, uh, market. And today, I think it's, or next year, it's estimated, Goldman Sachs estimates that they think it's going to be 3.8. I think it's going to be higher than that for sure. Um, you've got... Uh, upwards of, let's say, 30, let's say it's 20. Let's, uh, has, it's a pig through the python. So um, I think that's going to be a multi-year um, multi stage. So the, what I call the silver tsunami is um, over the next five years, the last of the baby boomers turn 65. Mm -hmm. And that'll be, a, that'll be a, 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 another tailwind to this trend. All right, switching gears. I know you cover the banks. How are the bank's balance sheets now? Have they been doing the hard work to bolster their balance sheets as interest rates have gone up so that we won't see a repeat of the regional bank failures that we saw earlier this spring? Well, I think the regional bank failures um, were specific to interest um, rate mismanagement, asset li liability ma management, and um, another issue where, I mean, uh, Silicon Valley was hiding in plain sight. I, everything, I mean, there was no secret to it. Going into the fourth quarter, there was no secret to what was on their balance sheet. Um, and I think that what caused the demise of Silicon Valley was something that I call a faith-based um, run on the bank. So the US, any, any financial market is a faith-based system. And when investors lose faith, the, you know, the institution doesn't survive. So uh, bank balance sheets today are, and, and this is important too, because if you look at the biggest banks that used to be the biggest consumer lenders, all of those that have been under higher capital standards have basically uh, ceded their involvement in consumer lending to non-bank players. And so more of the activity has moved off ba bank balance sheets. Now the new 16 banks that are ring-fenced in terms of the over 100 billion in assets um, that are uh, uh, will have higher capital standards, you're going to take even more uh, money away from basic lending um, into non-regulated entities. And how that, so, so to, to say about bank balance sheets, they're more securities, um, uh, interest rate uh, 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 variable than credit variable. And in 2007, 2008, it was a credit variable thing. The economy is just totally different because the consumers uh, under levered. The banks are basically securities warehouses. Um, and what that means for the economy is, and I think this is an important point, um, if Basel III endgame goes through, and uh, as uh, the 16 banks are new banks are ring fences with uh, over 100 billion in, in assets, you're going to have more and more um, lending go outside of the um, the banking industry. Now, outside of the banking industry um, means that there's no Community Reinvestment Act that um, that uh, mandates that they have to reinvest in um, uh, uh, low-income areas or rural areas. So you're going to see. Uh, uh, 
capital come out of those areas, and that is um, that's truly upsetting um, because you want to enable as many people to be a part of the banking system as possible. And I think that's an unintended consequence that the regulators uh, really need to think about. So do you think the proposal as it stands right now that the Fed has put forth as pertains to Basel III is a bad idea? I think it's there's a lot that's wrong with it. And I think that for the first time in my um, professional career, the banks are going after um, uh, the regulators and saying, what are you thinking? There's no data that's supportive of any of this. It, you know, they took a long time to do this. It seems uh, absolutely ham-fisted. And the, if, if they're really focused on protecting the system and protecting the U.S. consumer, this is not the way to go about it. How worried are you? You mentioned that a lot of this is going to move outside of the regulatory realm into the unregulated realm. How worried are you that that's going to create complications like we saw all uh, leading up to 2008 with the shadow banking system? Um, not at all, because if it goes out into, um, so uh, the, the the banks were systemic. Um, I worked in the 90s and I covered uh, subprime finance and I remember I covered uh, uh, auto finance, subprime auto finance. I went on the Houston Loop and visited all the used car dealerships. It was very glamorous. 99% um, uh, of those companies went out of business mm -hmm. and nobody noticed. I noticed because I was in the industry. Um, uh, uh, similarly, uh, in 2005, 2006, when you know, non-regulated mortgage companies went out of business. It didn't, it didn't hurt anybody because it wasn't government guaranteed. So am I worried about it? I, you know, investors, buyer beware to the, for, for those stocks. Um, but I, what I worry about specifically is access to credit for, um, for uh, communities that uh, are really going to be deprived of it. I think that's what regulators should focus on. So given your outlook for credit, what is that going to mean for the economy going forward? Well, it means that people will pay more for credit. That's that's for certain. Um, and so it. Uh, but you're not it, forecasting a recession. You're seeing slower growth as a result. Um, I think growth has already started to slow. I think that uh, uh, various industries have gone through sort of a rolling industry um, uh, recession. The consumer has not. But the consumer is um, is doesn't have sort of the the post COVID. Let's go out and party, you know, and and buy as much stuff as as we can. They're tempering it, but they still have um, they still have money to spend. I would also point out that um, you know I go to the church of Walmart where what they say is what I believe, and um, they said in in August September if uh, if they see a very strong back to school season, um, they'll see a very strong ho uh, Halloween season and a very strong Christmas season, and that's what they saw. So I'm gonna. Um, I, I take a lot, put, put a lot of stock in that. All right. Well, the economy keeps on ticking. Uh, switching gears, I always like to shine a light on women in the economy. And you, as a woman, have worked on Wall Street for years. Uh, first in an investment bank, now you're back with your own advisory firm. How did you see Wall Street handling the gender pay gap? I mean, women are still making 83 cents on the dollar versus men. And these are women who have full-time jobs. How do you think we should go about closing the gender pay gap? I don't know that that gap is, is that a, a Wall Street gap or a national gap? National. Yeah, so um, I hit the jackpot when I started on Wall Street in that um, I, I landed in research it was the greatest job that I ever Im imagined. Um, I worked, you know, like Mike Bloomberg says, you, you're probably smarter than me, but I'll outwork you every day. Like, I worked because I knew I was a history major in, in college. What did I know about? I assumed everybody was smarter than me. I still do. Um, and so I just worked really hard. I never had an issue with pay. I could have, you know, it's, Wall Street is a meritocracy, and that's all I've ever known. Now, you cannot like the lifestyle, um, but uh, if you deliver and you work really hard and you have a product that sells, you'll get paid. Um, and I thought that that was very fair. So I got very other industries on. One thing that um, hap, you know, certainly happened um, when I started, I had a bunch of uh, women with me when I started, and they left the industry because they didn't like the lifestyle. I never left the industry because I loved, I loved the content, and I loved learning, and it was amazing. Um, and I also think that what you learn on, on Wall Street, working as intensely as you do, you can take to any other industry, and your work ethic and approach, it will differentiate you. So, so I, have, um, I have only a gratitude for Wall Street.
So what's your advice to younger women who are trying to climb the career ladder now? Um, I would say don't keep asking the questions about work-life balance. There's work and there's life. And choose, right? Mm -hmm. So in your, in your, when you start out, you have this unbelievable opportunity to learn and get everything, um, absorb everything, and it, it, you know, it, it, you can work. You're never going to learn as much at that point, and you're never going to have as much mentorship at that point in terms of um, 360 mentorship and have people um, work next to you that you can learn from. It's really extraordinary. So um, just appreciate the opportunity that you have and take it all in and work really hard and differentiate yourself and find something you love because what I do today does not feel like work. I still feel like I hit the jackpot. All right, well, Meredith Whitney, thank you so much for your insight. I so appreciate it. Great to have you here. Thank you so much. <laughs>
right. Well, Naomi Osaka is definitely one to watch in 2024. I, for one, want to pick up a tennis racket every time I watch her play, although I realize that's a mistake. Um, but a total story, but we have to switch gears to investing and getting you an action plan now. The investment community knows our guest very well, as do I. Anthony Scaramucci is the founder of alternative asset manager Skybridge. He also spent some time in the Trump White House. And he's always on the pulse of all things Washington, D.C. Joining him on stage will be Yahoo Finance senior reporter Anjali Kamlani. Welcome, Anthony and Anjali. Yes, like, like she said, uh, no introduction needed. Thanks, Tracy. <laughs> My pleasure. AKA the Mooch. AKA a unit of time? 11 days. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> don't say 10 because it'll really hurt my feelings. Like, why, why trip me out of 9.1% of my federal career? <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to have you, Anthony. Thank you. Good Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, of course, we all know Anthony from the investing world and his time in the White House. But I really got to start off with you on Trump, just because of yesterday's appearance in court. We've got the poll numbers out with him leading in some key swing states. Okay. And so I'm curious. You have previously said that you know, he, he could drop out of the race. He's gotten anxious. And it seems like right now he's doing the bombastic thing. So tell me what your thoughts Listen, are on that. I'm, I, I know him a long time. I, obviously, I was in the White House for 11 days, but I campaigned with him for <laughs> over a year. You know, I traveled with him. And I kept a diary. So I did 71 campaign stops in 2016. And so I can tell you a lot about that life experience and what he's like as a person. But you tell me, he looked terrible yesterday. And I got that wrong. Someone asked me in the morning, how did you think he was going to handle himself yesterday? I said, well, he's in court. He's subject to the perjury laws. He's probably going to be controlled. I compared it to the second debate in 2016. I don't know if you guys remember that, but we had the Access Hollywood tape hit on October 7th. Uh, that was a Friday. The following Wednesday, we flew to St. Louis for a debate. And he handled himself quite well in that second debate, if you remember it or not. But it, it put him back in the game. I thought he was going to be like that yesterday. He was not like that yesterday. He was slightly unhinged. Now, attacking the judge, attacking the correct. attorney general. Correct. Now, having said that, uh, despite my disagreements with the president, my differences with him on executive uh, management skills, how he handled the presidency, the insurrection, happy to talk about all of that, I think what's happening to him here in New York is unfair. And I think 76 percent of the Republicans who have been polled say that, that this feels politically contrived, and let me just make two quick points. Look at the law that he's being prosecuted on. This is typically a law that protects smaller individuals, smaller businesses from large corporations. And that's not the case here. He is a fairly large entity in his own right, the Trump Organization. And they're saying he exaggerated his financial statements. I'm going to ask this rhetorically, what other real estate developers in the city of New York have done that? None of them. And so he's going to be the only one that they're selectively prosecuting. There and has so if, been, go ahead. There, there have been a few, but this is a very high profile scalp for them. And so my point is, I think this is helping him weirdly in the polls because his base feels like this is, to quote him, a witch hunt. Now, the other two cases, I think he's got serious problems. If you study those cases and you look at what Jack Smith is saying about him, uh, there is a potential situation where it unfolds that he did something with those top secret documents. Uh, even if he showed them to his friends, that's obviously a felony. But what if he did something more nefarious than that? And again, I'm not accusing him of it. I'm just saying what if, because this is a big problem. You will lose your base. I don't think the MAGA crowd, as much as they love him and he thinks they, he can shoot people on Fifth Avenue, they'll stay with him. If you're selling secrets of the United States to our adversaries, I think most people are going to have a problem with that. I think, I think most independents will have a problem with that. But the problem is, you know, the president, President Biden, 
I mean, guys, come on. You, you, you just observationally, he's 80 years old, not 80 years young. And I, I think it's a mistake to stay in that game. And, and, and he's done a decent job. And you may disagree with me if you're a Republican. I'm more of a moderate. I think he's done a decent job. But to stay on and to return to the presidency at age 82, I think it's a mistake. And so we'll see. He'll likely do it because this is what people do when they have power. You know, We're not designed for power. Does everybody understand that? The minute you get the power, if you don't have a grounding wire in your personality, you get a little crazy. And, and these people hang on. I mean, Chuck Grassley, I think he's like George Washington's grandfather or something like that. I mean, <laughs> he's been there forever. I mean, he's not going anywhere. He wants to run for re-election at 96. The, the other woman from California, they, it was, felt terrible for her. Senator Feinstein, I mean, they're wheeling her in and out of places in the wheelchair. She dies in office. Come on, guys. We've got to be better than this. We have to call this out for what it is. So outside of the age concerns, what are some of the other things? Why do you, uh, what do you feel about Trump's run this time? Do you feel like he has something new to offer, maybe an economic plan or something like that that could so benefit he, he, him outside of just having that MAGA crowd? OK, remember, the, the, the number one thing you need to run for the presidency and win the presidency, the number one thing is name recognition. Number one thing. Remember, this is a popularity contest in the United States. It's not a hiring decision. Secondarily, we're focused on it because a lot of you are in finance and studying the markets, and so we're focused on the political situation. But the average American is coming home from work tired. Uh, if they vote, they show up, they look at the names, they say, oh, you know, I recognize that name, and they vote for that name. And so he is well ahead of his peer group for a lot of different reasons, and he has a, like him or dislike him, he has a galvanizing personality. Okay, people are like, yeah, I want that. I want that red meat. Um, I saw something on the campaign that I think is worth sharing with you, so I'll share it. We landed in Albuquerque, New Mexico in May of 2016, and I saw something on the Trump campaign that he did not see when I was working for Governor Bush. You want to know what that was? People, ladies and gentlemen, okay? We were getting five or 10 people in New Hampshire for Jeb. He had 9,000 people show up at the Albuquerque Civic Center, and he had 6,000 people in the overflow on the flat screens outside. When I walked in there, I said to a couple of my friends, I need to meet these people. Why are they here? And I took my security pin off, I walked in the crowd, and I asked one gentleman, and I'll give you the composite, I said, why are you here? He said, well, you know, I, I lost my job. You know, you think you're in New Mexico? Well, new New Mexico, that would be Mexico, because that's where my job went. And guys, we lost 65,000 factories in the United States since the signing of NAFTA. And here was a youngish person in his early 40s. He had a job. Uh, the factory moved. He was now working at Lowe's, and he was delivering pizza for Domino's at night. And he had two kids at home, and he was like, listen, I need help. We turned people, like my dad, who was a blue-collar guy, we turned aspirational working-class blue-collar families into economically desperational working-class blue-collar families in 35 years. We have to address that. They're going to vote for Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, AOC. They're going to vote for the people that they think represent them and are the avatar for their anger. Now, four years into the presidency, the president didn't do anything to solve their problems or come up with any policies that would have benefited them. But they like him because he is sticking a finger in the eye of Wall Street, the media, I happen to be both of those, so it really sucks <laughs> for me. Say, both thank you for both my eyes are getting gouged out. Okay. Uh, Hollywood, uh, what about the medical establishment? Okay, these people don't want to take the vaccine. They don't want to be a part of the system because they feel that the system has left them out. We have to re-engage those people. And so I think he is a poor candidate this time for the Republicans. Just look at the polling. But it doesn't matter what I think, he's going to win the nomination if things stay exactly the way they are right now. Something changes or he drops out, which I still think there's a possibility of that. He looks extremely tired, very frustrated. He's got 91 more indictments that he has to handle here. It's going to be very time consuming. Uh, the poll numbers, his internal poll numbers, suggest that if he gets 
convicted of something, it's going to hurt him with the independence. So he may. But he's the only person against Joe Biden right now where I think Joe Biden can beat him. And I know he's ahead of him in some of the swing states right now. But a year from now, you guys know, a year from now is a very long time in politics. Just think about October 7th, Access Hollywood tape exposure, November the 8th, one month and one day later, he goes on to win the presidency. Speaking of um, people in court, <clears throat> I have to go to the other person you know that recently was in court, and that's Sam Bankman Freed. Um, you tied together with his business um, in previous years, literally just before a lot of this came out. <clears throat> And I wonder. I'm literally like a, I've got like nine <laughs> lives. You, around you really right? know how to pick them, Anthony. <laughs> well, you see, the the thing about the media, no offense, but the media, you know the story. If it bleeds, it leads. And so I've had two reasonably good disasters, and that's going to be the focus. But I've also had a pretty good, interesting life. You know, I was going to say you're a famous. Done by reasonably <laughs> well in business, and I'm um, having probably the best year that we've had since we started Skybridge this year. Uh, after having a very difficult year last year. And so what's the message there? There's young people in this audience. You got to hang in there. No matter what is happening to you or what people are telling you, they have written my financial obituary six or seven times. Uh, they definitely wrote my political obituary. That one's probably going to stick, OK? I mean, <laughs> I was going to ask, are you I'm looking for only, a re repeat? No, no, the only okay. thing. I'm running for re-election in my marriage, OK? That's the only <laughs> thing I'm like, extremely focused on right now. But, but the truth be told, I've had some hard hits, but you don't go from where I was as a kid growing up, okay? Tracy can identify this because she grew up in a similar neighborhood like me. You don't go from there where nobody in the family's educated, everybody's got a blue collar job. You end up figuring out a way to go from Tufts to Harvard to Goldman, and then out of Goldman into two reasonably successful businesses. You don't get there without taking risk. Oh, by the way, when you take risk, you induct failure. You can't look at the game and say, you know what, I'm going to go 10 for 10 in this game. I'm going to get some things wrong. If you're a high profile person, you're going to get nailed and they're going to publish some really bad stuff about you. Last year, the New York Post had me in a boat sinking with a load of Bitcoins on them. I think Bitcoin was at 16,500. It said the SS Mooch. They made me look like Tyrion Lannister. Okay, you know, so I was like a little. It was horrific. It was total horrific character. My kids over the weekend made a T-shirt of this picture and presented it to me today, you know, when Bitcoin hit 35,000. My point is, you got to hang in there. If you're going to listen to the naysayers or you're going to really care what other people think about you, you're making a very big mistake. Focus on your dreams and how you're going to execute your dreams. Which we're, we're close to end of time, so I want to. Thank you. Thank you. We're close to end of time, so I do want to get your thoughts on where crypto goes from here. I I've heard some commentary that you know the Sam Bankman-Fried issue is just a very U.S.-centric issue, and crypto mm -hmm. has kind of moved on. Do you think oh. it, the industry is recovering from that? Okay, so I got to spend 30 seconds on him. More, okay? <laughs> yeah, go. Then we're running out of time, and then I'll answer that because you. So I liked Sam. I want to be very, very clear on that. Did Sam commit a fraud? Yes, he did. OK, I'm not in the Michael Lewis category or my very good friend Kevin O'Leary category. I saw what he did firsthand, and he committed a crime, and he committed fraud. And he's going to go to jail for a very long time. But I'm not going to revise history, ladies and gentlemen, and pretend I didn't like him, didn't know him, got to know his family. Mike Novogratz said last week on the eve of his conviction that he liked him as a person. He thought he was a nice guy. He was a nerdy introverted, nice human being. But he did something very malevolent, and I'm just going to say to you, the reason I talk about it is I don't want to be that guy that runs from things when you make a mistake. I want to be the guy that can talk to my clients or my family or the journalists or whoever very honestly about it. And here's the mistake that we made, and you should really think about this as an investor. There was some group think. We had venture capitalists and sovereign wealth funds and billionaires that lost money. I'm not going to mention their names. They get so mad at me when I mention their names because they're all hiding from it, trying to pretend it didn't happen to them. But it did happen to them. So there was some group think. The second thing that happened is there were four people that controlled the money at, at FTX, Alameda. 
And if you want to commit a financial crime, you tighten the circle. You have three or four people running it together. Go back to the Madoff crime. It was him, his brother, his assistant, and an accountant. Several billion dollar crime. They got it to go for 30 years. Sam was doing that. And I would encourage you when you're doing due diligence on a private company or hedge fund, what are the checks and balances in the system? How many keys got to get turned before money gets released somewhere? And you want to go with the people that are very formal about that. You know, 50 or so different people have to look at something at SkyBridge before something goes out the door. There's always going to be a person of conscience when you have a lot of, lot of people looking at it, not just three or four. You asked about crypto. We're running out of time. It's going up. You'd be very foolish not to own Bitcoin. I'll leave it at that. We've got three seconds left. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. We're out of time. It's a pleasure to have you. <laughs>
a woman who retired as one of the most decorated alpine ski racers of all time, Lindsey Vaughn, here in studio with us. And Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us here in New York, taking the time. We know that you've been going city to city. Uh, you even had time to send me your workout routine that you do in the mornings, and I tried it this morning as well. <laughs> I had to go. Uh, drenched in sweat before 5 a.m., <laughs> something that I, I never thought would happen, but off to a great start. Made it possible, and uh, I still haven't closed my move ring, so I still have a little work to do, apparently. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, first and foremost, as we really think about your history and this theme of invest, especially as so many athletes have to figure out how to stretch their winnings, stretch their dollars, whether they've got a massive contract from a team or not. When you're a skier, that's a different position that you're put in. How, how have you kind of engaged that? Because there's no huge contract being you know, presented or guaranteeing compensation, but you have to kind of be scrappy in a certain sense. You're preparing yeah. both financially and also to compete. Yeah, I mean, my dad taught me very young that you know if I wanted to be successful as a person, I had to be a lot more than a ski racer. Um, you know, historically, ski racers don't make any money. Um, we're not like football players or basketball players. We don't get massive multi-million-dollar guaranteed contracts. Um, most of my money was made off of um, victory schedules. So when I won, I got paid. If I didn't, I didn't get paid. Um, and then eventually, over time, I was able to you know. Uh, command higher guarantees, but still not in th even remotely the same ballpark as most professional athletes. Um, so I really try to develop a brand. You know, what can I offer outside of the slopes? You know, ski racing is usually only watched once every four years, the Winter Olympics. Um, so how can I stretch the time in between? And um, it took me, you know, my whole career, 20 years. Um, to build, you know, my career up to the point where I am in this position now, where, you know, I have built a solid nest egg, uh, egg and um, I've you know, been able to make really good investments, and I have equity in most of the companies that um, I've had sponsorships by, and again, the relationships that I've had in my ski racing career, like sponsored by Red Bull yeah. and Rolex, I've been with them for almost 20 years. Yeah. So those are always long-term relationships, and that's how I've been able to sustain you know, my brand is by building those really long-term relationships. I mean, what, what is the delta, though, for people who don't have a full grasp on it but between a, a high, high type of year and a low, low? And, and how do you go about that? Well, I mean, in years where I was injured, I didn't make anything. Yeah. Um, some of my contracts were kind enough, like Red Bull, for example, to support me, and sometimes it was half. Um, but you know, if you're not winning, you're not making money. So, you know, again, you have to be really smart with how you manage your money, um, how you're thinking strategically long term. I've had offers, you know, for a pretty sizable amount of money that it was a company that I wasn't really, you know, that comfortable with, and I always declined because you know, short term gain is long term failure. So I, I always think long term, is this, is this company going to hurt my brand? Is it going to help my brand? And is it going to help me make money 20 years from now? Or is it only going to be today? Yeah. In that evaluation and your partnerships, uh, there are a lot of student athletes nowadays that have to think about that same thought process uh, and, and the same considerations with the rise of NIL deal making. A lot of student athletes perhaps trying to understand how to choose the right partners or sponsors. What, what should they remember? And something that perhaps you've picked up along the way. Yeah, I mean, for NIL athletes, it's a really interesting position that they're in because you know, they're still in college, they're still learning, but they're also able to make money, which I think is an amazing opportunity. But I think it's also an opportunity to get distracted. Um, and you know, I think being a professional athlete is, is a challenge in that you want to be the best and you also want to hopefully have a business and make money. So as an athlete, you know, you, you're presented with a lot more challenges. So I don't envy them, but I think it's also an opportunity. You know, having them make money is a lot better than not, and most of those athletes won't go on to be professional. So it's how can you, you know, again, make those relationships that are meaningful that potentially have a, a longer uh, uh, runtime than just your college career, because you know that can transition you into, 
you know, something else much uh, bigger down the road. I think you mentioned something very key a moment ago in, in the companies where you identify an opportunity to hold equity as well. And some athletes have been known not to just partner with a company, but partner with a company if they have the opportunity to have equity. Shaq, Papa John's, you've got Steph Curry, Under Armour. Um, how do you prioritize endorsements versus product oversight? You've got a line with, with head as well, uh, or even equity ownership. Well, look, I, I always weigh, weigh the balance of you know cash and, and equity. Um, I think in my position, I always have to veer towards some cash, um, not all equity. I don't have the luxury of having you know, guaranteed multi-million dollar contracts, so I always have to make sure I'm covering myself <laughs> first, um, and then you know take the calculated risk and how much equity I take with a company. Um, but I do think that is you know, the best long-term strategy if you really believe in the company. And again, I, I don't um, get involved with companies that I don't truly really believe in um, and that I believe I can grow with. So if, I, if that's my mindset, then equity is a smart play. Um, I've been with Under Armour for 20 years, yeah. and I believe in Kevin Plank and what he's doing and what he's done. So um, it's hopefully it will make me more money down the road. <laughs> so far, so good. You know, it's so interesting, too, because Under Armour is one of those storied companies that has had leadership changeover because of the way that the business was run before and, and findings that have come out about it. As an athlete, how do you hold those leaders accountable over time when something like that comes to light? I mean, listen, it's a, it's a hard conversation, and I've known Kevin for a really long time. Um, I don't judge people, but, you know, they're... I'm, you know, and I sure he agrees that you know, business comes first, and I think he did what was right for the company. And um, I think at the end of the day, though, he's the reason why Under Armour is Under Armour. You know, he built it from nothing, and so I don't think you can discredit that. And I think having him back, you know, in a position where he can, you know, help inspire and innovate is important because that's what the company is based around. So I think you know he. It has been held accountable, and he's not the CEO. But um, you know, it is important for the company to have him as a voice. And athletes like yourself, like The Rock, like Steph Curry, also reasons why Under Armour is the company that it is too. Yeah, I mean, some good company to be around. <laughs> exactly. Not not gonna lie. So so let's talk about the athletic side because I'm sure there are a lot of people out here that perhaps Google prices at Telluride or at uh, Altera or at Vail. You know, any of these amazing locations and resorts, and, and even thinking about skiing, I mean, this is the one sport where I do firmly believe uh, in the quote from Bill Murray that you know every Olympic event should include one average person just for reference, uh, because. I think that should be a show. It we should, should be. definitely make that a show. Absolutely. I agree. I went deep into the online ski community, and, and one thing that continually came up was the, the seeming duopoly amount, amounting uh, at U.S. ski resorts between Vail and Altera was what continuously came up, but there's really more so the costs of some of their very expensive sports. I love golf. I know how expensive it is. There are a lot of people in the room that probably love skiing. They know how expensive it is. You know, has, has skiing in America gotten too expensive? I mean, listen, I don't have kids, but you know, to take a whole family skiing in the United States is it's a small fortune. And you know, I love skiing, and I grew up in Minnesota. It's not a big ski resort. It's 260 vertical feet. We got a rope tow and a <laughs> couple of chairlifts. Um, so season passes aren't super expensive. But you know, if you look at Europe, and you know, they've really made it accessible. But it's also a different culture. Mm. You know, you can go to the farm, your farm down the road, there's a tea bar and you can go up for 20 euros a day. Um, and they also have pretty big resorts where you're spending like, you know, 80 to 150 euros, but it's, it's a lot different experience. And, you know, they have people coming in guaranteed all year, every day, all day, every day. Um, so I don't know, you know, it's a different structure. Um, I don't, I think in the U.S. it's probably just going to continue to get more expensive because people are coming and, you know, it's profitable. And so if, if that's the model that works, it's probably going to stay, unfortunately. When you think about some of the athletes that compete on a world stage like you do, many of them are preparing for the summer games next year. And then, of course, uh, two years after, we're going to be watching for the winter games once again. That preparation, I mean, you've been, you've been an advocate for, for mental health as well. And a lot of world athletes, Olympic athletes, ha have been more vocal about that. We heard that from Simone Biles last year. Um, Naomi Osaka has also continued to add her voice, Bubba Watson even. 
You know, what's the biggest shift, even since you've retired, and you've, you've talked about this before, that you've had to account for, and how do you regenerate positive energy as well for yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've been talking about mental health um, since 2012, since before it was really, like, popular and um, you know Kevin Love's been talking about it as well Michael Phelps I think that the conversation has definitely shifted I think um, in a very positive way I think that one thing that COVID did was really expose everyone to what depression looks like and it's very very lucky if you didn't have some sort of depression um, during COVID and so I think the amount of empathy that one ha that people have for mental health is a lot greater, and so the conversation has become a lot bigger. And you know, what I hope is that you know more therapy and and tools to to help mental health are available to everyone. I think you're seeing a lot of these new startup companies coming out, and Sondermind and Calm, and all of these you know um, these different companies to help combat mental health, and it's it's very positive. And I think. Athletes, especially Olympic athletes, are have such an amazing platform to be able to speak about it because if you really think about it, how much pressure we're under. I mean, I spent my whole life preparing for a minute and 45 seconds. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, and I love the pressure and I love the stage, but it is, it is all consuming and it is, a, it is a heavy weight that's on your shoulders. Um, not just for my family, but for the country. So. Um, it, is, it is difficult to deal with at times, but you know, as athletes, we know that that's the game we're getting into. I think it's just important to have tools to be able to deal with those types of, of, of mental health situations so that you know, when you do have a problem, you have some, somewhere to go. Right, and your foundation is doing a lot of work with younger girls, women, who are getting into sports, and also continuing in championing that mission for starting the conversation around mental health early, destigmatizing it as well, but then also creating some firepower athletes and future leaders as well. Tell us about some of that work. I mean, one of our scholarship recipients went to the Beijing Olympics for snowboarding, so it was pretty um, incredible. But yeah, we've given over a million dollars in scholarships. We're really not sports-based. We're 50% sports, but 50% education. Um, we do empowerment camps, and I really focus on trying to give girls the tools to be able to be confident um, in life, not you know in sports, but you know just to be able to walk around and know that they have something special. Um, so I'm proud of what we're doing, and hopefully I'll be able to empower another young girl to be, you know, hopefully one someone in the room. Yeah, I mean this has been a massive year. Yeah, yeah, you can clap for that. 100%. <laughs> It's incredible the work that you're doing. This has also been a massive year in the women-powered economy, and we've seen that over the course of the summer, whether it's Taylor Swift or Beyonce or Barbie, but also the advancement of women's sport, too. Uh, women's World Cup, WNBA Finals hit a 20-year viewership high as well. What would, you, what would you like to see across sport, the executives that are at apparel and footwear companies and even the ambassadors of sport like yourself in order to continue this momentum? I think just continue to invest in women. Um, you know, I think there's such a disparagement in how much money they invest in, you know, having us be successful down the road. I think if you look at women's basketball, everyone says, well, it's not making money. You know, how is this a profitable endeavor for us? But if you do invest, it is paying off. I've talked to several owners, and they're really they're very optimistic about you know actually generating income, and the viewership ratings are going up, and there is a lot of momentum. So I think just keep investing in us, and it will pay off. I mean, if you think about how long it took the NBA to be profitable, it was a really long time. So um, I think we have a lot of momentum. I'm invested in two uh, women's soccer teams. Um, women's volleyball league. Um, so I just I'm I'm putting my money where my mouth is, and I hope everyone else does the same. When you look out and kind of think of your own investments a year, two years from now, what does success look like to you on that front? I'm long term. I'm looking ten years down the road. So I'm not cashing out of anything. If I do, I'm in big trouble, and I probably shouldn't be here. <laughs> um, no, I, I have very long term plays. I mean, especially when you're looking at investing in in leagues or teams. You know, that's a very long term play. So um, you can ask my kids yeah. if my investments were correct. <laughs> <laughs> that, that we should put on the T-shirts as well. <laughs> Lindsay, thank you so much for taking the thank time. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Lindsay Vaughn, everyone. Thank you.
Two-time Grand Slam champion Naomi Osaka is known for her moves on the tennis court, but the 26-year-old athlete is also a budding entrepreneur, a new mom, and a fierce mental health advocate. Osaka will make her triumphant return to the game next year. She joins us now along with her business partner, Stuart Duguid, who serves as the co-founder of talent agency Evolve and multimedia company Hana Kuma. Thank you both so much for being here. And Naomi, I want to start with you. You've been able to cultivate such a unique career path. We mentioned Hanakuma, Evolve. You also have a skincare line, Kinlo. So a lot of different businesses, but also core to who you are. So I'm curious what made you want to expand your influence beyond the tennis court and really embrace this role as businesswoman? I would say for me, I'm always really curious about new paths. And um, I don't know, I've always gotten really good opportunities through being a tennis player. And I, I've always felt like, it would be great to expand on that. And I know like your my career as an athlete isn't as long as I would want it to be. So it's good just to explore different avenues and also everything that we've created is things that I'm very, very um into and excited about. So it's all coming from an organic place. And you've been able to develop your career on your own terms. So in what ways are these businesses like Evolve, for example, an extension of who you are, especially as a woman and a minority? What makes these businesses different than what's out there already? I mean, I think for me, we've always been really lucky because I've always tried to come from a place of um, like whether it's my culture, like being half Japanese and half Haitian and growing up in America, I feel like you know, Hanakuma on that sense, it, it kind of sees things from my lens. So we've been really fortunate to um, have kind of guidance from Mav and LeBron and kind of see their input on things. And um, I think it's it's been really important in kind of navigating through that world. And with navigating through that world, Stuart, I want to bring you into this conversation. What's been your advice to Naomi on on how to navigate this business world and also balance it with tennis? Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, I think it's twofold. On one hand, I think athletes um, are much more interested in taking a um, portion of their deals in equity and starting businesses. And I think that's just come with athletes, um, you know, having more access to financial information and better advice. And I think that they've seen that, you know, if you're going to spend a year, two years um, giving yourself to a brand and helping it grow, you want to participate in some of the upside that's not just um, cash. Um, so we've seen a real uh, change in the guard. I've seen a lot more of that recently. Um, I would still say it feels a little bit um, top heavy. So I think the the top tier of athletes are really getting presented with great opportunities and really able to grow their brands. Um, but beneath that, it's kind of hard to break through. A lot of these deals tend to be with startups or younger companies, um, which can be very hit or miss, obviously, by nature of what they are. And for an athlete like Naomi, it's been a great space to enter. Absolutely. And so Naomi, you have been able to break through. What's been the biggest challenge for you as an entrepreneur? And, and in what ways is it similar or different from your life as an athlete? I would say the ways that it's different is because I've been playing tennis since I was a really young kid. So it's kind of like breathing air to me. There's nothing new about it. Well, I mean, there are some new things about it, but every time I step on the court, it's like, it's like a very relaxing feeling. Um, but I would say like with business and everything like that, I feel I feel like a child, like I'm learning new things every day and it's kind of very challenging. And I, I feel very lucky because I'm surrounded by people that know quite a lot and they're able to guide me and um, give me really good information. And that relates to the discourse surrounding mental health, which you've been very passionate about, especially mental health for athletes. Have you seen athletes have more resources when it comes to and mental health has there been more of a discourse as of late I think definitely there has been um I know a couple of years ago it didn't really exist at all so I'm really glad like tournaments are stepping up organizations are stepping up and it's kind of becoming a bit more of a comfortable topic to talk about because I know with athletes it's kind of sometimes you can see it as a weakness but um, I'm really glad that's becoming a bit more open Naomi, what have you learned since stepping away from tennis when it comes to really maintaining that mental agility, especially as you plan to return to the game next year? Uh, for me, I feel like I've learned to really be grateful. I think, you know, since I've been playing tennis since I was three, 
I never really like saw my life without tennis. So I've learned to be very grateful for the sport and just take things one day at a time because I'm the type of person that kind of, I guess, lets things like kind of stir up in my head and I don't really take time to breathe. So just being grateful for every day and um, taking it one step and one day at a time. And I want to bring the conversation back to entrepreneurship business. This is a question for both of you, but what do you need to sign on to a project to start a certain business, to commit to a sponsorship deal? What has to be there to get you excited? And Naomi, we can start with you. Um, Honestly, most of the times with like deals or brands, I've actually been the one to ask Stuart, like, hey, I really love this um, brand. Can we do something with them? So like for me, it really starts with some something organic. Like I really have to truly love them or want to do something with them because I feel like if you're like a person with like influence, you can't like go around pushing stuff that you actually don't believe in or you actually don't use. And Stuart, how about you, especially as an agent, when you're looking for these sponsorship deals for athletes or even for yourself, deciding what uh, businesses and projects to align your your own self with? I think it's a combination of um, products that Naomi either uses or believes in. And then I think it's important to her to, to have a direct line to the top, which I think if you're an athlete and you're responsible for endorsing um a brand and getting behind a brand i think uh you know it, it is important to be able to have those lines of communication naomi osaka Stuart duga thank you both so much for being here really appreciate you guys taking the time thank you that was our very own Ali Canal speaking to tennis champion Naomi Osaka, as well as her longtime agent, Stuart Dugan, um, in that interview for Yahoo Invest. You know, certainly a lot of interesting conversations coming out of our biggest event of the year. This is an interesting one because Naomi Osaka is really one of those athletes that has kind of created her own brand. Uh, yes, she's a tennis champion, but she has expanded since then. Uh, you know, Ali just mentioned there the Hanakuma Evolve, which is a talent agency she started with her longtime agent. It does sort of speak to kind of the, the, the broader trend that we have seen, especially among female athletes. You could argue it's sort of been established with male athletes too, but it is about taking your brand beyond the game and seeing some big opportunities um, in that. Yeah, it was interesting when she talked about, listen, she acknowledged that when we talk about professional athletes, often their careers are pretty short, right? She, she's aware of that, she knows that, which is part of the reason she's always looking for these new business opportunities. I thought it was interesting too, when they asked her what kind of businesses do you look for? She said it has to be something that she's passionate about, right? She, she has to love the brand, can't make that up, that can't be false. If you're gonna put that kind of time and effort to it, she has to feel that real love for the business. Yeah, we were uh, listening to Lindsey Vaughn earlier. She, of course, uh, Olympic champion, uh, skier. Uh, she would also kind of talked about this, and I bring her up sort of seeing this back-to-back -back conversation because women have really kind of come taken the spotlight in, in sports. We're talking about record-breaking viewership for the Women's World Cup, the WNBA. You know, there is more and more interest there. And so while we have seen sort of this personal branding from the likes of LeBron James and other, you know, male athletes before. Really, there there is a huge path being paved right now among female athletes. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too. Naomi Osaka has also also put a lot of time and effort as a mental health advocate. And I thought some of the, what she said there was interesting too. The changes she's seeing there in terms of mental athletes, she says have more access. She says now the changes she's seen in tournaments, the way she thinks there's been a shift there during her time tournaments. She says now really stepping up in new ways. It's now it's now a more comfortable topic. She says it's not not seen so much as, as a weakness anymore. Yeah, Simone Biles, gymnast, of course, another one that's been very uh, outspoken about that. So you could argue it is also kind of a generational shift, being able to publicly speak out about it and sort of bringing others along in that conversation as well. But going to be interesting to see how she does when she makes her comeback next yep. year. Of course, she's been taking a break. Uh, we're talking about Naomi Osaka um, since she had um, her baby. So we'll see how she does Can't wait to see Australian it. Open. Uh, we've got much more to come here at Yahoo Invest. On the other side of the break, our very own Brian Sazi sitting down with at and CEO John Stanky. That's coming up after this short break. Keep it right here. You've sounded cautious on the economy, and you have so in the past, but you've always been upbeat about America. Yeah. What are you so hopeful for about America looking out over the next decade? Yeah, no, I, listen, I just met with uh, Bloomberg, and I told them the same thing. I'm going to tell you, I am a full-throated, 
red-blooded, patriotic, free enterprise, proud American. This, this country is the most prosperous nation the world's ever seen. And of course we have flaws. There is not a nation the planet doesn't. But we are, and we're a moral nation. We didn't go to war in World War I and World War II to grab land or oil or money or gold or any of that. And then we did the Marshall Plan. I think you know, we need to do Marshall Plans again to help some of these other folks. That is the forefront of keeping the world safe for democracy. And so, and I'm proud of that. It's still the most prosperous nation the world's ever seen. You know, and when people like you look at China, we have 80,000 per person GDP. Theirs is 15. We've got wonderful neighbors. We've got the best military in the world. We've got the most innovation the world's ever seen. And that innovation, you know, it used to be like Boston and Silicon Valley. It's now here. It's Austin. It's Nashville. It's, and it's also going overseas, by the way. So, you know, I'm surprised now when I go to, you know, Berlin and Paris and London. They've got quite a bit of it, too, which I think is great. And so we have all that, you know, we sh and we should applaud that. And we should sing the praises of that. And we should help and we should grow. Acknowledging we didn't take care of the bomb 25% very well. Right. And, you know, and that's after decades of trying. So and I think there are things to fix that. Like I, I would double the earned income tax credit. I know Republicans and Democrats would do that. So I think there are things we can do that could strengthen the company, country, help the lower end, and get, get the country growing more. And one of the, and the other thing we've got to talk about more is growth is the way out of this fiscal mess we're in. Okay, growth will drive more tax receipts, more jobs, more capability, more production, more supply side. And we don't spend enough time talking about what fosters growth. Here they do.
Hey, welcome back. Everyone has coffee? Yeah. All right, I feel like these interviews just keep getting better and better. So at t recently surprised investors by dialing up some good news. Better than expected third quarter earnings and raised cash flow guidance, which is kind of unheard of in that industry. This, as the telecom giant, looks to capitalize on the shift to 5G, although we were asking about 6G earlier, I think. New iPhones while also navigating regulatory hurdles. Leading the charge at AT&T is none other than CEO John Stanky. And of course, he will be joining the stage with Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazi. Good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. Tracy, I still don't know what 6G is. No clue. Still trying to figure out 5G or AG or what G in general uh, means. But here's the guy that maybe can help us make sense of that. John, good to see you. The more G's, the better. The that's more G's, the better. There we go. You heard it right from the guy, the CEO of AT&T. Yeah, the more, that's good. Uh, so, John, we've, uh, we've been talking all day long about really the state of the economy from AT&T's perch. How do you see it? You know, it's, it's trucking along. Um, I think there's some things that all of us would like to see a little bit different or a little bit better, but by and large, the consumer is still out there. Um, in our case, they're still paying their bills. Um, they're still making decisions like buying new handsets and uh, trading up on plans. That's all good. I think from a CEO's perch, if I'm thinking about what's in store for 2024, uh, I get a little concerned about where interest rates are. I think that's probably going to be for, frankly, an extended period. It's good for my business. We're not going to be in the markets refinancing debt. We'll be paying off what we have through cash flows. We have mostly fixed uh, folks fixed debt, which is good. Uh, but I don't think it's good for the economy as a whole. Uh, I worry that we could have some geopolitical dynamics that could put some more stress on inflation moving forward. And it's fragile enough in the overall equation that you know one or two of those things break the wrong way. I think it could ultimately roll down to the consumer, roll down to jobs creation, and that, that wouldn't be good for any of us. I got a hot tip, John, and hang with me here as I lead into this. You, you got an offer to join the Federal Reserve out of yes. school. Is that correct? Well, it didn't take long for that one to get out. Yes, sir. <laughs> that was one of the offers I was- One of the offers. One of the offers I was considering. Why'd you turn it down? It was a hard decision. It was, you know, that or go do the choice I made. And uh, I always thought it'd be really fun to work in bank vaults and audit, you know, safe deposit boxes and things like <laughs> yeah, that. It just cool. seemed cool. <laughs> so. so now here was where I'm going. I mean, because you have that affinity for the Fed, whatever it might be, do you really worry about what the Federal Reserve has done in terms of interest rates and what it might mean to a big company like an AT&T? I think the Fed's done what they can do and what they should have done. Um, I think the reality is in this you know, economy and what's going on globally, it's only so much. I mean, and it's a relatively, I don't want to call it a blunt instrument, but it's only one tool. And it's a tool that um, you know, isn't all that precise in how it works. You just kind of have to step on interest rates and then ultimately allow it to trickle through and hit demand. And it takes some time and it doesn't do it ratably or equal, equally to all segments of the economy. So I think I understand what the Fed has done. I wouldn't advocate for anything else what they've done because inflation is far more insidious than dealing with the results of, of high rates right now. And um, our company's in a position of the flexibility to navigate through it. We have the access to the capital we need, largely through our own cash generation. Um, but um, look, it's, it's an unfortunate circumstance that we're here. What I'd like to see happen, it's really not the Fed's issue, is from a policy perspective, I'd like us to see a little more spending discipline in this country, and I'd like to see it globally, frankly, frankly because demands on the debt markets are crowding out private industry and private investment. And a lot of it's coming from public sector debt. So. I think that's the biggest thing we need to think about for the long term to make sure investment is right and growth is appropriate. You just channeled your inner Fed chairman. I guess, yeah. I'm not, <laughs> trust me, I'm not auditioning for the job. No, <laughs> no, no one anybody consider me uh, for it. Fair enough. <laughs> so you mentioned, you mentioned the deficit. Do you think there's a, a day of reckoning there? Or you know, we continue to have these, deficit, these questions about rising deficits and maybe it'll be a problem 30 years from now? Yeah, I think it's a problem today. I don't think it's a problem 30 years from now. What the day of reckoning you know, is constituted by, I, d I don't know that we can pick a day and say that things are going to trip. I think the day of reckoning is we'll end up being in a prolonged period of 
suboptimal growth. And um, you know, you could even go a step further and say, if you don't get your fiscal house in order, uh, does it challenge your ability to grow the economy fast enough to be able to do the things to uh, have influence outside the United States and make sure that the world stays a safe place and that economies can grow? And if economies grow, then there's more opportunity for people in the U.S. to support things like a reserve currency. Uh, that's how it's all interrelated. Um, but I don't think there's like one day. But look, what we need to do is we've got an issue to deal with in how our federal budget is set up, how our balance sheet is set up. You know, the fact that the federal balance sheet has, I don't know, average maturity sub six years. You know, when you think about that, why the government didn't take advantage of historically low interest rate environment, it's kind of a surprise to me. We certainly did. You know, we extended maturities out a long way. That's all got to be dealt with. It all has to be refinanced. And you better do it when you have some discipline in place. And um, I think. I think we're at that juncture where um, administrations are going to have to find a way to start to chip away at it. How they do it? Program. Cut spending? Because if they cut spending, doesn't that impact a company like AT&T? If they're, not, if they're out there spending on infrastructure, your company has benefited from infrastructure. Yeah, sure. I, um, look, I, I think one of the things you need to understand is where we, we benefit from infrastructure is for every dollar that the taxpayer is putting in, private industry, AT&T or others, are putting two or three in. Um, there's a multiplier effect on that that, generally speaking, given the economic development, comes back in proceeds to the federal government from growth, and that's been pretty well documented. It's a little different than um, you know, some other types of investment that tax dollars go into. But set that aside, I think what, what I think is best for AT&T and what's best for any business is uh, access to capital at, at reasonable rates uh, and a growing economy. And I'd take that over federal spending any day of the week. Bidenomics has been um, under scrutiny here uh, at this conference. Are the plans by this administration, have you found them helpful to your company? We're only two years, you know, a little over two years into the administration, so it's kind of hard to, we, you know, you see data points formulating. I've been pretty vocal that um, I think that there has been good policy put in place on the Infrastructure Act. It was a bipartisan effort. It was, it was hotly traded. You know, there was a lot of give and take in it, as it should be when it's bipartisan. Uh, what I worry about now is that it's out and it's into the execution stage. And we're seeing kind of administrative overlays being put on top of what was legislated. And those administrative overlays, whether deliberate or not, time will tell. Um, my guess is maybe they're intentional. I think are putting layers of requirements um, government direction on things that could be working more effectively in free markets with free market decisions than what might be optimal. And um, I think it's a little early to tell that, in fact, that's the case, but I see early warning signs around that, certainly in our industry. Whoever might win the next election, we have a long way uh, away from there. What is the one policy you wish any administration will put in place to make your life easier at at and well, I, I would, uh, we do have a long way to the next election. A year is a very long time in this day and age. Um, I, I think I'd probably point to two things. One is restructuring tax code to drive incentives and investment is, is pretty important. And as a large investor in this country, the largest, $24 billion a year, obviously have interest in that. And, and it directly correlates to I'm probably paying a billion dollars more in taxes right now, largely because of loss of that investment. And it comes right out of the capital program to do it. It's a billion that I choose not to invest because I've got to ultimately bring it back in in taxes. And then secondly, it's what we said earlier. The best thing for any business in the United States and the best thing for the dollar in general is that we have the right kind of fiscal discipline in our government. And so I'd love to see an administration start to get serious about the size of the federal deficit and uh, trying to work that into a, a reasonable place where we allow things like inflation to ultimately work our way out of the size of the debt. Um, you know, we kind of get to some reasonable place in entitlement reform that looks at the fact that people are going to live a lot longer. And as a result of that, we need to recalibrate expectations. I'm never going away, John, ever. I, I know. Ever. I'm, I'm one that probably be gone by the time I'm 80. <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> so. uh, your counterpart, um, 
Verizon CEO Hans Vesper, he, he sat in that seat, so I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, he sat in the seat, you know. That's all right. Okay, all right. Glad he warmed it up. Okay, fair enough. So <laughs> he's, was, he's, was he a two or a five uh, or a we're seven? Not going, we're not we're, 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 we're going to take all this offline. What I'm going to get at, though, uh, it's he's... important for me to know if I have to call him. <laughs> he was or, good. He did very well. It was okay. good to see Hans, nonetheless. Uh, he said the consumer was strong, uh, and I'm kind of getting those vibes from you. Uh, student loans are back in force. Inflation is still high. Do you find that surprising? I, again, I think it's a little early to tell on things like student loans working through. I think first payments are being made effectively you know, over the last 30 days. And it's not an inconsequential amount of money that ultimately has to, to move through the system. Um, I, I am surprised that we have demonstrated as much resiliency in the economy through this year as what we've actually achieved. And I don't see any reason that it's going to change between now and the end of the year. Um, I, I don't know what's happening geopolitically. I, I don't know that any of us can predict, but if something unfortunate in the Middle East continues and we see disruption of oil shipments or something like that and gasoline suddenly you know, jumps, you know, should we all be prepared for a moment like that? Do I have to think about those kinds of things occurring? I do. And uh, I think we're positioned to have the flexibility to deal with it when it happens, but you want to make sure that if it does occur, you do have that latitude. And um, I think we're in a we're in a very, very touchy space right now economically, and it can break either way. And I've been saying that for a year. Uh, it probably is even more that way given what's happened in the last couple of weeks uh, around the globe. I am an avid reader of your earnings call. Uh, transcripts. It's, it's just, fascinating. It is fascinating. I'm sure you love putting yeah, it. Together. I'm an avid reader of it too. Yes, uh, <laughs> and there's been a there's been a tone change. I would say the past two calls, to the point where I left the latest one and I thought there is a comeback happening at AT and T. Am I off the mark? You thought there was a comeback. It feels like a comeback. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think actually, if you're an avid reader and you've been reading consistently for you know three years now, mm -hmm. and you go track the data points on the results that have been delivered and as they've been delivered, I would tell you, I give the management team a lot of credit. We've basically done what we said we were going to do. Now, through the course of that three year period, there's been 90 day segments where a certain number isn't exactly what somebody wanted or would have expected and they looked at it and said, uh, that must be an early warning to a problem and you know they've kind of started the narrative around well, there's an six issue. Six months ago, what, was the first or second quarter with the delayed payments? And now you're saying consumers are making their payments on time again. Well, that was last year. Yeah. Um, this year, I think it was lower cash production coming out of the first quarter, seasonally, mm -hmm. as we expected, but still probably not optimal in terms of how that dynamic was communicated or managed, which is my responsibility. But we've delivered in aggregate what we said we were going to do. We are clearly rebuilding confidence, as you alluded it to, you called it a comeback. I'll say rebuilding confidence that what we say actually occurs. And I would tell you, yes, that is happening. And uh, you should have every reason to expect that what we've communicated out to the street will continue to deliver on. And I feel really good about where the business is. And I feel really good about our direction and strategy. We are in a very unique position. We are the largest operator of both fixed and wireless infrastructure in the United States. We have the largest fiber network. We have the most attractive customer list from the very largest enterprises in the business to top end consumers and everything in between. And um, I think for the positioning that's going on in communication and my view of the future is a converged communications environment. I, I don't think consumers or businesses wake up every morning saying, I aspire to have two or three relationships to get on the internet. I think people wake up and say, I just want to get on the internet. I want to get on the internet at home. I want to get on the internet in the car. I want to get on the internet in the plane. I think at and is in a very unique position to be the first to do that at scale for more Americans than any other company. And I think ultimately that'll make us successful in this space. What do you think is the biggest driver of your stock next year? Is it reining in costs further or is the top line? It's both. It's the combination of both. And it's something unique that we can do. One. We have good organic growth that isn't required from M&A, and this is something that the business, to your point of the comeback, has had to focus on. Maybe a legacy historically of inorganic activity. Getting the business back focused on what organic growth can occur through investment has been part of what this journey has been, and I'm, you are seeing that start to occur. You're seeing us being a share taker in, in the fiber and fixed broadband space 
Uh, you're seeing markets that were penetrating wireless that we were unable to penetrate before. Uh, that's the organic part, and we should be able to work out uh, amount of growth that looks very similar to GDP, but we're also repositioning and simplifying the business. Uh, we're backing away from products that served us well from decades. We're getting focused on which geographies we invest and build in. It, that will also help our expense side of this business. And we have a lot of hard work. It's pick and shovel work to get the cost structure in the right place. You've seen the progress over the last couple of years. We've been pretty deliberate in sharing that externally. You should expect more of that. The combination of both is what will drive cash accretion next year. And to your question, that's what our investors expect. That's what they want to see most. They want to see cash. They really don't care how it shows up. They want cash. Yep. <laughs> Lastly, um, again, your counterpart earlier in the morning said he grades, grades his day and he grades himself as a leader. I hear that you do hot yoga. Is that how you relax? I, I only do it when I have the luxury of a lot of time, because I, if I go do it, um, it's great. I love it. But you know, it's two hours of cool down, right? Wow. And if you're in Texas, it may even be longer if you're doing it <laughs> in the middle of the summer. So uh, it's not something I get to do weekdays uh, at work. But uh, I've never tried it. It's fast. It's it's a great way to you know you're my age, stay limber, uh -huh. keep yourself fit the same way, get your heart rate moving. Uh, fair, fair enough. Right, strong case for hot yoga. All right, AT and T, John Stanky, good to see you. It was yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thank you for joining Yahoo Finance Invest. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. You don't do hot yoga if you're in menopause either, by the way. I'm just <laughs> thought I was sweating more. It's like crazy. Um, anyway, moving on. To truly understand how finance in the world of business works, it's kind of never been more important. That's why I have a job. And to be sure, the powers that be are not making it easy for us to understand what's going on out there because they seem to talk amongst themselves, shoot first, and ask questions later. For example, what's the real reason why tech stocks don't normally do well when interest rates rise? My college kids keep asking me that question, and I still don't have an answer for them. Ah, oh, let's put these questions to two personal finance dynamos. Haley Sachs is the founder and CEO of Finance is Cool, and Tanya Rapley is the principal marketing strategist and senior consultant of her legacy media. Yahoo Finance anchor Rochelle Akufo will lead the conversation. Please join them. All right, so we're going to get right to it. Now, obviously, in this day and age, we have rising interest rates. People are really feeling, feeling pinched at the moment. So sometimes it can be hard to even think about investing at a time like this. According to the latest Lending Club report, 62% of US adults are living paycheck to paycheck. So Tonya, I want to start with you. Talk about the tools that MyFab Finance has seen the most success with in breaking that cycle of paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, I mean, I think that when we first started MyFed Finance, it was in 2013. And so people thought they were living paycheck to paycheck then. They're actually living paycheck to paycheck now with the environment that we're in. I would say that the biggest thing, the biggest tool actually has been community. And that is because community opens up space for conversation around what you're navigating. It allows you to ask questions. It allows you to ask for support in the areas you need support in. And I think that as well-meaning as financial services companies are, they don't necessarily understand some of the nuances that consumers are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So having that community, they can talk to someone else who's been in their situation. And we've created the Blue Ribbon Club with MyFab Finance. Um, we've created the Triumph Club as well for people to actually talk about what they're navigating. Because it's difficult. It's one of, those, one of those topics where if you are struggling with your finances, you're not usually going to share that. Perhaps you might not even be aware of the state of your finances. Yes. That, I think that's, what it, that's how it was in the beginning. I know when we started in 2013, that's mm -hmm. how it was. But I just find that this is a completely different landscape, and people are more willing to share what they're navigating with their personal finances. And there's less stigma around it. It's true, and certainly a lot more access to information as well. So Haley, I want to bring you in here because once you are able to cover your essentials, you're not living paycheck to paycheck, you do have a little extra money to put to work, people want to invest. How do you even come up with your initial portfolio strategy? I mean, I think first and foremost, you have to look at your risk tolerance and your time horizon. But then, you know, when you're first starting to invest, usually what happens is you have a lump sum 
haunting you in your checking account that you're like, okay, I should do something with this money. It's staring me in the face every time I open it. I should put it to work, I should put it to work, I should put it to work. So finally, you put that to work, great. But what happens the next month? What happens the month after that? Investing is not a one-time thing. So it's really important also to look at your budget and figure out every single month, how much can you put towards that future you so that you are consistently building towards building wealth. And is that something that you find that people sort of set it and forget it and they don't take advantage of things like compound interest in their in their portfolios? Oh, I mean, I've seen everything. I've seen people, you know, putting money into accounts and then not actually investing it, which happens a lot with retirement accounts just because there's not enough financial education out there. So people think, oh, if I contribute to my 401k, then I'm investing it. But then you retire and you have 350k instead of 3 million because it never actually was put to work. So, but yeah, I think definitely what's important is making sure that every single month you are putting money into your investing account and then actually investing it. <laughs> I mean, certainly can't you just leave your money sitting on the table, li literally yeah. there. So Tonya, when consumers are looking to financial service companies to support them, when it comes to adjusting for this very well telegraphed recession, that's you know, debatable yes. whether or not we're in one or not, and a higher interest rate environment, what are the, some of the things that consumers should expect from some of these companies to really support them to adapt here? I mean, I think they should expect, regardless of what the environment is, they should, they should expect quality service. And to Haley's point, I think that a lot of times, especially now in this environment, because we have TikTok, we have Instagram, a lot of people are getting their financial advice from the internet. I think that it's really important to understand how do we get this person from saying, all right, I have this money I'm putting into a savings account to actually taking action beyond that? Because they might feel that their job is done and it isn't done, and who are they going to be upset with, the financial services company. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what that looks like as far as ensuring that people are getting their intended outcome met, but making checking in with the consumers and asking them, hey, what was your intended outcome with this, with this action? And how can we make sure that that occurs? Because otherwise, they're going to say that the bank you know, didn't do right by them, or they're going to be angry at the bank when it really was actually a consumer error. And it's hard because even though technology has allowed us to access different tools, different platforms, some of the financial literacy and education that goes along with that, it allows you to take risks a lot faster and perhaps getting it a little bit over your head if that's, yeah. not, if that's not balanced out. Yes. And so then for Haley, people looking for some direction here. I mean, there's fear of missing out. People looking at the magnificent seven tech companies saying, should I jump in here? Have I missed the boat? It says AI in an earnings call. Is that what I should be heading for? What are the keys, though, to knowing when and how to rebalance your portfolio, depending on what's going on with the economy? Well, I mean, I think it's very easy with all of the fear mongering to think that maybe you should rebalance your portfolio every hour. <laughs> Go in there, make a tweak here and there. But, you know, if you do that, A, you're going to get screwed with capital gains taxes or, you know, the other capital losses. And, you know, you're also going to uh, miss out on compound interest. So really setting it and forgetting it and then rebalancing every year or so works for most people. But, you know, keep your, I say, don't pick your face if you have like any pimples or anything and don't pick, don't touch your face and don't <laughs> touch your portfolio. And that works for people, they like that, so. <laughs> it could be hard because, you know, a lot of people looking at their 401ks and they're like, what do I do? I'm seeing, you know, my investments yeah, are falling yeah. off. How do you stop people from panicking? Like when you're talking to your clients, Tony? I mean, historical data. Yes. I think that the numbers always tell the story. Historical yes. data, we've seen this before, write it out. Mm -hmm. Just let, you know, let them know. I actually know more about this than you do. Write it out. You know, just giving them that, that you have the confidence and that their strategy is going to work out for them. I mean, nothing is perfect, right, at the end of the day. But you came to me for information because you trusted me. Trust me along this process, but let's ride it out. And it's also the volatility is the fee that you pay for getting to grow wealth in the market. That's really what I say too. It's like, yeah, it's your tuition. That's, yeah, that's the price, exactly. Similar to the cost of doing business, it's, it's the cost of exactly. investing. Exactly. You're going to gonna learn one way that. or the other. Yeah. Now, something I want to talk about is something that's traditionally been fundamental to the American dream when it comes, comes to building wealth, and that's real estate. Mm. But I, I want to tap in on what we've seen with mortgage rates, especially as we look at, I know we have a graphic here on some of the changes that we've seen. Say, if you have a $400,000 house with a 30-year with a fixed mortgage, what you would have been paying back in 1999, $1,896 a month. You currently would be paying that in 2023 about $1,000 more. So Haley, when you're trying to figure out, do I need to buy a home? Is that the best way to build wealth? 
Is it that, or at this time, should it be a focus on the stock market? I think that there is a lot of leftover financial um, advice from boomers that needs to be rewritten for millennials and Gen Z because we're in a completely different world and economy. Um, and so whereas, as you were saying, for them, it was the American dream and it was a great investment to buy a house. Like there's a really funny meme online that's like me thinking about how if I had been, you know, if I had more money and had just been born in the 1960s, I could buy a house. <laughs> like it's like yeah. it's not even your fault. It's just when you were born. When you were born, literally. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that, uh, but I think a lot of people feel shame renting because that stigma still remains. And like there is still this idea that owning a home is the American dream. But I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, I'm a millionaire and I rent. Uh, and Lord knows if I buy a property, it's not going to be in New York City. So, you know, and like say it loud and proud. Like we don't need to buy real estate in order to grow wealth. Stock market has a much lower buy in. So, you know, there's a, and if you put your down payment money into the stock market, a lot of data shows that histor historically you're going to make more money, especially because when people calculate the gains that they make on real estate, they're never actually thinking about all the money that they put into their property. Girl, like, no, oh my God, the not. HVAC and the boiler, the landscape, the, this, the, that. It's like, oh my gosh, it's never, you have to be so liquid. So get your money in the stock market and get yourself a landlord. I, I love that question, though, because I think that, you know, we come from a generation. You know, actually, I just sent a link to my father about how expensive it is to buy a house now. And I decided to sell both of my houses because, like, I don't want to be a homeowner. There you go. Like, I was like, I don't want this right now. I want more predictable overhead. And I think that it's, it, it's extremely important for people who have been able to achieve a certain amount of success outside of homeownership to be vocal about that. Mm. And I think we are seeing a, a change in how we create wealth. Now, for some real estate, especially if you got in, uh, you know, in a timely manner, real estate is a vehicle for wealth creation. Totally. But the opportunity exists that there are so many other ways for you to create wealth. And it is up to content creators and strategists like Haley and myself to Excellent. inform our audience about that, um, as well as financial services companies to present them with other options as well. And I know you, you'd had a change of heart about that in terms of how you used to view owning real estate. Yes. Is there any, is there, are there any sort of financial circumstances where it does make sense to invest in real estate? Um, I think, it, I mean, you find a great deal, you know, yeah. if you find a great deal, if property is you know, passed down to you from a family member, but if, if you find a great deal, and we always say money is made on the front of a real estate deal, not in the back. So if you do find a great deal, then it makes sense, but that you have to understand what a great deal is mm -hmm. and after, who um, benefits from you accepting that great deal too. Yeah and what their ulterior motive is. So yeah, definitely, in some circumstances, it does make sense. But in quite a few circumstances, especially right now, it does not make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and Haley, we've been talking about some ways that people leave money on the table. We were talking earlier when it came to checking accounts, sort of just leaving it there, not really maximizing it. Another aspect of building wealth, though, and maximizing what you already have when it comes to tax strategies. Mm -hmm. So break down the strategies and the types of accounts that investors should be taking advantage of right now? I'm like pretty strict in my advice about what accounts you should open and the tax strategies that you should use just because I think that it's confusing, but it actually can be quite simple, which is like, great, max out every single tax advantage account that's available to you before you even think about opening a taxable brokerage account. That means your 401k, your 403b, your IRAs, Roth, individual, whatever it is, health savings account. No one knows that that's an investment account. It's a really good one. It has more tax advantages than IRAs and 401ks. So max out all of those before you put money into individual brokerage accounts because Uncle Sam is super greedy. And if you're going to find a loophole, like you better use it. You know what I mean? Um, and there's also ways that you can grow wealth for your children that's tax deductible too, which I know we were talking about earlier. So, so break that down because a lot of people perhaps don't understand not about just like putting your kids to work, but also making your money work for you on behalf of your children. Yes. So break down some of that, because a lot of people aren't familiar with these strategies. Oh, I am like low-key an expert on growing wealth for children, and I don't have any. So if you <laughs> want to hit me up later, I can give you some info. But, um, but I have a goddaughter, and that's what sort of spurred all of this. But I was like, wow, it's very simple. It does not take that much principle to make this uh, girl have like, eight million dollars tax-free by the time she's 65. Mm -hmm. We literally just have to 
make sure she has a paycheck, which was, she, they, her parents have her own, their own business, so that was easy, but you can also scoop ice cream, work as a caddy, whatever it is. You just need a paper trail that shows that you have your own business. And then there are Roth accounts that are for people under 18 called custodial Roths. And so if you max that out every year, you're gonna, by the time that they're 65, that's gonna be millions of tax-free dollars. Um, yeah, and there's also, you know, of course, 529s and other accounts that you can use as well. But what's amazing is that the compound interest, like if you set it and you forget it and you invest like $100 a month for your child starting when they're a baby, oh my gosh, they are going to have so much money by the time they're in their 60s. Mm -hmm. See, there you go. Get, get your family all on board. Get everyone to yeah. buy in on this. Um, Tony, I want to ask you, because at the end of the day, this is about better accessibility to building wealth and investing as well. So some of the trends that you're noticing in how some of these, these industry you know, specialists as yourself, and we're sort of seeing also more competition as you look at things like AI and robo advices and all these different things. Mm -hmm. What are some of the trends you think are going to be shaping the next evolution of this? Yeah, I mean, I think AI, of course, you can't talk about anything, you know, in technology without talking about AI, but I think that consumers still crave a hands-on yeah. or they still crave that intimate experience or they want to feel like more, more than just a customer. They want to feel like you are invested in their success and that you have tools specifically designed for them. So I think that consumers are going, actually going to want even more specificity, specificity um, when it comes to the products and how they engage with financial services companies. And I think that it is important for companies to understand, you know, there's a whole generation of content creators and a lot of people get their financial advice from content creators. I started mm -hmm. out in the organizing space and then moved into financial education as a financial education instructor and people began to trust me more than their banks because I was a person who had navigated what they had been through. So I think it is important to understand how do we leverage this at the decision-making process as a financial services company? Because these are, Haley and I are people who are working with these consumers on a daily basis. We understand what they're afraid of. We understand what they want from financial services companies. That's very important when you think of sort of the distance sometimes between your financial advisor who perhaps hasn't had the same sort of experiences oh, absolutely. and understands the struggle. So I appreciate you breaking that down. We only have about a minute left, but I, I just want to quickly get each of you with a quickly, a 20 second takeaway for people who are thinking of entrepreneurship as the path ahead to build wealth. One quick phrase that sums up what they should be thinking about if they're thinking about that as a path forward. Oh. Um, accountant. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> kind of uh, I would say exit strategy. Start with the exit oh, strategy yes. in mind. Yeah, that's very important. That's, with the extra strategy that's something that's very, very underestimated. A lot of people get in and haven't even figured out the route out. You just find yourself in it. Some people are intentional about entrepreneurship. Some people just, I found myself in it coming from nonprofit. And I was like, wow, I don't know what I'm doing. And I had to learn um, in the process. And it is not for the weak. It is not for the weak. You will work harder <laughs> for yourself than you will ever have to work for anyone else. So get ready. Yes. Life changing, but yep. extra strategy. Yes. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but please give it up for our amazing panel. They'd be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. All right, Yahoo Finance has uh, come to know our next guest, Jeffrey Gunlock, as a straight shooter in all things markets, economy, the Federal Reserve, and definitely politics. His bold predictions on stocks and bonds so often come true, making him a must-follow voice in financial markets. I've been following Jeffrey's work for decade, well over a decade uh, at this point. I think the investing world is very keen on what Jeffrey's big call for 2024 is looking like. Please join me in welcoming live from LA, Double Line founder and CEO, Jeffrey Gunlock. Jeffrey, it's, uh, it's always an honor to, to get some time with you. Thank you for agreeing to doing this conference. I know you're a very busy guy. And you know one vibe from inside this room here in New York City, Jeffrey, it's uh, a lot of folks, I think, are concerned about how far the Federal Reserve has come uh, on interest rates, uh, and also concerned on how long they may hold interest rates at current levels. How, how concerned are you about what the Federal Reserve has done? Well, I, I think they had to raise interest rates because of their uh, delay in beginning raising interest rates and how slow they began. If only they had followed my advice in March of last year uh, 
to raise interest rates, not 25 or 50 basis points when they lift it off, but 200, I think we'd be in a much better place. We probably wouldn't have to be up at this level. But, you know, the yield curve is inverted. It has been. It's now de-inverting. It's flat. We have the unemployment rate is above its 12-month moving average. We have consumer confidence in the present is deteriorating. Uh, and it's always sort of cautious about the future, but usually uh, they're optimistic about the, the present, but that's starting to fade. So we have a lot of, of, of major indicators that have been in recessionary signaling for a year plus. And so I think the uh, Fed has stopped raising interest rates. I don't think we're going to do it again. That's clearly the message from the bond market. The thing that worries me the most is the concept of higher for longer, and not so much for the economy, because once the economy uh, starts to noticeably weaken, and it seems like that's almost happening in real time, but once that happens, the Fed will cut interest rates. The bond market's forecast is has been at odds with the Fed's movements and the Fed's dot plots for much of this year. And now the uh, bond market's internal pricing suggests that the Fed will cut rates 50 basis points or maybe five eighths of 1% during 2024. I, I believe that's the one thing that is not going to happen. I think they'll either stay higher for longer, which is their rhetoric, and I hope they don't, or the economy will noticeably weaken and they'll do what they always do, and that is cut interest rates much more rapidly than they raise them. I like to use the phrase, the Fed uh, takes the, uh, the stairs up and the elevator down when it comes to interest rates. So the reason I'm worried about higher for longer is something that's already in evidence but isn't getting enough attention, and that is our fiscal situation. The interest expense on the debt is exploding in a vertical fashion because all of those bonds that were issued back at 25 to 50 basis point interest rates or maybe uh, only as high as 1%, they're all rolling off, and they're rolling off with great speed. So you would have to reinvest those bonds that were paying almost nothing at an interest rate of, well, if, if the Fed funds rate is five and three eighths percent. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a tremendous increase in interest expense of the debt. Already, the interest expense since the Fed started raising interest rates has gone up by hundreds of billions of dollars, almost half a trillion dollars per year. Yeah. And it's going literally vertical. And we have 30 percent of all of the bonds in the national debt, which is now $33.7 trillion. Not all of them are held by the public. Certainly the Fed owns about a little under eight trillion of them. But all of these bonds, about 17 trillion of them come due over the next 36 months. Yeah. So that means that if we keep interest rates higher for longer, these bonds that yield, you know, sort of one or 2% are gonna be uh, re you know, reissued at 300 basis points or more higher interest rates. And on 17 trillion, that's another 500 mm -hmm. you know, billion dollars. So we have a massive problem that's coming, look, that we're staring down because of the low interest rates being in place for so many uh, years, almost a decade, mm -hmm. and now the Fed being higher for longer. And this is happening also to small businesses who used to pay 4%, and now they're paying 9 or even 12%, which is obviously another problem if we're higher for longer because a lot of people can bridge a gap of temporary inflated interest expense, but not if we're gonna be higher for longer. Je so my, my belief is that we're going to be in recession. If we're not already in recession, mm -hmm. we'll probably be in a recession uh, by the second quarter of 2024. Jeffrey, I can tell you you're not alone. Uh, before you came on, before you came on our, our screen, uh, we just talked to AT&T CEO John Stanky, company with a lot of debt, but he voiced his concerns about the fiscal situation in, in this country. So when I hear you say in this room here uh, in New York City, here's you say there might be a recession next year. What is your best advice to investors? Where do they go? Well, you should be up in quality. You, you, right now, there's a strange level place to stand because I think in a Pavlovian sense, which you've already started to see happening over the past week, that when people are getting more inclined to believe that the economy is softening, they have a Pavlovian response uh, born of 40 years of experience of falling interest rates on a secular basis that you just automatically want to buy bonds. You want, you want to upgrade in credit quality, and that's working. I mean, bonds have done really well over the past week. Stocks have done well, too, because they needed bonds uh, to do well to, to uh, kind of uh, stop falling 
uh, which happened over the last the last few months. But I think what most investors are going to be surprised by is while interest rates will probably fall in an automatic reaction to weaker economic growth, I don't think they're going to stay low because of the supply problem. This fiscal problem is going to get much, much worse in a recession because, of course, there's going to be a strong response. It's going to be probably an inflationary response to uh, this, this, this fiscal situation. And so weirdly, I think we're going to have higher interest rates uh, uh, in the aftermath of the recessionary response. So we may actually have lower interest rates in the first half of 2024, which I think is likely it's already begun. But then interestingly, we might have to pivot to the re reality of a, I don't know, uh, debt to GDP, which is now running at six to 8%. Uh, which is already incredibly high, given the idea that people think the economy is pretty decent, we could easily see the uh, the deficit go to 9% of GDP. And it, it, when you start to look at the arithmetic of all of this, it's really uh, rather re rather troubling. I mean, like I said, 36% of the debt rolls off, uh, half of the debt rolls off for the next 36 months. But what if the deficit is 9% of GDP? And what if interest rates are at 6%? instead of at 3%, which is the average yield on the entire Treasury debt, stuff that's rolling off in the next 36 months probably has a lower interest rate than the 3% average across the curve. But you can just start to see what's going to happen to the interest expense. And in five years, let's just say we go higher for longer and we have a, a 6% uh, interest rate and we have 9% uh, of, of uh, d deficits per GDP, amazingly, by 2028, using the CBO's own assumptions, which are probably overly optimistic, 50% of all tax receipts would be going to debt payments, which of course is an impossibility given that 70% of the, of, the, of the budget is mandatory spending. You can't have half of it going to interest rate expense. So this is really, we're really getting to that moment that we've all been, uh, us old timers have been talking about for decades. We, it used to be when I was, maybe 10 years into this business, it used to be, well, we all know that we're on an unsustainable path, but it's really going to hit the fan in about 2050. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was 2040. And now the CBO themselves and the Social Security trustees themselves acknowledge that they're out of money in about seven years. Mm -hmm. And that's assuming no recession. So we're basically at the, that moment where it's not our grandchildren's problem. It's not our children's problem. It's our problem. Yeah. And uh, what investors have been trained to think they understand is a secularly falling interest rate regime. Because even if you've been around for 40 years like me, you've broadly experienced falling interest rates and oftentimes of some significance. And our entire economy is debt uh, is based on debt. And, you know, one thing that investors think they know is how relationships hold mm -hmm. when you're in recessions, interest rates fall, you know, when, uh, when you get, uh, companies get stressed, they're able to refinance because you're in a secular falling interest rate environment, but you're not anymore. Yeah. Interest rates are not falling anymore on a secular basis. They actually bottomed out between 2016 and around 2020. And uh, what will happen if you can't refinance and you would go into recession and interest rates aren't down, but they're up? I mean, these, these are things that people have to open their mind to. It's almost like a, a metaphor that is already happening in real time for the housing market. You know, people thought that interest rates on mortgages going from roughly 3% to roughly 8% would be crippling for the housing market. Well, it's been crippling for uh, existing home turnover because there's no supply because nobody that has a mortgage at 3% wants to sell their house and take out a mortgage at 8%. Yeah. Right. So the, the housing market has held up remarkably in terms of its pricing due to no supply. Mm -hmm. So the interest rates have gone up, but the prices have stayed up. In fact, the Case Schiller uh, 10 city index is actually at a new high. Yeah. So home affordability is at an all time low. So all of our lives have been geared to low interest rates. And now that we start to uh, understand that higher interest rates have a consequence, I think that this idea that we're going to avoid a recession mm -hmm. is uh, is really losing steam, uh, thanks to, in particular, the uh, employment data that came out mm -hmm. on Friday, which was definitely weak. But 34% yeah. of the jobs, even though there were only about 100,000 jobs officially created, 34% of them were government jobs. Yeah. So there were hardly any private sector jobs. And there's another survey that doesn't get as much play, which is called the household survey. And it actually has been showing job losses 
Mm. So there's this weird uh, behavior in the labor data that I'm starting to get suspicious about. Mm -hmm. And that is that we get these these jobs reports and they, they tend to look fairly good until the most recent one. But strangely, there's revisions uh, that go back a few months. So the revisions that came out on Friday actually show that the, the job market wasn't as strong. And I'm starting to get cynical about some of this government data. I'm wondering if they don't intentionally over-report the, the first uh, headline data number on the first Friday of a month for the preceding month so that we can get sound bites from politicians to say, hey, look, a great jobs report. Yeah. And then they sweep under the rug the fact that there's revisions in the past. So, Jeffrey. So I, I, I'm very I'm very sober about what's really going on in the economy. And I think a, a lot of Wall Street talking heads mm -hmm. are looking at backward looking data and not being honest intellectually about what's coming in the future. So I hear you uh, really putting forth a case, Jeffrey, of, of economy that could hit a recession next year it's slowing, deficits are out of control. So my question to you is, does that argue the need for a Republican in the White House, someone that may want to wrangle and get down government spending? Because I think a lot of folks in the Wall Street community will acknowledge that this current administration has spent a ton, infrastructure, EVs, you name it, that has contributed to the deficit. Well, I wish they'd actually spent things, spent the money on the things that you, you uh, just listed. I'm pretty sure a lot of the money gets wasted. I'm sure a lot of the money gets uh, disappears. I know a lot of the money we sent to Ukraine, for example, the, the Ukrainian officials say that they're, 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 the money is disappearing. They're, they're stealing it like there's no tomorrow. So we're not really investing the money. But a Republican coming into the office, how is that going to help? Mm. We run up these deficits under every administration. Uh, it's basically a disease that we we believe that we can run a $2 trillion budget deficit in perpetuity. Uh, and so I think, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's a Republican versus Democrat issue. I think it's a mathematician versus pseudo economist issue. And I'm a mathematician and that's what I've been trying to outline uh, so far in this conversation. But the politicians, they actually have put out ideas like modern monetary theory which you notice how that's disappeared. That was that was about five years ago. The idea was you could spend endless amounts of money and they had some bizarre theory that it wouldn't cause inflation. I think all those guys have gone back into their rat hole because <laughs> obviously got inflation when we spent four and a half trillion dollars, which supposedly under modern monetary theory wouldn't have had a problem. Mm -hmm. So what, what we need is a mathematician and, and, and not, not a supply side uh, economist uh, in, in power. And that will ultimately happen, but it, it, people have to really experience it, and you know a, a, a crack of doom sort of a moment that they, they realize uh, that this is not sustainable. I, I saw an article today about WeWork. Mm -hmm. You know, WeWork had a forty odd, forty seven billion dollar uh, market cap uh, five years ago, four years ago in 2019, and now that they have liabilities that exceed their assets, mm -hmm. so they're filing for bankruptcy and restructuring. You know, uh, there had to be a moment for, I mean, when you were at $47 billion market cap for a company that had been around for only 10 years or so, I'm sure that the the C-suite was popping the champagne corks and living large. I think they bought a Gulfstream. I don't know if it was- <laughs> I'm sure they did. But, <laughs> but you know, and, and there had to be a moment where the C-suite at WeWork had this crack of doom and said, oh my God, you know, we, we are bleeding money and there is no possible way that we can stay on this path. Yep. Well, I, I've, I've had my crack of doom moment about the U.S. finances, uh, and it really came in 2020, for sure, where I realized that we had crossed the Rubicon. Mm -hmm. But it's a Republican is not going to help. We need somebody that want. We need somebody that is going to. Okay, if the Republican runs on zero budget deficit, mm -hmm. then I'll take him seriously. <laughs> Fair. That's what we need. We but again, some to, again, some applause here in the room, Jeffrey. Getting some applause and. You know, look, we've got about two minutes left, and it's very rare, I think, for a lot of folks in the room and the millions around the world watching this in the stream to get direct access to you. And that's what it feels like just being in this room. My question to you, lastly, is on this. What is your message to those investors that essentially have concentrated their wealth in seven of the world's biggest stocks, otherwise known as the Magnificent Seven? What is your message to them? Are they playing with absolute fire? Of course. They will obviously be the worst performers in the upcoming recession. Whatever, what, whatever is the leading the charge going into the economic downturn invariably must lead the charge on the way down. 
So I would get out of them. I would go into an equal weighted basket as opposed to a market weighted basket. I would be moving away from U.S. Uh, banking system for sure, because the U.S. banking system, although people are uh, touting it from time to time, the banks are losing a ton of money. Uh, one large bank in America, I won't name their name, but they've got about a trillion dollar investment portfolio and it's kicking off 3%. But the borrowing cost at the Fed is over five and three eighths. So you want to stay away from all of these things that are debt based. So I would go for manufacturing as opposed to finance. I would go for equal weighted versus market weighted. And I would be going towards uh, uh, gradually uh, diversifying. It's, it's it's, it hasn't really been a good idea, but it's probably time to start diversifying on like a dollar cost averaging basis into non-U.S. Uh, equities. In particular, I would start thinking about emerging markets once the dollar index starts to fall, which has not happened yet, mm -hmm. but it's going to happen in the next recession. Well, it's uh, always uh, great to, it's a real treat to get some time with you, uh, Jeffrey Gunlock Docs. So I know you're a busy guy, I know you're out there doing some, uh, some stuff. It's great to get this uh, really interesting insight from you. Double Line founder and CEO Jeffrey Gunlock, thanks for uh, making time for us. Uh, as always, really appreciate it. All right, thanks. Good to be back up.
right, well, that was a great interview, but we're moving on. The fall is here. That means pumpkin spice lattes are everywhere. Oh, I think they're awful. Um, but that also means volatile markets are here, which I'm very much more accustomed to. It also means it's new fall book release season, too, which is really, really fun. So time to revisit some classics to prepare for what's going on in the year ahead, especially with the Federal Reserve on this path to keep interest rates here for a much longer time. So reach out, look it up, see what history says, or pick up a new book, which because there's plenty coming out, in particular, some really, really good ones. And we have the author here today. Mark Spitznagel is the author of two must-read books for investors, Safe Haven, Investing for Financial Storms, and The Dow of Capital. This is the coolest title. Mark is also the founder and chief investment officer of Universa Investments. So he's in these markets each day and day out for clients and has a lot to say and offer. Please join Mark and Miles Yudlin on stage now for this great interview. Mark, thanks so much for uh, coming up to New York. Great to have you back uh, in town for this. Um, I want to start uh, with the title of the book, um, Safe Haven, um, and of course, the role that that plays in kind of the work that you do at Universa and, and thinking about you know, the way that you approach markets and really defining to you what qualifies as safe haven, because I think it's different than the way many investors might, might think about it. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a broad subject. I mean, you know, obviously, safe havens are the things that we um, sort of invest in to sort of give us shelter from the storm um, protection um, when markets are doing bad things, but it's just so much more complicated than that. And what we, I think what I end up sort of showing in my book and what's so important to me as a, as a sort of a risk mitigator uh, as a profession is that you know, risk mitigation can end up really being the costliest thing we do as investors. Um, so that, that's kind of the point that I get into in talking about safe havens, um, uh, and it's sort of the counterintuitive aspect of it. We need to think about our safe havens as being cost effective, which is something that you don't often hear used in the, in the investing industry, simply because safe havens uh, or risk mitigation typically is not. In fact, it hardly ever is. Mm -hmm. It's usually something that costs us. It's usually the cure um, that's worse than the, the disease. And, and I'm curious also, you know, your, the role that writing plays in your process as an investor, because you can kind of go through, you know, the Warren Buffett's of the world, Howard Marks has written, um, and, and you know, the, the way that you maybe think through writing, frankly, um, as an investor, and how that's fit in in your experience, where you see that going forward, and you know, frankly, why write a book? You've got plenty of other things going on, and you know, why this maybe helps you and your firm you know, fine tune your process in a way. Yeah, I mean, writing to me is basically introspection. Um, you know, it gets you thinking about the basics, the whys. It gets you thinking about first principles from my standpoint. To, to me, what's the greatest first principle from, for what I do? It's why do people not only invest, what's their purpose or goal as an investor? What's their purpose or goal in risk mitigation? It seems like such an obvious thing, but actually we would not agree on what that is. Mm -hmm. People in, in, modern, in, in the finance industry would not agree with me on what that is. They would say it's something like some utility function or some or mean variance, you know, information ratios. I would say the purpose of investing is the same as the purpose of, of, of mitigating risk. That's to raise your wealth over time, raise the the the, uh, the uh, lower the range of that wealth in the future and raise it. Um, that's a that's a uh, that, that's a crazy thing to say actually. Um, but uh, uh, we, but so we but we face this problem as investors. I call it the dilemma of risk, the great dilemma of risk. If you Take too much risk, it costs you over time. You know, you can't you use leverage. If you take too little risk, it costs you over time. This is precisely the problem that pension funds are dealing with and their underfunding problem. Is it too much or too little? Sometime, somehow you've just got to thread that needle. But I think that if we think about this, and again, go back to your question, just sort of think about this on a first principles basis, maybe it's the case that um, um, taking risk and not enough risk, offense versus defense, maybe that's just two sides of the same coin. And I think that it is. I think that the reason we mitigate risk is actually to do a better job being offensive. I mean, there's a Sun Tzu quote that, uh, 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 that attack is really the secret um, to defense. And the defense is the planning of an attack, right? We could all agree in this room that over the next 20 years, I'm the most bearish guy you're ever going to meet, but we could all agree in this room that in the next 20 years, probably the S&P is the best thing to be in. If you can make one trade right now, it's probably the, by the S&P, right? Despite what's going on and how expensive it is today. 
So we know that mitigating risk really isn't about sort of where we think the world's going to be. What the, the, what the mitigating risk is about is what that path is going to look like and the opportunities that you have along that path, right? The dry powder that you create. Um, so we need to think about offense and defense in very much the same way. It's like, you know, I guess it allows you to be more long, some people would say. Is that maybe like, that, that as you're speaking, that kind of comes to me of this notion of, you know, the reason you would be um, taking insurance out, or the reason you would be short anything is you can make bigger bets on kind of that future you're talking about. Yeah, but it doesn't typically work that way. Mm -hmm. Typically, most risk mitigation as we know it, um, choose your canonical safe haven risk mitigation strategy, whether it's a hedge fund or bonds, or, they are really more of a dilution of risk. So what, that's really not allowing you to be more long. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite. That's, that's making you less long. So somehow along this path that I described over the next, let's say, 20 years, you've got to find ways of having that dry powder when the moments are the greatest. It sounds to me like it requires being some kind of tactical edge to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, none of us have that. So this, this is the problem. This is why most risk mitigation strategies are the cure that's worse than the disease. And most risk mitigation um, is, the mo is the costliest thing that people do. And so one of those you write about um, in the book is treasuries. Um, and you know, I'm just curious what you've made maybe of the last two months we've seen um, across the curve. And you know, is this essentially my reading of the book, watching the markets, is like, well, this is proving the point on sort of you know, where you get into trouble with this. But I'm just curious what you make of the move we've seen in treasuries and you know, what it is indicative to you, if, if anything, in this market moment. Uh, treasuries are not a safe haven. They're, uh, they're, they, I say this in the book, they're very much a hopeful haven. Um, so yeah, I mean, they have their place. I, I think that they're pretty cheap right now, frankly, so I don't want to trash them too much. But as a strategic- They won't take it personally. So. Yeah, as a strategic um, risk mitigation strategy, they're, 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 they're highly statistical. They're not, um, they're not mechanical. It's a difficult thing to rely on. But this is what the world relies on in this sort of canonical 60-40 uh, portfolio. Um, but you, we, you know, that, the major point that I make in this book is that not all risks are the same. And we need to always remember that. Treasuries, to answer your question about treasuries, they just don't address that very well. And in in, in much like any other normal risk, any hedge fund or whatever, they just don't address the, the, the nonlinear nature of risk. You know, I, as a business, we protect um, very large losses. That's what we're there for. It's not just because they're scary. It's not just because they're large. It's not just because uh, they make headlines. It's because they actually mathematically it's what matters. Mm -hmm. The little losses don't matter. It's the big ones. Because going back to what I said before, the purpose of risk mitigation uh, uh, should be to raise your terminal wealth at some point over time. And, it, and that, what that means, the equivalent of saying that, is that it should raise your rate of compounding over time. Not your mean variance, but your rate of compounding, your geometric average return. And it turns out the geometric average return is a very counterintuitive, funny thing that we just don't really understand. We think of our returns linearly. You know, you look at a Minus 10% or plus 6%. We look at that, it's a linear number, it's, it's, yeah. right? It's arithmetic, it goes into an arithmetic average. Whereas what really happens in, in compounding is the more you lose, the more that actually has an overweighted uh, bearing on your compounding. Um, you know, you can just think about this intuitively. You know, you lose 50% one period, you gotta, you, make, you gotta make back 100% the next. So there is an asymmetry there. And of course, that nonlinearity, it's not just two to one, it gets worse and worse and worse. The closer you get to losing 100, the closer you get to having to make infinity to make it back, right? So there's a huge nonlinearity there. And it turns out that the only way you can do what I was describing, which is to, to raise your rate of compounding in, uh, as a goal of risk mitigation, is to focus on these big losses, because th th those are the things that impact um, your, your, rate, your rate of compounding. Uh, going back to that 20 year horizon, you know, right now looking back 20 years, that CH compound growth rate was about nine and a half percent or so going back 20 years. But if instead we go back to the lows of 2020 and look at and recalculate that 20 year CAGR, it was down to 4%. You can see how destructive it happens to, that you, you know, in that 20 years, you were starting at the peak of the dot com era, and of course, you're looking at the low, but that was really costly. That 4% right there, that cost you about o over 4x in incremental terminal wealth. That's a really big deal. And I guess I think about it as a normal person who has the majority of his money in the S&P, any that's invested. Um, I feel like reading your work and even just talking here, like, Am I timing the market in a way that I hadn't thought about? Because you can do the math. All 20-year rolling periods are at, you know, positive on average over time. But that doesn't really account for the fact of, well, if I ended in 2008, that, that certainly wasn't there to save me. Or I was going to have some problems with that. Is that maybe something that you know, I am not thinking enough about or that it is a way that, perhaps even worse, professional investors are not thinking about when they're advising their clients on what it really means to have you know, a long time horizon. For sure. 
for sure. And that is because the whole industry, all of modern finance is based on this idea of modern portfolio theory, which is this, uh, it's, it's this basic idea that you, um, what, what we want to do is we want to maximize this ratio of, 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 of av arithmetic average returns, not compound average returns, but arithmetic average returns to risk or volatility or however you want to measure, they, they would use volatility. And that, if you're doing something good with that ratio, the idea is you're doing something productive. Whereas even if it's making you poorer, so I would argue that, that this is uh, sort of a, a superficial narrative. You know, it's said that diversification, and that really is what we're talking about here, bonds, whatever it is, we're talking about diversifying portfolios, what Peter Lynch calls diverse, appropriately diversifying portfolios. This has been called by great luminaries like Dalio, you know, the holy grail of investing. That is a lie. That is not the holy grail of investing. There is no holy grail of investing. That is actually the cure that is worse than the, than the disease. What, we, what modern portfolio theory does is it optimizes a problem, the wrong problem. It's optimizing a problem that's optimizable, which is this, which it has the machinery for this mean variance sharp ratio space, mm -hmm. even though it makes you poorer. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem, but, but the reason they do it is understandable. Like I said, it's the problem that's optimizable. When we start trying to um, think about compound growth rates, terminal wealth as a goal for our risk mitigation strategies, that's something that becomes really, really hard. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's almost impossible. In fact, I, I think I've shown in my book, mathematically, you have to focus on the big losses to even have a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. You really have to go about it. It looks very self-serving, but it's just, yep. it's just kind of a mathematical fact. It's not esoteric math. It's the math of the way compounding in the world works. You have to focus on the big losses. And, and maybe the way that you know, modern portfolio theory was uh, best exported um, to my, myself and you know, the other common folk in the room is 60-40 portfolios. And we've seen they've had a challenging couple of years. And, and I'm imagining from your seat, you see these numbers on these returns and, and the number of people who have been pushed into these. And you're saying, well, of course. I mean, this is exactly you know, why this is not the kind of um, balance or diversification, perhaps, that, that may be suggested when you get you know, a quick one-sheeter. Well, it's easy to pick on 60-40 now because bonds have just been destroyed, right? It's so easy. I'm not going to kick them all the way down. It's so obvious, right? But I would have said this three years ago, four or five years ago. Um, when diversification, diversification gets a win, which maybe, maybe they, you lose less in a crash, let's say, it's like it's a pyrrhic victory because you end up paying for it in the recovery. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a double edged sword, right? It, you'll get cut by it. Um, it is very much a pure, and we know these Pyrrhic victories. It's a cliche, you know? Governments are famous for it, right? In my book, I talk about the SS Eastland, where, you know, we know the, the, in 1912, the, the, the tragedy of the Titanic, without, all of a sudden the government gave regulations on needing a certain amount of lifeboats on board. And that's three years later, after the Titanic, the SS East, Eastland capsized in the Chicago River because of the weight of these lifeboats killing more paying passengers than died on the, on the Titanic. It's very much the right way to think about um, modern portfolio theory, diversifying strategies in, in general. They're, they're a pyrrhic victory. And, and on that, it, it makes me think of another analogy that, that comes up in the book, which is the Fed and forest firefighters and the way that those two um, organizations, let's see, uh, share a common approach to managing risk. And I'm curious how you see that in this current moment. We're always constantly talking about the Fed, et cetera, et cetera. But just where you see them in their journey and maybe where they have failed markets um, in the past, failing them today, if they are, um, and, and what the evolution of you know, mo monetary policy essentially in this market you know, might be to you. Yeah, monetary policy is the most destructive force in the, in, in, in the global economy. It's, it's taken a natural, uh, healthy, homeostatic process, which is crashes, bankruptcy, recession, and it's turned it into something um, that is, it is dangerous and destructive. This is what they've done in, in, in eliminating, trying to eliminate recessions and crashes. They've turned it into, you know, they've, turned, we, they've created this tinderbox, right? I mean, I go over it ad nauseum in my first book. Um, they've created a tinderbox. So it's the same kind of what I call risk mitigation irony. Right? They, they try to, I mean, govern, the government is there to try to ultimately try to mitigate these risks for us, and they end up just making it worse, right? But, and that's kind of, we, we get that, but shouldn't it be that, shouldn't it be in, in finance, shouldn't it be that risk mitigation um, costs less than the, than the very thing would cost that, you were, who's, who, who, that you're trying to mitigate against happening, right? Shouldn't it be that way? It's so obvious, but nobody would agree with me in, 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 this, in this industry, right? But um, no, we're, we're living in a tinderbox time bomb. And so, you know, as we kind of get to the end of our conversation, um, I'm curious, you know, what our, our audience 
perhaps can take away in terms of either actions they should take or just frameworks that they can now apply to their own strategies. Because you know, I don't, I don't think that I'm going to meet the minimum for investing with Universa. I don't know how many people will. Um, but there are certainly things that you guys are doing that can be applicable or ways, frameworks that people can, can approach their own investing. And you know, what was something that you might tell someone who no, I guess I just asked the question. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I get this all the time, and none of the things that I do, retail investors can look, can do. But it looks and it looks like I'm teasing, but that uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Be, be, and be, because uh, I, I think the mindset is so important, be discerning about risk mitigation, understanding that your risk mitigation strategy, your the way you allocate your capital in order to mitigate risk, is going to be the most costly thing that you do. Right? That in and of itself, I think, moves the needle. But I recognize that I also look, I'm here saying that risk mitigation ultimately is not cost effective and don't do it. And at the same time, we are in the biggest credit bubble in human history, in my opinion. And I don't think that that's, that's, that should be a controversial statement. That seems a little bit hypocritical, right? Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't mitigate risk for that. Um, but I don't think it is hypocritical because at the same time, um, I think that anybody who's trying to prepare for that um, I think that the market is set up right now such that they'll get, they'll get squeezed out of their position. I, I think there's probably um, a, another run or two left before we actually see that. I've been saying that for a year. So anybody who actually tries to mitigate risk, they're, they're not going to be able to keep it. That, that is the problem. I mean, ultimately, you need to think of risk mitigation not as protecting yourself from the markets, but I think more than anything else, protecting yourself from yourself from the really stupid things that we all do. And this applies to professionals, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, look how short people have been this year. Look how short people were last fall, how short they are right now, yep. right? Or underinvested. People, the markets make us do really stupid things. And we just need to set up our portfolio to protect us from that. All right, Mark Spitzagel, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for the time. My pleasure. <clears throat>
All right, so let's say on the theme of learning your craft. Morgan Housel certainly can help along those lines. He's a partner at the Collaborative Fund and the author of a new book, Same As Ever, A Guide to What Never Changes. Kind of love that. Morgan Housel is also the author of The Psychology of Money. Please welcome Morgan Housel and Miles Udlin to the stage. Hey, Miles. It's good to see everyone stuck around for us. Yeah. You know, it's big to get that honor. Um, we were talking before, uh, we have to tell everybody, uh, the last time that we saw each other, do you want to tell the story? The last time Miles and I saw each other was probably February, the, the last week of February 2020. So let's talk it a week before everything got crazy with COVID. Technically, and, it had started. And we sat down and we talked about how the economy was so strong that nobody could see anything standing in its path and that everyone who was calling for a recession had been so crazy. And both of us, I don't think we, neither of us make strict forecasts, but we all kind of, we both of us sat there and said, yeah, there's nothing standing in the economy's way right now. And we were days away from the worst calamity since the Great Depression. So he and I always tease each other about, let's not have breakfast again and talk about what the economy's gonna do. Fortunately, this is more of an afternoon tea kind of gathering. <laughs> um, my question though is, t technically, technically were we wrong? Well, I think what I've always believed is that people are actually very good at predicting what's going to happen in the economy, except for the surprises, which are all that matter. That's the nuance. It's like 99% of the time, the forecasting community is actually very good at predicting what inflation is going to be next quarter, what GDP is going to do next quarter. But once or twice a decade, you get a 9-11 or a COVID or a Pearl Harbor, and that's all that matters. Everything else that came before it makes no difference whatsoever relative to that. And I think it's, it's always been like that and always will be. There's a great quote from Carl Richards, a financial advisor. He says, risk is what is left over when you think you've thought of everything. So you can sit there and spend all day trying to predict what the next risk is going to be. And that's great. That's a good activity. And then when you're done with that activity, what's not on your list is what's actually going to be the biggest risk that's going to throw you for a loop. So that was like a perfect example of you and I having breakfast of that in play. So. You know, next week, obviously, uh, everyone be careful. <laughs> be careful. Um, <laughs> so you dedicate your book to the um, reasonable optimists. And I was thinking about the title of the book. I was thinking about that framing, so many stories in the book. And I guess, like, I guess I would accept that I am maybe one of these people. However, everyone, I see a couple of colleagues out there, everyone thinks that I'm super cynical. It's all, I'm just Mr. Doomsday. How do you kind of square that same as ever, it's going to be fine, but also everything might, might actually be bad. I think, it's, I think it frame it as, if you are a student of economic history, you should be an optimist on the future. People's ability to solve problems and become more productive is incredible. But if your definition of optimism is that everything's gonna be great, that's a problem, that's complacency. So I think reasonable optimism is, the short term is a constant chain of surprises and setbacks and bear markets and recessions. But if you can survive and endure those, which is, that's the big if, then for those who can stick around, the rewards are incredible. Like one other way to frame it is save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist. Save with the idea that what all of economic history is is just a constant chain of surprises and setbacks. But if you can endure that, then it's great. So that requires like optimism and pessimism to coexist in the same mind, which is very difficult for most people to, to do. For most people, it's, you're either a full-blown optimist or a full-blown pessimist. And both of those two get into trouble. You're the perma bear, or you're the leveraged maniac who goes over the cliff. And that tends to, that's a lot of people in markets. So I think getting those two to coexist, of like no clue what's going to happen over the next five or 10 years, but very confident it's going to be a constant chain of setbacks and surprises. But if you can endure that, it's going to be great. I was telling someone this morning, I've been investing since 2004, 20 years. During that period, there's not been a single time when you could not have very rationally, very intelligently, pointed out 20 things that were going wrong in the economy. At no point did you look at it and was the market obviously cheap. At every point, you could have looked at it and said, stocks are overpriced, margins are clouded, businesses are not growing fast enough, the national debt's doing X, Y, and Z, and you were completely right. And during that period, with dividends, the market's up fourfold. And I think that's actually like the pretty common path of history. 
at every given moment, there's not only something to talk about that's bad, there's something that's actually bad happening. And yet, if you can endure it, that's where the, reason, that's where the rewards come down. And, and you know, like we were kind of talking about this the other day, there's a reason why the market is expensive. Pro probably because it's good would be like the, maybe the answer. And I think in, in like the conversation around investor psychology, there's you know, wisdom of crowds is something that people talk about a lot. But it's framed as a negative, like don't follow the crowd. And I'm kind of wondering if maybe, maybe we have that wrong. Maybe the, there's, there is some wisdom in the crowd. And you know, sure, there's all these kinds of risks and problems with that. But ultimately, what you're talking about is we are aggregating good businesses. It does cost a fee. They do generally go up on over time because they're good businesses. Yeah, and you know, I think it was 2014 when Robert Schiller of Yale and another economist whose name I'm forgetting sh they share the Nobel Prize um, for both in their work in like efficient markets. And I, I'm, I'm very generalizing here, but Schiller's view was like markets are not efficient. We get booms and busts all the time. And the other economist whose name I'm forgetting was like, no, markets are very efficient. And people like thought that that was interesting that they share the Nobel Prize for different views. And Schiller gave an interview, and he was basically like, no, Schiller thinks markets are efficient 98% of the time. And some other economist believes that they're efficient 99.9% .9 of the time. It's actually like the distinction is not that different. So I think the crowd is right. I'm kind of in the Schiller camp. The crowd is right 98% of the time. And so if you are just a dyed-in-the-wool contrarian, you're going to be wrong a lot. Like The crowd is usually right. And but once in a while, it's disastrously wrong. Like one percent of the time, it's completely and utterly wrong, and very difficult to know without hindsight when that moment is. I always use the example like, if you said the U.S. housing market was in a bubble in 2004, you were right by any definition. You were right, and it kept going for another three and a half years. Same with in the, in the 1990s. The market was obviously in a tech bubble. In 1995. And in hindsight, though, we had barely even begun the surge up. Mark Andreessen tells this great story about he came to Silicon Valley in 1993. And his view at the time was it's over. He, he missed it. It's over. <laughs> he missed it in 93. In, high, like, in hindsight, it's ridiculous. But these things like, can go on much, much longer than people think, even if the crowd is right most of the time. Yeah, the uh, Greenspan irrational exuberance was, I think, December 94 or something, 96, 96 something, something like that, 96. when he first used irrational exuberance. And yeah. he was totally right. Yeah. Obviously, both of us were in markets at the time. <laughs> right. So like, it's one thing to point out that the market is unsustainable and completely a different thing to know when it's going to turn. Um, so we're kind of talking here about you know, investing and you know, investor psychology. I'm curious. For your view on, on personal finance, however you want to define that. Because I think, for me, something that I always struggle with kind of in my coverage and thinking about investing is the difference between investing and personal finance, and whether they overlap, whether they are the same thing, perhaps. Um, and just kind of how you've worked that out you know, through the years in your own writing and you know, your own kind of coverage, thinking, speaking, et cetera. I think the biggest difference is investing in finance is taught like a math-based field where there is a right answer. And there is, it's just like math. Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. That's the right answer. And personal finance is just not like that at all. Every household, you're not making decisions on a spreadsheet. You're making them at the dinner table, where all these other emotions and family goals and social prospects, like all these things blend together, different risk tolerances, different time horizons. Your spouse has this t risk tolerance. You have another risk tolerance. Everything blends together. And then so I think a lot of personal finance decisions that look wrong or look crazy are actually the right thing for that household to do, even if on the textbook, in the spreadsheet, it's not the right thing. So in psychology of money, I made the distinction of like reasonable versus rational. And we should not pretend that individuals are rational. Because they're not. No, nobody is. No, it's, this is not a spreadsheet endeavor. This is a dinner table endeavor, particularly for the average, ordinary mom and pop investor. This is not trying to please the capital asset pricing model. This is just like, like, like these are family goals. What's the most reasonable way to get there? And so I think that's, that, that's like a big distinction between academic finance and real world finance. Is one is taught like it's a, a hard science, like it's a cousin of physics. And the other is just more messy and emotional. And it's closer to psychology. And of course, everyone in America wants a right answer. Millennials, it's we're taught easy. it's either got to be right or wrong. It's easy. Like they, you want someone to say, like, what's the answer? Just tell me to do this. Like the spreadsheet pops out a number, and you do it. But in reality, it's just not how it is. Like just the difference in risk tolerances. I think most financial debates are not actually people disagreeing with each other. It's people with different risk tolerances talking over each other. And 
I can sit here and say, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. But nine times out of 10, we just have different risk tolerances, different time horizons. And it's right, something that would be like disastrous for me could be perfect for you and vice versa. And I think that goes overlooked a lot. Um, another asset that has come up in the last few years, certainly playing into psychology, would be crypto. Um, and I'm just curious, well, let's just start with how you've thought about it, um, kind of in your writing and in, in doing and in speaking and talking to folks about it, like where it has come from when I think we all became aware of it, call it 2011, 2012, um, and kind of where we are right now. Two things. One is, um, I mean, I, I wrote this about a year ago. I said, if, if you don't think that some of crypto is interesting and exciting, then you're not paying attention. And if you don't think that the vast majority of it is absurd, then you're not paying attention. But like most people fall into one of those camps. It's either completely and utterly absurd, or it's, the, it's literally the greatest technology in human history. But almost every new technology, even the ones like the car and the airplane, 99% of the companies in those industries went out of business. There were 2,000 car companies in the United States in the early 1900s, and it ended up at three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. So you can have the right technology that does change the future, and still 99% of what's going on is absurd and not gonna last. That's one part of it. The other part of it is every financial valuation is a number from today multiplied by a story about tomorrow. It's just a number like earnings per share this year multiplied by a story of what you think the future is going to be. That's every valuation. In a zero interest rate environment, the number from today doesn't matter. It's all just the story about tomorrow. And particularly in the social media world, like the stories can get ridiculous. And the number of people who will believe it can just be fanatical about it in a way that I think this is the, like crypto is the first bubble that we've seen in the social media age where the power of narratives and like how fast they could travel was just exponentially more than it was in the 90s. I can't fathom what the dot com, the dot com bubble would have been with, with Twitter. It would have been a completely different thing just because narratives can spread so much faster. And so the other thing is that if crypto were just a pure bubble that's gonna die, it would have died 10 years ago. So the people who believe in it believe in, believe in it so fanatically that I think it's hard to just dismiss it out of hand when there are enough people who believe in it so much that are, are that fanatical. The, other, the last thing I'd say is the book, Number Go Up, by, by yeah. Zeke, by Zeke Fo, is yeah. phenomenal. It does such a good do job detailing the emotions and the absurdity behind what happened over the last three years. Well, and do you feel like looking at that, you know, I think we can agree there was, a, there was that bubble period kind of coming out of COVID. Did we need an avatar for it? Like, was Sam Bankman fried essentially what we all needed to realize, like, oh, th oh this was like, to oh, this was like totally wild? I think every bubble has a, has a face. And maybe for dot coms, fairly or, or unfairly, it was Henry Blodgett and, and a couple other people. And uh, you know, for the housing bubble, it was the Wall Street bankers. Everyone has like a, a caricature, yeah. Yeah. and a lot of times it's deserved. Sometimes it's not. SBF is obviously like the the face of it, and we all know what happened in the last week. So, but I, I think every bubble has that face of like a cult of personality that ends up in hindsight being the opposite of what you thought it would be. Um, I, I want to talk about something we were chatting about uh, just before, which is you know basically like communication and where it has come from and where it is headed. If you look at like your own career, writing for Motley Fool, writing on the internet, that was a big thing. Then I feel like it was just getting big on Twitter and then everyone caught, you guys still have a newsletter, now you're writing books. Like what, where, what is now, I guess would be the question, and what is next as, as best as you can, can tell, you know, as a creator kind of in this space? I think what's, what's interesting about it is that despite as powerful as the internet is, the, the physical book market is by and large bigger. Like people still like holding a piece of paper more than they like reading a blog. The other thing that's completely shocked me is that the audio book market, getting a book through your ears, is, is bigger than the physical book market. And that's just exploded in the past five years with podcasts. Like people, there are way more people that want to learn through their ears than learn through their eyes. And anyone who starts a podcast will know that like, the, the audience size is enormous. Like, so many people don't have time to read, but they will gladly listen to a podcast or a book on their commute or while they're doing the dishes or while they're exercising. Like, way more time for that. So podcasts and audiobooks have massively expanded like, learning potential in a way that uh, like, I, I was oblivious to it and just, just a couple of years ago. So the different media, it's easy to think like, oh, if you put your content out there, then it's out there and people will find it. But the different mediums have vastly different audience sizes. The Bible was just early. <laughs> That's right. Like they really had that thing going. Um, I'm curious, as you kind of travel around talking to a lot of different investors, um, 
how has the tone of like where you are, I mean, because you're often speaking, maybe you're getting some questions, but just what are people interested in now? How has that changed over the last few years? Certainly, you're getting back out on the road more now than you have been over the last few years, but what are the things that people are interested in, people are anxious about? What are the ways maybe if you're a therapist of sorts to a lot of financial advisors, um, how are you calming them down these days? There's that Louis C.K. skit like a decade ago where he said, everything's amazing and nobody's happy. And I think economically, that could be like the phrase today. And you could look at like unemployment rate less than 4%. Market's doing pretty well. You can earn 5% on your cash. And, and yet, like consumer, like consumer confidence and economic growth was like very tightly correlated forever. And it totally split apart in the last year or two. And you could say like there's, there's really three things that drive consumer confidence. Inflation, not even inflation, gas prices, the stock market, and politics are the three things that are like very correlated with consumer confidence. And maybe it's just because for the first time since the 80s, we're experiencing significant inflation. And it's just a scarring event for a lot of people. And even if it's come down, someone made this point this morning that particularly for just the ordinary non-financial professional, you don't want inflation to come down. You want prices to come down. So even though inflation went from 10% to 4% or whatever, gas prices are higher than they were in 2019. And until they're lower than they were in 2019, people are going to feel bad about it. But the odds that they're going to, like, the odds that we're going to have, people are like praying for deflation at this point, which is a danger in itself. So I think that's a lot of it, is that even if there's a handful of variables, or even a lot of variables that are great, people really cling to the one or two that have like emotionally scarred them. There's also, someone made this point this morning that like, a financial professional on Twitter should not tell 90% of the country, like, you should feel good right now. If they don't, then that's what it is. And like, they, they, like, it's a real thing, like how pessimistic people are in the economy right now. Wisdom in the crowd, same as ever. Morgan Housel, thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>
Welcome to Yahoo Finance Invest. I'm Josh Lipton, and we are here now with Klarna's CEO, Sebastian Shimatkovsky. Sebastian, thank you for joining us so much. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. And and Sebastian, so Klarna, of course, a key long-term player in the growing buy now, pay later space. I want to talk, Sebastian, just first about the environment we, we find ourselves in right now, a time of great uncertainty, of course, for the economy, consumer rates, geopolitical conflict. Given that backdrop, Sebastian, just walk me through how is Klarna's business doing right now? No, so it's actually very, very strong. And I think that this is one of the things where, you know, People may have not entirely understood buy now pay later. I mean, a lot of things get labeled buy now pay later nowadays, but our core model has been to do something very different to what the credit cards do, right? So the credit cards encourage you to put all of your uh, spending on on credit. We encourage you to do debit or credit. Actually, thirty five percent of our transactions are debit, and then we offer you a fixed installment and we charge zero interest. And what this means, it attracts consumers that are very thoughtful about their spending. People are tired of credit cards. They know that they're there to maximize your balance, to charge you as high interest rates as possible. Um, and the more cautious, more thoughtful consumers are choosing Klarna because they're seeing it as a better option. You can see that in our losses. They're 30% below credit card industry standards. So these consumers are very thoughtful. Uh, they want to use this kind of alternative product. And, and they're tired of the old credit cards. And since you also see actually that they are in general doing better during more uncertain times like we're going through right now. And that's what, what we can see in our number. Our losses are down. We are uh, returning to profitability uh, uh, this, this quarter. And so it actually looks fairly well from that perspective. But at the same point of time, we can definitely see that consumer spending in general is weaker. And we see that among our merchants and our retailers that you know compared to a year ago, there's definitely less spending online in particular, but also in general. So that's interesting because you do have a really interesting insight into the consumer, Sebastian. So you're saying your take on the consumer here, you do see some some caution creeping in? Yes. I think what has happened, right, is that we're coming from we're coming from COVID. We're coming from in the US distributed checks, people, you know, money coming from from the sky basically, right? And and then we had inflation. And, but we also had a little bit of that additional spending that happened when people were, you know, coming out of COVID, coming out of those restrictions. And now people's savings have, you know, come down and their credit card debt has come up again. We're over a trillion dollars of credit card debt now in the U.S. again. We're seeing, you know, an average $5,000 in, in credit card debt. So now people are starting to see the pr price differences. They're starting to cut back on some uh, discretional spending. And uh, yeah, and it is definitely a difference. And it always takes a little bit longer than you expect these changes in the market, right? And let me, talk, uh, let me ask you also, Sebastian, about this, this rising rate environment we find ourselves in, because that can pose a, a challenge for the buy now, pay later segment. You know, one, pressures consumers, but two, you know, raising funding costs, pressures margins. How are you mm -hmm. navigating that challenge? Well, that's another thing that surprised you with the buy now, pay later. I mean, again, uh, there are other buy now, pay later people out there who are actually borrowing, you know, big amounts, big ticket items, and mattresses, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. And that's different. In our case, our average balance is only $100 to $150. And people pay it down. So we turn around our balance sheet 12 times a year. So actually, the cost of funding that balance sheet per loan is very, very small part of the cost. And this means that even in this in interest uh, environment, actually, our costs have risen very little. Uh, and at the same point of time, obviously, our offering has become more attractive because the credit cards have taken the opportunity to increase their rates. And so offering 0% interest-free credit right now is even more attractive than it was a year ago. So you, you, you see it's also a surprising part of the robustness of this model. And let me ask you about the, the regulatory landscape as well, Sebastian. You know, obviously, you're where regulators have taken more of an interest in the BNPL, the buy now, pay later market. How much of a risk is that for Klarna? And what do you see on that front coming up in 2024? Yeah, so we have gone through the same shifts in, in Europe. Uh, we've seen this in the UK. We've seen it in uh, in Brussels, in Europe, and so forth. I think a lot of this is obviously when there is a new form of credit coming, uh, Yeah, I think it's thoughtful and it makes sense of regulators to be a little bit skeptic. We've seen all types of uh, you know credit forms that have come that hasn't always been in the benefit of the consumers. So a lot of our work is just educating and showing uh, the regulators that this is actually an advantageous alternative to credit cards. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? Because many years ago, when you used to swipe your card, you would press one for debit, press two for credit. 
And then all the banks removed that. Why did they do that? Because you had a smaller balance at the end of the month if you also put some purchases on debit. And, and we're just trying to get back to those days. Um, and it turns that consumers, when they get those options, are actually spending more uh, safely and more thoughtfully. And so when we get the chance to actually sit down and show those numbers and have those discussions, then regulators, uh, you know, very quickly see this in a very different light. But obviously, if you're against credit altogether, if you don't believe people should ever use credit for any purchases, I'm not going to win a fight with you, right? So you have to recognize that still. Uh, but we think it's a better form of credit than the one that dominates the industry right now, which is the credit cards. I always recommend people to, sorry if I'm making a you know a competitive a potential suggestion here, but do watch Netflix credit cards explain. And I think you'll get a good summary of all the bad tactics that cons uh, credit card companies have applied uh, the last decades. All right, I'll plug there for Netflix as well. Let, let's talk, yeah. um, Sebastian, about the history of Klarna, because you know, 2022, it was a tough year for Klarna, but as it was for many companies, inflation, rates, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I know you guys had to lay off people. You posted a $1 billion loss, reportedly cut the valuation. As an executive, as a CEO, Sebastian, what did you learn from that experience and what adjustments did you make to the business because of it? Well, I think first and foremost, right, I mean, the, the odd thing now is I look back at it to your point, the fact that we were investing so much that we were posting a loss of a billion dollars a year, right? It may sound a lot and it is a lot, but you also have to put that to some perspective as valuations were that high, Bona was valued at $50 billion back then. This means that this is about a 2% dilution on an annual basis. And this is still, and I'm still very committed to this idea, Klarna is challenging the retail bank industry. This is a trillion dollar market opportunity. So there is very much real potential that this business could be worth hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillion, uh, if we accomplish what we've set out to do. And so I think, uh, but obviously investor sentiment shifted. Um, people weren't leaning as much into the future and wouldn't be, you know, wasn't willing to give you that credit for that future case. And they wanted to see profitability now. And that unfortunately then forced us to have to take very difficult decisions. We had to make a change, but I am quite proud of the fact that as an organization, everyone came together. Um, we turned around what was, you know, our worst month a negative EBITDA of $150 million. And then 12 months later, we posted our very positive EBITDA since 2019. So I still think that's a pretty impressive feat by the team here and all the people that contributed to this, who did all that work. And, uh, and obviously now we feel also encouraged that we, when we realized that things were changing, actually, you know, um, took that, realized it was tough, we had to do it, but we did it. And now we're benefiting from there because other companies who didn't act and, and they are in bigger trouble now. And, and Sebastian, I want to ask you some, at some headlines as well, get your response that Klarna could face a strike at its Swedish headquarters if a collective bargaining agreement isn't reached with these two employee unions. Just walk me through that new Sebastian and what could it potentially mean for the business? Right, so um, this is a, a, a Swedish uh, thing where in Sweden, uh, most companies or a lot of companies have what we call a collective bargaining agreement. It's actually, if you would take, you know, top 100, uh, there are only a few, us and Spotify, who do not, um, uh, are not participating in that. Uh, it's not from a legal point of perspective, you know, uh, the Swedish law doesn't mandate you to sign this, but it's uh, it's uh, expected. Uh, and uh, But I think from our perspective, what we've been trying to do is create something even better. I mean, we pay our employees above what a collective bargaining agreement would give. We have better benefits, better, uh, we offer them um, better, um, all, all kind of employee benefits, so to speak. And, um, and in addition to this, um, you know, we have created a very attractive environment where people want to work here. Uh, people who work at Klana are sought after in all of Sweden, all of Europe, and internationally nowadays as well. Um, so we will see how this uh, plays out, but we're hopefully that we will be able to come to a good resolution. Now let's talk about competition as well, uh, Sebastian. There's a lot of it, as you know, including a firm. Much is often made of the Amazon Affirm partnership. I'm interested, you know, are you all talking to big tech companies, big big retailers about any kind of similar arrangement? Uh, for sure, all the time. I mean, if you look you know, uh, at the U.S. market, over of the hundred top 100 U.S. retailers, more than half of them are working with Klarna today, and many more than are working with a firm, right? So I think... A firm has been wise to strike a partnership with Amazon, obviously, with Shopify. But I think if you look at the rest of the market, Klarna has been extremely successful. And again, a firm is slightly of a different business. It's more of a fine, traditional finance lender. 
uh, in the sense that there's more high ticket, uh, big ticket value. Klarna is more focused on kind of an average $100, $150. So actually, from the outside, we've been kind of put in a box and said, this is the same thing. But if you actually look at the businesses much more closely, you realize that we are very, very different. And looking ahead now, uh, Sebastian, any interest in, in bringing Klarna public? And do you think that could be a, a 2024 event? Um, I don't think it's uh, unthinkable. Um, I mean, to me, I've been very consistent when I've been getting these questions a few times. And that has been that I believe that like, you know, uh, in order for Klarna to be ready, there was always a few things. I think there's a fantastic opportunity to build a global retail banking in the, uh, company. Um, it hasn't really existed. Yes, we do have some international brands in, in retail banking, but they're mostly just a conglomerate of local systems and local solutions under the same brand. So there's this fantastic opportunity to do that nowadays. And I think they're going to be the first banks. They're going to have 500 million consumers or a, a billion consumers. And we want to be that company, but we always recognize that in order to do so, we need to be successful in the U S uh, and successful in the U S obviously means a few things. It means have significant presence, which we now do with over 30 million users to be profitable and show that the business model work, which we're now on, we have three consecutive quarters of uh, gross profit in the US. And, and, and so those have been you know, critical elements. And then the third thing is just more about market conditions. We are a bank, we're fully regulated. We already you know, have to report on a quarterly basis. We have actually publicly traded uh, debt instruments and so forth. So it's not as big of a step. Uh, and I think now we're better positioned than ever to do it. So I wouldn't find it unlikely, but there's no, commitment to a date or anything like that at this point in time. So an IPO is a possibility. I would think, Sebastian, what about selling the business? If, you know, Apple or a big bank came calling, would you take that phone call? <laughs> Look, I think it's my duty to my, my shareholders to always listen, right? But I think with, with that said, I, again, I feel that we're only at the beginning of this journey. Look, in a few, we've all, we had this vision that we formulated back in 16, which said that at some point of time, you're going to wake up in the morning and your computer slash financial assistant will say, hey, I analyze your mortgages. And I realized I could switch from bank A to bank B and save you $10 on your mortgage. And um, it will be as easy as saying yes. They will do, you know, the computer will do all the work for you, right? And this is where we think uh, retail banking and financial services is going, right? And so in that, in that future vision, who do you want to be? Well, obviously, you want to be the financial advisor that gave you that advice. Because if I do, maybe you tip me a dollar for doing it, right? And I think that's the only role to play in the future. That's what banking was supposed to be. Somebody to care about you, not themselves. Somebody that cared about your finances, somebody that helped you, right? And when I see ChatGP and how we're applying AI now, I finally feel like, wow, I can actually see that coming to fruition very soon. And this is going to have a dramatic impact on this industry. I think it's ironic to see what fintech is going through right now from a valuation perspective, considering the fact that we're on the cusp of this transition that will seriously change this industry. And I am more convinced than ever when I see what we're building internally, what we're launching and what we're doing. This is coming now and it's coming soon. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting. And that's why I think, you know, right now, I'm not convinced that would be a great idea to consider such strategic options as there's so much potential and it's really happening right now. All right, Sebastian, we'll be watching. And thank you so much, Sebastian, for your time and your insight today. We really appreciate it.
Hi, welcome back. This is great. And this part's actually probably even cooler than before. So before 2023, ask in, uh, any investor what generative AI was, and they probably would, at least I thought it was a disease or something. I definitely did not think it was something that was gonna help my son write his resume. But, but now we know better, right? Generative AI has burst onto the scene powered by advances in chip design out of NVIDIA to Microsoft back ch uh, chat GPT search tools. It has led to some really powerful developments in the robot space, which is amazing. Enter Boston Dynamics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage CEO of Boston Dynamics, Robert Plater, and Yahoo Finance senior reporter, Ali Garfinkel. Hello, hello. You can say hi. Hello. Hi. Rob, thank you so much for being here. Glad to be here, thanks for having me. All right, so to kick things off, we have some video that really illustrates what Boston Dynamics does. If, when it rolls, tell us what we'll be seeing. Great, so you know, we've uh, introduced two products to the world. Uh, in, in 2020, we launched Spot, and you're seeing uh, Purina's uh, version of Spot here. Spot is a mobile inspection platform. It goes around the factory. Uh, taking uh, thermal measurements, acoustic uh, measurements, reading gauges, uh, making sure that the factory is operating in a healthy and uh, safe state. And this ends up being um, really the launching use case. You know, Spot's a multi-purpose robot, but this is the use case that we think is really scalable and uh, that's gonna grow. And so we have customers like Chevron, uh, Ontario Power Generation, Anheuser-Busch, Purina, folks like that. And next, I think, we're, I believe we're going to see Stretch. Yeah, so Stretch is You have a knack for naming them, I have to say. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, tall, right? Stretch is tall. It How tall to, is Stretch? It has to reach to the top of a container, a shipping container. So this is going to be a multi-purpose. So taller than me. Yeah, it's a, you know, it reach, reaches about 10 feet. And uh, there's about 800 million uh, containers moved around the world each year. A lot of them are full of boxes, like you see here. This is a back-breaking, repetitive uh, task. Um, and so there's just a ton of boxes to move. And we started with unloading uh, these containers first because it was kind of a, a nice safe place to start the robot. It's almost in a cage there. But ultimately this is gonna be a multi-use robot. It's gonna do any box moving task in the warehouse. Uh, we just, we're just launching it here. And we just delivered the first units of that uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, companies like uh, DHL and Maersk and NFI and Auto are buying them. Now Rob, uh, I don't know if you've heard, but we're in a bit of an AI boom right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know, so, right, wild, so, so, right? Yeah. Um, are we possibly on the precipice of a robotics boom? I think it's gonna be exciting. So, you know, AI is the brain, uh, the robot is the body, and together, I think we're gonna build an entirely new industry that's basically gonna change business, it's gonna change the way we live. So it, it's gonna have a big impact. Now, to sort of illustrate that point, we actually have a special guest. Spot, if you could please come out. Yeah, so we brought a Spot robot uh, for to demo to you guys today. And today... Yeah, you can get up, take pictures, go have a moment. Spot is, uh, normally you would autonomously walk around a factory. Today, Spot is being driven by um, Hannah Rossi here. But Spot has onboard cameras that lets it see its environment so it knows where... So if it goes on and off this... Does this, it get stage fright? Not at all, not at all. But notice how so it's coordinating its foot placement with the steps because it sees the steps. So it knows how to adjust its own behavior to the environment. And that's because there's cameras. There's, there's actually five cameras all around uh, the robot. And so it builds a local terrain map. And so it knows sort of what it's getting into. <laughs> and you know, it, posing is cute, but it also, if you put a sensor on the back of its body, you can then point that sensor at something in the world. So legs just turn out to be a great way to get around in the world. Now we happen to have a payload uh, today, an arm. So we, we can configure this robot with a variety of sensors or tools. Today we have a, an arm to show. And one of, because I think the real value of robots comes not only when you have a mobile platform, but when you have something that can do actual work. And so the spot arm uh, can grab things, open doors, uh, manipulate things. And so, and one of the things we pay attention to is coordinating the motion of the body and the arm together. You and I don't think about it, but you know, we can walk and move and touch something. And look, I'm, I'm walking around and still touching this front into the arm easily. So doing all of that coordination 
uh, takes a lot of work. And let's see, I'll, I'll show uh, one little simple task. I have a little toy here. And, uh, it is a stress cube, is my understanding. The whole idea of these robots is, while Hannah's controlling it, she's just giving it sort of high-level gestures about what to do. The robot is managing its own motion, and it's actually going to pick up the ball itself. So she, well, it looks like it's going <laughs> to miss on the first try. So it's not flawless. Robots, there's no threat of them taking over, I, I assure you. <laughs> you know. Um, so, but they do have to manage an awful lot of their own motion in order for them to be useful, to ad ad adapt to the environment, whether the environment change, if, if a uh, box is in the way today and then it was tomorrow, we're going to miss twice in a row. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, but, How often does that happen? Uh, not that often, but sometimes. Yeah. You know, so I think the lights in here maybe confuse, the, confuse it a little bit. But we just launched the door opening module for this. So now the robot can go through a factory and see the door handle, open it, and, and help it move through that space. So um, I think we'll uh, maybe stop there. Maybe we'll show them one little fun gate. Uh, you know, yeah, we do the dancing. The dancing is not, not for pay or, or uh, pay work. Um, but you know, I do think that uh, there's an inherent interest, right? The robots are interesting for reasons that you know, we sort of have been looking at living, moving things our whole lives. And so it's sort of easy to emotionally identify with something that moves around in a world like that. So I think we'll let this sit down at this point, and we can proceed with. Spot, sit. Yeah. Oh, you're giving it the command? Uh, gee, Hannah. Please, you're, are you giving it commands? Hannah is basically saying, dance. Yes. But that's, that's about it. Yes, but it manages its own movement. Now, I have to say, um, the robotics nerd in me thinks this is so cool. Um, but the financial journalist in me sits here and says, is this scalable? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So to make this business scale, there has to be a use case that is scalable that actually provides value to somebody. So as I said, with, with Spot, we think that value is in, in industrial inspection, basically keeping a factory up and running. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, so there has to be value in a use case. The robot has to be able to technically do it. Mm -hmm. and, and then there has to be, is, is it scalable? Is mm -hmm. there enough of it? Mm -hmm. And so getting all three of those things right is actually tough, because you have to cross the chasm. We're, we're building a new industry here. Mm -hmm. And you got to cross the chasm with a high value use case that is scalable that's going to pay for the development of these machines, which is still, this is an expensive thing to develop. They're How software. expensive? Well, you know, at least $100 million, frankly, to launch a product. Because you have to iterate on the hardware, their software. The first prototype, you're not going to be able to deliver, because that's not going to be reliable enough. And so it takes time. Honestly, the folks who's, who are, there's a bunch of little companies standing up now. Mm -hmm. They say they're going to launch a product, a humanoid, in two years. Mm -hmm. I think they're blowing smoke. It's going Elon to be Musk has also years. actually been talking about humanoid robots as well. And he has. And you know, uh, Also a, smoke? Well. Let's see. I think he's been watching too many science fiction movies. I think the fear mongering is a little bit overblown. But you also have to take Elon seriously, right? He has uh, a factory behind him. So that if he can build the robot, he can just be his own consumer and use it. They will know how to scale manufacturing, because you're only going to get these things to be affordable as if you can build enough of them and get the cost down. And they have the software wherewithal. On the other hand, he's saying things that don't make sense to me. Like, like what? Um, you're going to purposely make the robot slow and weak because that's going to make it safe. I don't get that part. You know what? You want to make robots that are strong and powerful, and that's, that's the only way they're going to be useful. And so I think that's just going, we're definitely going in the opposite direction. Now, what are the use cases for Spot that you're most excited about? You mentioned Nestle, Purina, for Yeah, so industrial inspection in the process industry mm -hmm. is, I think, a, a huge and scalable market. But there's other really important use cases out there. We've had Spot at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. It's been at Three Mile Island. It's been at Chernobyl. Anytime you have a dangerous situation where you really don't want to put a person in there, send a robot, for sure. Uh, we have public safety officials, police using it. If they have to serve a warrant to a murder suspect, you don't want the cop opening mm -hmm. the door, right? Mm -hmm. That is a very dangerous environment. Mm -hmm. And so having a robot mediate that first contact with a potential suspect mm -hmm. is actually going to be safer for mm -hmm. folks. And so I think there's a, a whole variety of potential use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely want to build all of our robots mm -hmm. to be platforms and have multiple use cases. 
But again, you got to have that launching use case that gets you across the chasm. Mm -hmm. Now, we may be expecting too much for, from our robots, perhaps, but what do the risks look like? Well, you know, I, um, I don't see much risk here. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the real Godfather risk. Godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, very concerned about AI powered battle robots. The apocalyptic view, not for you. I just don't, I don't, I don't see that. I think AI is going to enhance the capability of these robots. They're going to be, but they're tools that we are building, you know? They are going to have off switches. Mm -hmm. uh, I just really don't see uh, the, uh, the revolution happening. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I worry about. Mm -hmm. I think I've been developing robots for 30 years. We struggle, we work so hard to get them to do something reasonably well in, in, in repeatable fashion. Mm -hmm. um, we're not about to take off. <laughs> the apocalyptic view is not in our immediate future, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You've got to start with the cubes, I guess. Um, <laughs> right, right. They couldn't pick up the cube. Um, but one of the other things that, people often, that often comes up when people talk about robots is the idea that robots will take jobs. What is your view on the relationship between human jobs and robotics? So, you know, every new technology has changed work, and robotics will be the same. Mm -hmm. But the, the jobs this robot is doing is a very, it's, it's a job that frankly is so boring, people don't do it very well. You know, can you, do you want the job where you're walking through the factory with a clipboard recording temperatures and pressures and gauges repetitive, repetitively every day, multiple times a day? Basically, people are, suck at that job. They'll either not do it or they'll do it incorrectly. And you really want to reserve those skilled technicians for fixing the equipment, mm -hmm. not finding the problem. And so the robot's actually going to help enhance mm -hmm. the productivity of those people. And stretch, I showed unloading those containers. It can be 120 degrees in the summer inside that container. Um, that's a brutal mm -hmm. place to work. Mm -hmm. um, so what's really going to happen is the people who used to unload those containers are now going to operate the robot. Mm -hmm. We have the concept of a robot wrangler job, which is it doesn't take an advanced degree, mm -hmm. but you, the, per, the person who used to work in that warehouse is now going to enhance their mm -hmm. skills by learning how to work with technology mm -hmm. and manage robots. And our customers like DHL and Maersk are excited that that is actually going to attract mm -hmm. talent to them. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that in the end robotics could even be a driver of economic growth? Absolutely, because I think it can enhance uh, overall human productivity. So is it the sort of thing that it's an you know efficiency what's game in the end? It's, it, well, part of it's, it's efficiency, but, but look what's happening demographically. The rich world, the population is already declining, right? China, Japan, Korea, they don't have birth rates that are actually replacing their current population. Mm -hmm. We're going to need robots mm -hmm. to keep up the production. And, and people don't want to do some of the work that these robots are doing now. Now, in terms of what's next for Boston Dynamics, what happens now? You have spot, you have stretch. What's the next hill you're well, going to climb? So our, our next, uh, uh, the robot that we've been developing for years, our humanoid uh, atlas, I think there's a real role for a two-handed mobile manipulation mm -hmm. robot What's out What's that role? What does that look like? Well, I think it could be in manufacturing, some place where you have more dexterous manipulation. So, you know, there's, there's been robots in automotive factories for years, but, you know, they only do a single task in a very highly controlled environment. Mm -hmm. If you could build a robot that could pick up anything, mm -hmm. anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, you could then start to do this heavy lifting in a, a wide variety of ways, either in logistics or in manufacturing, or maybe mm -hmm. getting your baggage to you faster than the airlines can do it right now. Yeah, and now we have thir about 30 seconds left. What does the future of robotics look like, and will these be in our homes any time uh, in, in, in my it, lifetime? Within, yes, within it your life, my lifetime. I, I, think, okay. I think it's going to take between 10 and 20 years before these things are in your homes. Yeah, 10 to 20 is actually not as long as I was expecting. Long, right? No, that's not that long at all. These are expensive right now, and mm -hmm. we're starting with industrial applications mm -hmm. because you have to you know, have enough uh, economic activity to warrant the price. Mm -hmm. But as we get better and better at these and we generalize them, they're going to get cheaper, mm -hmm. the capability is going to be there, mm -hmm. and yeah, I want one in my home eventually. Well, you have them in your office, is my understanding. Yeah, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, thank you so, so much. Dr. Rob Plater. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Spot, thank you as well. Right, you gonna, yeah, you gonna roll out. Oh, he's walking backwards. Okay, okay, I can work with that. Oh, the cube. <laughs> the cube. Thank you. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's actually crazy. It's still me. Hi. 
still Ali Garfinkel, still senior tech reporter at Yahoo Finance. Hasn't shifted in the last 15 minutes. Um, you know, who here, I'd actually like to ask you all a question. Um, who here has had a conversation about AI in the last month? Raise your hand. That's everyone. Who here has had a conversation about AI in the last week? Still almost everyone. Last day. That's a lot of people, and it's, um, it means we're all in the same boat. I talk about AI quite a bit, and the next guest we're going to bring out is someone who's really leading the charge in AI video. Please welcome Chris Valenzuela, CEO of Runway. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Of course, thank you for inviting me. Yes, uh, we don't have another robot dog for you. There's only one robot dog per Yahoo Finance Invest. Okay. However, yes, however, we do have some video of what Runway does. If we could see that up there, that would be wonderful. And if, I'd, actually, um, I'd actually love for you to tell me a little bit about the video, what we're seeing. And I think it's really important to stress as you're watching something like this, um, the birds aren't real, the parrot isn't real, the peacock isn't real, real in the sense that it exists in the world. It's That's, generated. It's generated. Yes. So tell me what we're seeing. Um, this is part of a new update on a video model that we just released a couple of days ago. Um, this uh, technology allows you to turn words into video. So everything you're seeing here doesn't exist. I'm just generating this using either text prompts or images or combinations of both. I can go from any idea I have in my head, from any concept I have in my head, to full 18, 20 seconds of videos like the ones you're seeing this here. These are. HD videos, um, and we're improving not only the quality, but also the consistency and the control of how you make these videos come to life. Now, I want to start really big picture here. Um, are we in an AI boom or an AI bubble? Um, I mean, everything we're seeing right now, it's definitely a period of transformation. There's definitely a boom. There's definitely, uh, over the last 12 months, uh, we've seen incredible progress and speed of Improvements. We've been working on Why runway. is that, do you think? We've been working on Runway for five years. Um, and it's definitely taken us time to get to where we are. And I think it's a combination of factors. On the one end, you have um, data, um, really good data coming to place, um, really good research and really good algorithms and new techniques that have been proven to work really well. And that takes time. And the third part, I would say, is a combination of compute. Compute has gotten to a place where we can train these large video models or these large multi-model systems way faster than ever before. Mm -hmm. I think we're definitely at a, an intersection point where like, things are converging, mm -hmm. and we're seeing where things are like this. Now, how fast is AI video advancing? Give me a uh, timeline. Like, where were we two years ago, and where are we today? I mean, uh, if I showed you what we were able to do two years ago, everyone would laugh. <laughs> we're, we're, that's exactly the reaction I had two years ago when I showed people Like stick work. figures, essentially. I mean, it was. You know, uh, you ever seen like a movie from the 1900s where like you see silent movies, like pixelated outputs, just like black and white, really raw quality, mm -hmm. and uh, someone tells you like we're gonna be able to have 4K video coming out of your cell phone in a couple of years. Everyone in the 1900s will tell you, come on, of course not. It sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, right? It sounds absolutely crazy. So we were in the 1900s like two years ago, right? And now we're entering the digital era, I would say, the 1980s of the camera, I guess, revolution. Um, and I think it's, a, it's a, I would say, a, a consequence of those factors coming into play and becoming like, more evident for everyone else. Uh, but the video, the model that we're showing you right here, the first version of that we released it six months ago. Now, in terms of, but I think it's also important to sort of distinguish between what can be done and what can't be done. Yeah. So what can the video do right now and what is off the table? So right now, these are tools to make and generate video and content. You can do audio, images, video, text, right? Um, I think what's still part and central to that process is human creativity, right? So you're not typing movie, enter, and you get a movie, mm. right? That, it's the same so I'm not going to be able to press a button and say, I have a full movie. No, definitely not. Ever. Because a full movie, it's about a human intention. There's a story you want to tell. There's something that needs to come out of your head, and you're using a camera to tell that story, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing as saying, now that we have a camera, you're going to become a filmmaker. Mm -hmm which is like not technically true, right? You need a camera to become a filmmaker, but having a camera will not make you Does a filmmaker. Does not make you a filmmaker. And will not make you win an Oscar, right? Mm -hmm. It's knowing how to use the camera to tell a good story that will make you a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And so this is somehow very similar. It's like you have these models, you can create amazing, incredible things that perhaps you never thought you would create, but that necessarily won't make you a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. 
What make you a filmmaker will be the ability for you to transfer that technology mm -hmm. into an idea, into a story someone wants to watch and entertain themselves with. And right now the model you have, it's about 15 seconds of video, yes. right? What is the goal eventually? What's the end game? Sure. Um, so first of all, on that, I guess, line of um, human imagination, continue to build more tools for people to tell more stories using this technology. That means two main things on the research side. One, quality. Again, this is a model that was just six months old. So six months ago, you couldn't do this. Now you're here. Making sure that you can continue to push the boundaries of that is like still our main focus. And the second one is, uh, control. Control becomes crucial in any creative endeavor. You really want to make sure that you can control these models in any way, shape, or form that you want. So if you have an object walking or a person walking or you want to control the camera, the angle, the type, the form, all of those things are needed because that would allow you to tell the story you want to tell. Mm -hmm. And so control comes in the form of manipulating the objects within the video or how you want to tell, how you want to move them. And that's still something new because, again, all of this is pre pretty new still. Now, in terms of Runway's future, Runway, I believe, reportedly valued at $1.5 billion. Um, how do you think about competition? There are a lot of AI models out there, a lot of visual AI models out there. What distinguishes Runway? How do you think about competition, say, from ChatGBT? Do you consider ChatGBT to be a competitor? Bard? Not Meta, really. Um, Meta's Llama? All of them? <laughs> there's a lot. Um, there's no shortage. No, there's a lot of models these days. Um, so I guess it's a good distinction is Runway. We started Runway um, thinking about the idea of Runway and working on Runway eight years ago. Uh, the company is now turning five. I think we turned five years just like last week. Um, Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> We're still at the, at the early stages, though. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you still think of it as really early days? Yeah, oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. It's so early. It's year zero. I mean, it's everything beyond what before was just pure research. And it still is research. Mm -hmm. But now we're entering a phase of usage, of production-ready results. But it's still year zero of that. Mm -hmm. um, so Runway has been working on this for almost five years now. Um, and I think what, what's, what's important to remember is that there's more than just the model that you're seeing out, right? It's the way you use the model mm -hmm. and the safety mechanisms that you have in place. Mm -hmm and the way you improve the model, and the way you deliver that model to millions of users over time, and the way you keep doing that forever and ever and ever, where distinguish and I think makes a very good company a very good mm -hmm. company. I think these days there's, there's a lot of models, and I think that's great, but I necessarily won't consider a model a company. So those are, for me, different things. Having a model, it's like having a great piece of software, mm -hmm. but a great piece of software won't necessarily make you a great company. It's the people that make the software and the models themselves what makes a great company. And that's something we're working on for almost five years now. Yeah, and when yeah. it comes to, like, sort of to that end, when you think about Runway, it's, it's really cool, but what are the use cases? What do you expect people to be using it for? What do you expect people to be paying for? Sure, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, these are tools for creatives. And so if you want to tell a story, these are the tools you can use. With that in mind, there's, I would say, both a business um, kind of like set of creative uh, opportunities for agencies, production teams, uh, studios, advertising companies, mm -hmm. uh, broadcasting companies that we actually work with right now. Mm -hmm. And those are for things that go at the pre-production stage and the post-production. Pre-production mm -hmm. pre is everything that happens when you are thinking or crafting an idea. So storyboarding, script writing, uh, trying to work with everything on the early stages of the idea. And so these videos and these tools are great for exactly doing that. Mm -hmm. Now the key difference from the way you're doing it right now is that these tools allow you to do it faster than ever before. Mm -hmm. So you can go from idea to execution in minutes, mm -hmm. and that might have taken you perhaps hours or sometimes days in the past. Mm -hmm. So are those people advertisers in theory? They're, they... I mean, if you want to make a movie these yeah. days, the yeah. first thing when you make a movie... If you're well, just a filmmaker. You're just a filmmaker. I mean, yeah. we work a lot with filmmakers, mm -hmm. renowned filmmakers that make films for years. Mm -hmm. The first stage of making any piece of film or content is you need to come out with a good story. And the way you iterate in the story is you write a script. Mm -hmm. And so you have tools that can allow you to iterate faster on that script writing, mm -hmm. right? Now that you have the script, you need to visualize it because you mm -hmm. need to pitch it perhaps to a producer, to a company, to mm -hmm. someone that wants to help you make that movie. Um, creating a storyboard is like you're making it by hand. You're mm -hmm. drawing things by mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if you can just mm -hmm. generate every single like view or previous of my shot before I even have to like do it by hand, right? So what you're saying is this could even help people sell a movie. Oh, of course, 100%. That's the previous aspect. Mm -hmm. That's the pre-production aspect. It's mm -hmm. like you're iterating on creating the idea and selling the idea. Mm -hmm. And that happens for filmmakers, but also for advertisers or for anyone who wants to make a story. Mm -hmm. And then on the post-production side, this is where it comes really interesting because most of the things, we've been talking about generative AI for some time. I'm sure everyone has heard about AI-generated videos and movies and images, right? Um, Once or twice. But, but if you think really about 
the idea of computer-generated imagery, that has been around for years, decades. Mm -hmm. it's a, there's a term for that, it's called CGI. <laughs> and so, literally, computer-generated imagery. When we look at Jurassic Park, we all understand those are not real dinosaurs, right? Those are- They're not? <laughs> Sorry, they're I- They're generated, when right? When I was a kid, I did think they were. But that's my point, like- Yeah. And superheroes don't fly, right? Yeah. That's all generated by computers, right? The same way that parrot is not real, even right. though it looks really good. I know. Um, and so this is like, this is the same. These are tools to create computer-generated imagery. The only difference, though, is that it's not now in the hands of those who can afford to make it, mm -hmm. right? Or those who have the skills or the craft to make it. It's those who have the good ideas that can now make it. Mm -hmm. So the constraints on storytelling are not going to be bounded to budgets, uh, who do you know in the industry, mm -hmm. or how much knowledge do you have about an obscure technique. Mm -hmm. It's about how good is your idea. Mm -hmm. And then you can use these tools to execute that idea, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the pre-production side. And when I see a larger revolution is that that transformation uh, will allow people to tell stories that we never heard of before. Yeah. And so we're going to start seeing movies and watching stories that we might have never heard of before because of this. Well, and there are a lot of concerns sort of to that end where there's all going to be this explosion of content, all these things that weren't possible before. Um, it seems like you're pretty adamant that runways technology will not replace human, human filmmakers. Um, will it displace jobs in Hollywood? I think it's important to understand that technology always augments humans. And this is the, the story of Hollywood has been um, uh, marked by moments like this mm -hmm. before. This is not the first time that in an industry, in particularly Hollywood, has been thinking about technology and how it's going to impact jobs, mm -hmm. right? Um, there used to be orchestras playing in theaters. And so there were live musicians playing the music mm -hmm. for the silent movies, right? Mm -hmm. And when talkies, that was the name people referred to mm -hmm. for music with inside uh, movies, there was a lot of questions around what happens with the orchestra in the movie and who's gonna pay for that, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing is that it changed. Mm -hmm. So the, the key here, word here is change. Mm -hmm. It's not replacement, it's augmentation, right? Mm -hmm. So you might not need an orchestra, but now you have a whole industry of music around filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Much bigger, perhaps, than the orchestra movie industry at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, this is something very similar where it's not about replacing the entire industry, it's about augmenting processes mm -hmm. and changing those. Mm -hmm. And so I think the key factor now here, and one of the, how I spend most of my time these days, mm -hmm. and specifically in Hollywood, is mm -hmm. helping people understand the magnitude of the change mm -hmm. and help them transition into that because it's already happening. Mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, on a broader societal level as well, I know there are a lot of concerns about AI-powered video going into the 2024 election. How should we be thinking about that? How are you thinking about that? I mean, in the same way that we think about CGI these days, like you can make generated footage of anyone saying anything without AI. If you just have the means and the resources, you can do it, mm -hmm. right? And, but there's uh, rules and norms and systems that prevent us from doing that, right? We have societal terms around how to deal with that kind of content. Mm -hmm. We should apply those term terms to these outputs. So we should think about the outputs of the models and how to make sure those are safe mm -hmm. and not constrain the technology and the innovation happening at the technology side. And then in terms of, I know, I know I'm not allowed to ask if you're going public, but looking ahead, what does success look like for you? How do you manage those outputs? How do you manage the growth of the company? And how do you make sure it all stays safe? I mean, we're still pretty much at early stages. I mean, again, it's year zero. My only like focus as, uh, as driving the company is to continue inventing this. Um, we've been working for this very hard, um, and we're not even like like realizing yet the whole potential of it. Again, Gen 2, which is just the videos you saw, those are six months old. Uh, and so we're working towards like getting this to better quality, better results, and also to the next billion set of, of filmmakers out there. I think the saying that we have at Runway that I think influences and um, help us shape a lot of our product is to really think about that the best movies and the best stories are yet to be made. The golden era of cinema is yet to become, and we need to build that. Chris Valenzuela, thank you so much. We are going to have to leave it Perfect. there. Thank you. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Chris, thank you. Are you good here? I can't Got it. <laughs>
quite frankly, I haven't been to the mall and I can't tell you how when. So retail theft, though, remains a serious problem. We heard recently from um, the Target CEO, it said that it's rampant. Restaurants are being merged and taken over by tech. So where are we and what is going on? Today, we're zeroing in on the restaurant space. Subway CEO John Chidzi is here. And it's worth noting that Subway is in the process of being acquired by a private equity Welcome. firm. Please take your seats. <laughs> <laughs> Subway is in the process of being acquired by private equity firm Nora Capital for, wait for it, a whopping $9.55 billion. That's a lot of bread. <laughs> Yahoo Finance senior reporter Brooke De Palma will lead this next discussion. Oops. It's good. Perfect. Great. Yep. Talk that away. All set. Yeah, all set. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. John, thank you so much for, for coming up, for chatting with us, for sitting down. So appreciate it. Let's just start big picture. You came out of your retirement in 2019 to turn Subway around. What made this opportunity worth that? Um, yeah, so I did Burger King. I ran Burger King for seven or eight years, which was a turnaround basically. And I wasn't looking for a job. I hadn't worked in like, well, I was working, but not, not, <laughs> working, not in a real job. Um, I always thought Subway was public. And I always said I never wanted to run another public company again, having done that twice. And um, I had no idea Subway was private. So when I found out that it was private, it had been owned by two families for 58 years. Um, it had no debt. It had never borrowed a dollar of debt in 58 years. Uh, it had the second largest ad fund behind McDonald's. In the US, we have about $550 million ad fund. Globally, it's about $800 million. Um, largest restaurant chain in the world by unit. So it had a lot of great assets. So I thought, you know, you'd have to be an idiot not to be able to do something good here. So it just so it was an easy yes. I wouldn't say that, but it, it was a fun ass. So. It was a fun ass. I mean, the past four years, so much has happened. But of course, most recently, you have to tell us a little bit more, if you can, about that $9.6 billion deal. Why Roar Capital? Why go with them? Yeah, well, Roar Capital, um, obviously, Neil Aronson, who, who founded Roar, uh, loves franchising. I think they own, I don't even, I can't remember how many restaurant brands, but they own Massage Envy and they own Orange Theory and they own Driven Brands and they're just kind of experts at franchising. So obviously it was very competitive. We had 24 private equity firms that started at the beginning of the process um, as we went through it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Rourke, I think in the, in the families, you know, I think hopefully both sides are happy with the price, but clearly our franchisees are happy that we ended up with a buyer who not only understands restaurants, but clearly understands franchising. So I think it's a win, win, win. Do you think that Subway will change at all under War Capital or still same momentum that you've seen recently? No. I mean, they've been very clear that they're going to, they bought it as a, a solo entity. They're not going to combine it with any other restaurant chains. They're, you know, going to keep the same management team, same strategy, same plan. And I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing they will take it public one day as a separate entity as well. So That's lots to stay tuned for, that's for sure. Let's talk about the business here in the U.S. Last year, Subway closed roughly 500 stores here in the U.S. How are you thinking about the real estate portfolio here at home? Yeah, and that was a good year. I mean, uh, when we got there, Subway had, had seven straight down years of sales that they were, while there, they were closing 1,500, 1,000 a year. So um, I think the fact this year will be below that. So the, the trend in the U.S. has slowed down dramatically. Um, globally, this will be the first year we've grown since 2016. We'll open up more than enough internationally to make up for that. But you know, most big QSR chains close one to two percent of their units a year. So if we have 20,000 restaurants in the U.S., that puts us somewhere in the 200 to 400 restaurants, which is kind of where we are now. Mm -hmm. So you know, my answer is we should close three to 400 like everybody else does, but we should open you know, two to 300. So basically tread water in the U.S. at worst. I actually think we can grow and open up some of what we closed in the past. But best case, tread water. And internationally, it's a completely different story. Yeah, let's talk about international for a second. You guys recently announced, uh, or rather signed 15 franchise agreements. That's totaling 9,000 future locations. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for future store growth? What sort of consumer is looking for a subway in their market? Yeah, well, I, I think the beauty, if you think about there's really only six global brands out there. There's McDonald's, Burger King, Domino's, KFC, Starbucks, and ourselves that truly are kind of everywhere and have scale. 
So we have 17,000 restaurants outside the U.S. Only McDonald's and KFC are bigger, so mm -hmm. clearly we're out there. But if you think about of those six global brands I mentioned, we're the only one that's really healthier. Mm. Um, it's easy to say now that I'm not a Burger King. Um, <laughs> don't have to be healthy, just healthier. <laughs> and if you read the Wall Street Journal and you look around, the Middle East, China writes about, you know, they have obesity problems now. They have juvenile diabetes. They, they basically, a lot of these countries have the same health issues we have. And so I think we really play in a sweet spot globally mm. um, in terms of sort of the food we have in our menu. So I, I think we're positioned perfectly. Um, and then a Subway is obviously much less expensive to build. It takes a lot less labor than a McDonald's or a Burger King. So when you sort of look at the unit economics, it's very appealing to a lot of large restaurant developers internationally. Yeah. So I think we're in a, a great spot. Yeah, and also too, you know, on this this uh, weight loss, on this diet trends that you're seeing, I have to ask, what is Subway thinking about the potential impact of weight loss drugs? Are you guys planning for that? Do you feel like your menu is fitting the needs of a future consumer who perhaps is taking more of these sort of weight loss drugs? Well, unless people decide if they take the drug, they can go have you know two Big Macs and a Whopper and whatever, then we might be in a little trouble. But uh, <laughs> no, I think given the fact again that we are sort of the healthier, you know, we have wraps and we have bowls, and um, you know, tuna is our second largest selling product. Um, so I, I don't, I think it actually plays into sort of the trends of where the world's going. So we don't spend a lot of time worrying about what's that going to do to us. Mm. And, and consumer sentiment is also top of mind right now. So many consumers are searching for value. How are you working with franchisees to make sure that you have the right price point to meet the consumer where they're at? There's so many headwinds up against, up against consumers right now. Yeah, and if you think about it, if you come from Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King, everybody has the dollar menu, or now it's a dollar twenty-nine or whatever, which you know we don't we don't have in the sandwich space. So, um, luckily, you know, one of our brand attributes that we've been known for fifty plus years is value for the money. That's probably one of the strongest sort of value propositions Subway has vis-a-vis -vis the sandwich competition. We're definitely cheaper than our three or four other sandwich competitors. But you know, when you but you have to compete given our scale, you have to compete with the burger chains and the pizza chains. So I think it's really incumbent upon you to engineer products that are maybe not the foot long or six inch, maybe even slightly different sides, things that um, maybe not, uh, uh, you're never gonna get down to the dollar fifty, but you can play in the four and five dollar range, which I think keeps you um, really relevant. And so it's very important to have that barbell strategy, if you will, so you can really get the consumer wherever they want to shop. Yeah, and speaking of that consumer, who exactly would you say is coming more to Subway these days? Would you say that maybe people are trading down into the, the category that Subway is? And do you see others maybe spending a little less than they used to in terms of income levels of your consumers? Yeah, I mean, having been in the QSR industry for a long time um, and living through 07, 08, living through some, some other times, yeah, definitely in the early times of an economy softening for the first four to eight quarters, you get the trade down effect where if maybe you're in fast casual or casual dining, uh, people that are more stretched for their dollar, so to speak, do trade down. And so I think we all benefit from that to a certain extent. Now, if it's prolonged, you obviously can't continue to lap that forever. So it eventually you know, shows up in your same store sales numbers. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's definitely a little bit of a, a tailwind initially. Hmm. And in terms of digital offerings, you guys are working to implement more digital offerings on the app. You're really looking to get customers engaged. How are you working with franchisees in order to do those digital offerings? What's their reception so far? I believe that there's a digital offering set to be in effect by the end of the year. Yeah, so Subway had massively underinvested in technology. That probably explains part of their six or seven year slide before we, when we got there, uh, digital sales at Subway were three and a half percent, which is abysmal. Um, the pizza chains, which will never be, are more like 75 or 80%, but if you looked at a McDonald's or a KFC, a lot of those guys are more in the 25 to 35% range, so we're right. at 10%, pathetic, right? Um, so you look up four years later, we're at 17. So we've quintupled it, but I would say there's still a long way to go from 17 to you know 25 to, to 35. So we continue to invest in that digital platform. Um, digital happens to be our most profitable channel mm. um, in terms of the highest check and the most profitable check for franchisees. It helps them on labor. Obviously, it's much easier on, a, on, a, on an app. Somebody generally orders, I'll take the number four, the number whatever, instead of having the sandwich artist have to ask you 11 questions. So I think from a franchisee standpoint, they like the profitability. They like, they like the fact that it's less labor. And kids today, let's be honest, the customer doesn't want to talk to them. And the sandwich artist, I mean, people don't <laughs> like to talk. People like to look. So yeah. Yeah, we need so to the reception's been good to digital offerings so far? Yes. And when you think about the person behind the counter, that labor, 
We, you know, when you think about Subway's market, one of your biggest markets here in the U.S. is California. And the FAST Act is set to go in effect April 1st. That will bring minimum wages up to $20 an hour there. How is Subway thinking about that? Or are you guys going to raise prices there to offset that higher wage? Well, again, we're a 100% franchise, so we don't control pricing. We recommend pricing to our franchisees, but it's up to them whether they <clears throat> want to accept you know, what we think or not. But yes, I would say it's inevitable that franchisees in California, like you've, you've heard it from McDonald's, you've heard it from Starbucks, prices are definitely going to rise more in California than they have anywhere else, given mm. the wage pressure you know, that, that they're obviously going to be and facing. And you're working closely with franchisees to offset that? Very. But that's, again, another reason why you want to keep pushing digital. You want to keep pushing as many things as you can to help them take labor out. Um, I assume we're going to talk about inflation at one point in food costs. <laughs> but, you know, where else in the P&L can you help them? Because you clearly can't help them from a labor perspective, at least the yeah. cost of labor. So Yeah, let's talk about inflation really quickly. We don't really have a quickly. robotic dog to make sandwiches. No robotic dogs to make sandwiches. No, no plans to add No, we're very low, low tech at the moment. So Okay. Any plans to get high tech? We need to fix the brand first, then we'll go there. So. Okay, all right, good answer, good answer. So your menu does range, everything from chicken, bacon, ranch mouth to bacon and eggs. These are some of the hardest hit ingredients that have seen the highest inflation rates in the past year. How are you working to combat that? Where are we at with the cost of goods now? Yeah, so luckily in the U.S., I'd say from a food standpoint, we think food costs are going to come down sort of anywhere from 2 to 4%, maybe on the aggressive side, 5 let's go with 2 to 4 So I think we've definitely crested that. And so when we look at our basket of, you know, items that we use, our SKUs, so to speak, I think we will, our franchisees will actually have some tailwind in terms of those costs coming down this year. The other thing we did, which I have no idea why Subway ever did this, we were the only sandwich chain that actually cut all of our proteins upstream. We didn't have slicers. Mm -hmm. our, we had them decades ago. Why they took them out, I have no idea. And so there are very few suppliers that can pre-slice that quantity of meat. So we pay way more than what everybody else was paying for right. meat. So now by having slicers in every single restaurant, now we can open ourselves up to infinitely more suppliers. So not just the fact that inflation's passed, as we renegotiate all those protein contracts, we will take big chunks of cost out of the system, which will obviously benefit franchisees as well. Wonderful. And I do want to bring it out big picture really quick. You do plan to open 4,000 locations in China over the next 20 years. What is the status of that expansion plan right now? Yeah, they're, they're building away. Um, I mean, again, don't know, Subway in the past didn't want um, people that, that were in other concepts. So the people that tried to grow Subway in a country would literally go one at a time, which is obviously not the way to grow internationally. And so when we got there, we said, no, we want the people that have 500 Domino's in the country, 500 Burger Kings, 1,000 Starbucks. You know, they know what they're doing. They know how to develop. Um, they know that you're going to lose money on the first two or 300 until you get scale and presence. So our deal in China are people, you know, that are multi-units. We just signed a 2,000-unit deal in India with the people that have Burger King and um, Domino's in India. And you could look in Turkey. You could look in Malaysia, Indonesia, almost all these 10,000 restaurants you're talking about that we've signed up so far are with people that have experience in, in other brands. So, And when you think about that dip in the consumer and adoption of something like a Subway, does that worry you at all? We're seeing others trying to get into this space, and it's been a slow go. Yeah, but again, we have over 17,000 restaurants out there, so it's not like we're not out there. We're in 100 countries. We know sandwiches work globally. Um, and we do have some large competitors, like in the UK, we have something called Greg's, but you're right, so far the Jersey Mike's, the Firehouses, the Jimmy John's are you know, much more domestically focused, so I always tell our team we need to you know, turn our list of, our backlog of 10,000, we need to turn that into a backlog of 20,000. I mean, we haven't touched Spain, we haven't touched Italy, we haven't done Japan, we haven't done Vietnam, we haven't done the Baltic, so we're out negotiating deals in all those markets and we just need to make sure that we get them all done uh, before our domestic competitors start to focus internationally. Is global the future for Subway? Absolutely. It, it, not just Subway. I mean, if you look at any McDonald's, Burger any QSR chain, the vast, vast majority of their growth comes internationally. Mm. And you've had such an extensive career. You were at PepsiCo. You mentioned you were at Burger King. If you had to highlight what makes this opportunity unique or different, what would you say? Um, like I said, there were two things really. One, just the scale. Um, it's great to work with a brand that has 99% brand awareness almost everywhere in the world. Um, but working for two families that don't owe a bank a single dollar, you're not having the gun of a public company. And having worked for a ton of private equity companies in my life, they're almost as obnoxious as the, um, I tease them that because they're my friends, as being in a public <laughs> company. So working for two families that are 
just very patient and like, John, we don't owe anybody anything. Just take your time, fix it. It's been a pleasure to work for them and kind of whatever pressure you have, you put it on yourself. You don't really have any external pressure, mm. which makes it a lot more fun. Do you foresee that being the same situation with Roar Capital? No. A little bit more pressure. No. <laughs> just a little bit more pressure. No. Well, I mean, we'll be fine, but it's just different, so. Yeah. yeah. And um, in terms of consumer trends right now, are there any ones that you're following in particular, maybe a certain eating habit or a certain go-to that you're seeing at your subway locations? Yeah, I think people, um, you know, like snacking, which we were not really great at. You'll see us in January in the first quarter roll out a lot of snackable items to get people in there sort of between lunch and dinner. Mm. Um, I think as people get stretched for price, people maybe skip meals so they snack more. Um, it really depends on sort of where you are on the economic spectrum. We. Again, when we went through our six or seven year slide, we used to have a really good late night business, which we don't have. Um, Will you bring it back? With that, we definitely, we're gonna definitely go work on that. Um, catering, if you, why Subway was never, like Panera, it's like 20, 25% of their business. Right. If you think about a Whopper, a Big Mac, and fries being delivered to your office or your house, it's not the most portable product. Subway's ideal for catering. Never had any catering package, never, inter, never um, advertised catering. So I think over the next five or six years, it won't happen overnight, but we can build a sizable catering business. So I think we have lots of opportunities that the brand just hasn't focused on, but our product is perfect for it. So John, you're not retiring again anytime soon? No, no, I'm still having fun. <laughs> John Chidsey, Subway CEO. Thank you so much for joining us. I so Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, appreciate God. It. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Who is uh, who's excited about a 24-inch sub from Subway at 1 a.m. with a beer? Like, all right, there we go. Subway CEO getting that job done, baby. Well, uh, well look, uh, uh, I'll be brief here. Uh, a tremendous thank you to our amazing guests that look uh, that really took time out of their insanely busy day, busy day and their schedules are pretty insane, uh, to be with us today. Uh, it's just an amazing event. And a thank you to our MC for the day, Tracy Burns. You rock. That's what the prompter says. You rock. There we go. You still got it. You still got it. All right, these chats come at such a pivotal time for the markets, the economy, and of course, the world, as we heard from a lot of leaders on the stage. We are grateful to have uh, really dove deep on so many important topics with an eye on helping investors all over the world. And of course, this event very much uh, around the world, a true global event on Yahoo Finance Live. And a huge thank you to the Yahoo Finance team for making this event happen alongside the debut of our amazing new user experience for yahoofinance.com. I encourage everyone to check it out, experiment with it. It is really a great guide to take you into, really I think make yourself a, a successful financial future. I should note this was our first event, uh, in-person event post-pandemic. It took many hours over many, many, many months and we'll probably start planning Invest 2024 20, right after this, yes, for real. Uh, to make this thing happen. I think I heard Lee, was that Lee, <laughs> Lee Levin? Uh, and it required some amazing collaboration across the Yahoo Finance organization. I, I'm really incredibly proud by everyone's just hustle, heart, and determination to bring something like this uh, event. I'm not reading off here, I'm just very personally touched by how our team toge came together for 10, 11 months. A lot of us are new in some of these roles and the ability to execute and pull off something like this not to get all sentimental in front of the world. It's just very touching, and I, I'm really, really proud of them. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. And of course, uh, thank you to our sponsor, Tasty Trade, for their longtime support. A uh, real friend of the show, JJ Kinahan, was on our pre-show. Love talking to JJ uh, on all things markets. And lastly, a big thank you to the Yahoo Finance community. That is you, that is all of you out there that watch Yahoo Finance Live every single day of your life. So many of you came up to me in this room, told me you enjoy watching Yahoo Finance Live, and we, uh, we are always there for you and provide a big help. I thank you, uh, and I will just speak for myself, helping you guys understand finance and getting access to some of these leaders here. That is why I actually wake up in the morning. Well, that and maybe do hot yoga like AT&T CEO. I gotta, I gotta start getting into these things. On that note, friends, enjoy the cocktail sponsored by Kevin Hart and his new tequila company. So enjoy, and again, thank you so much. Invest 2024 coming very soon. Thank you.
best conference. Take a listen to some of the buzziest moments of the day. Verizon, of course, is uh, concentrated in the U.S., but Yuhans are very much a, a world leader. You have that really yep. world view. Yep. When you travel around the world, what is the impact you're seeing from higher interest rates, mostly out of the U.S.? <sighs> so it's a little bit different. I mean, it depends on how much uh, in different uh, countries, how much the, 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 the interest rates are hitting ultimately consumers. I mean, in the U.S., it's still so that much of the interest rate has not gone to the homeowners because uh, given how it is. In markets like in Europe, like Spain, it's an enormous impact because basically the, in the increased interest rates that passed almost immediately to the consumer. So then you see a slowdown much quicker than we see here because normally you would think about with all these interest rates going up, we see, would see a slowdown very quickly in the U.S. But we don't see it. And the reason is, of course, that not all that interest increase is going straight to consumers. It hits the ones that have variable interest rates, which corporation might have and, th uh, and things like that. So I see much more tougher in especially Europe. Uh, and then we see <clears throat> uh, the part of Asia uh, continue being very strong because they have st still a growth potential where when you grow very fast, then you can actually manage the interest rates in it, a better way. Is the rates at these levels, does it hinder how fast Verizon grow next year? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, we have owner's economics on everything we have. Basically, we own all our uh, infrastructure, etc. So for us, it's basically, you think about it, we build one network, and then we, we want to have as many revenue generating uh, activities on top of the network. So it's a leverage model. So, so the more I, I, I can do with the network, the more revenues I can get, and then I have a scalable model where I have the best return on investment in the industry. So that's the whole idea for us. So it doesn't change. My, my CAPEX in 22 was almost 24 billion. This year, I have my guidance between 18.25 to 1925. I'm going to end up in a higher range, meaning closer to 19 billion. Uh, so we still invest heavily in our business. And next year, we have talked about our, our business as usual coming back now after a spike in five years, around 17 to 17 and a half billion dollars in CAPEX every year, which still is a sizable amount. So, uh, but it's not because of economy. It's more about the nature of how we have built the network and where we are in the build out. Interest rates are likely to stay higher for a yeah. long time. This has to be stunting what you do at Marriott. Yeah, although interestingly, I mean, you know our business model. We have nearly 8,700 hotels globally. We only own 20. So our net unit growth is driven on the shoulders and the balance sheets of our owner and franchisee community. The vast, vast majority of that community are long-term investors in the sector. So they don't tend to try and time their investments over a quarter or two. They tend to hold these assets for years, if not decades. So I would submit to you, of course, an elevated interest rate environment puts pressure on the, the unit uh, level economics of a development project. But today, the biggest impediment in the US market and in Western Europe is the availability of debt for new construction. And the irony, particularly here in the US, when you talk to regional lenders or even big balance sheet lenders, they will tell you when they scan their commercial real estate portfolio, often the hospitality loans are the best performing sector. The issue is concern they have about what liquidity requirements may be imposed by the regulators. And so they'll say, we love our partners, we love the hospitality sector, call us next year. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the reason you hear us and the other big brand companies so focused on conversion activity because the ability to source debt for existing assets with a track record of, of cash flow is infinitely easier than sourcing debt for new construction. Last week, Anthony, I got to, to spend some time with JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, and I didn't realize at the time, but I went back and looked at the transcript. He mentioned that banks are starting to pull a little bit back on lending. Do you see that? The people that are developing these hotels, do you see that they're, they're pulling back because of this new normal rate environment? Yeah, no question. Although, again, at least in the hospitality sector, I think it's a little less about the elevated interest rate environment and a little more about expectations that with pressure on the commercial office sector, uh, pressure on the commercial real, uh, excuse me, retail sector, that there will be increasing liquidity requirements placed on lenders. So we're not going to ask you to be a political prognosticator, but you are an economic prognosticator. Yeah. 
Um, what is, do you think is going to happen in the economy during the next 12 months leading up to Election Day, which is basically a year from now? Oh, well, there are, um, <coughs> sorry. there are three scenarios about the economy. One right now looks like uh, highly unlikely, a real, say, hard landing, severe recession, and a financial crisis. Six months ago with the banking problem, that was a risk. A year ago with rising inflation commodity prices, that was a risk. That tail risk is lower. So the question is whether the economy is going to have a soft landing, where you go back to 2% inflation uh, without any recession, or whether it's going to be a softish, bumpy landing, where in order to achieve 2% inflation, you're going to have a, a short and shallow recession. I would say that the, the jury is still out on that. The economic David actually right now look like in the direction of soft landing. Growth is still about potential. Inflation has been falling, and therefore we're going in the right direction. But interest rates are higher, higher for longer. That may slow down the economy. There are geopolitical risks that might lead to a spike in energy prices. And therefore, there are factors that could lead us to a short and shallow recession. And now, from a political point of view, even a short and shallow recession will be very damaging for Biden, because if there was a recession during an election year, of course, his popularity will further decrease. Yeah. So uh, we, p political polling is, is one thing which is not an, eco an economic indicator, but consumer confidence surveys are an economic indicator, and many of them are terrible. I mean, they are, uh, they are re re recessionary. I mean, it, people's attitudes are similar to what they are like during a recession. Do you see no um, uh, way in which people are going to feel better about the economy during the next 12 months? Well, it depends. <clears throat> if in the next 12 months we have a soft landing, if growth stays above potential, if inflation falls further, if real wages are increasing, then I think the consumer confidence is going to be increasing over time. The consumers, by the way, have still a buffer of about a trillion dollars of savings. 5% of their disposable income they can use in case there is a slowdown in the economy. And that's one of the reasons why the economy is be stronger than otherwise. We have the CHIPS Act, we have the Infrastructure Act, we have the IRA. Those are going to be fiscal boosts to the economy and to real incomes. So as long as the economy is going to do well and avoid the recession, I think consumer confidence is going to likely improve over time. You mentioned that this would be the seventh recession, I yes. think you just said. So how does this, what we're seeing today, compare to what you've seen in the past? Um, so we, one thing that we've often seen at this point in time, and, and I think it's interesting not to be critical, but um, you know, Janet Yellen said, um, we're definitely looking like we're going to have a soft landing. Now, she said that when she was vice chair of the Fed in 2007, two months before the great financial recession happened. So one thing that we're seeing that I've seen all the time is the expectation that we're going to have a soft landing. But I think it was Larry Summers who basically said, I don't understand why we're talking about this because it's never happened. So I think we should be very careful that it's very, very difficult, given all the complexities and everything going on in the world, uh, to navigate to a so-called soft landing. So I would expect that it's going to be difficult. They're always difficult, no matter what the causal factors are. Um, hopefully relatively short-lived, and many of them have been more short-lived than, than not. Uh, but it's going to be a difficult and choppier economy uh, going forward. So um, my expectation is we're going to continue to hear the hope there may be data points that give the market some ability to, to rise, but that you know, uh, we're, in, we're in a relatively um, difficult period over the course, I would suspect, of the next 15 to 18 months. And then there'll be a lot of opportunity beyond that. And I think as you look at it during the course of when things go down, as I said to some of our younger partners, you can't imagine how much worse it's going to be right now as you look at the world. Uh, but then there will be a point where you can't imagine how much better it's going to get. And we need to look, look through that with the perspective of, of having um, uh, a uh, whole series of these things to uh, look back on.
One CEO who has preached creativity is Bob Iger, your former boss. And Disney is a big story right now. We have the stock trading near multi-year record lows, another activist investor fight with Nelson Peltz. You're serving as a strategic advisor. So in what capacity are you working with Iger? And what advice are you giving him right now? Well, I can tell you what capacity I'm working to some degree. I can't tell you what advice I'm giving him. That's between, can't between, give all Bob, the secrets. between Bob and I, I suppose, and, and the board. But um, look, he needed, he needed um, a, some, peop, some part of his team back. He came back to a company that had vastly changed. Um, the, you know, the previous leadership I got, you know, under Bob Chapek had making some decisions that probably Bob Iger would not have taken. You know, he was CEO, free to do that. Um, but when you come back into a situation that's vastly changed from what you left, and a lot of the team, team that you had before and relied on before were gone, I, I left him in a position where he really wanted to have some people that he trusted you know, tell them what, what they thought. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not spending an enormous amount of time, but I was at the company for a long time. I've seen a lot of the dynamics that are happening out there in the world, and had he trust my judgment on some things. So I just I talk to him from time to time. So through your conversations with Iger, what do you think he is most focused on right now? He's definitely most focused on um, making sure that ESPN, a, a company that he really believes in strongly, is well positioned for the future. So ESPN, he said this publicly, ESPN is his first priority, and he has uh, ideas to fix that and to, and to strengthen it and to change his business model over time. He's, they're talking publicly about taking it out of the linear TV, TV bundle where it has been exclusively the main part of ESPN, the flagship, and moving that to also exist in an over-the-top world. So that's gonna be a really interesting transition, mm -hmm. and if, it can do, if, it, if that transition can be helped by parties that could be partners in a substantial way, that's what he's looking to do. Yahoo Finance's Invest Conference just wrapped up. Here are some of the biggest moments you might have missed. Jeffrey, it's, uh, it's always an honor to, to get some time with you. Thank you for agreeing to doing this conference. I know you're a very busy guy. And you know one vibe from inside this room here in New York City, Jeffrey, it's uh, a lot of folks, I think, are concerned about how far the Federal Reserve has come uh, on interest rates uh, and also concerned on how long they may hold interest rates at current levels. How, how concerned are you about what the Federal Reserve has done? Well, I, I think they had to raise interest rates because of their uh, delay in beginning raising interest rates and how slow they began. If only they had followed my advice in March of last year uh, to raise interest rates, not 25 or 50 basis points when they lifted off, but to 200 
I think we'd be in a much better place. We probably wouldn't have to be up at this level. But, you know, the yield curve is inverted. It has been. It's now de-inverting. It's flat. We have the unemployment rate is above its 12-month moving average. We have consumer confidence in the present is deteriorating. Uh, and it's always sort of cautious about the future, but usually uh, they're optimistic about the, the present, but that's starting to fade. So we have a lot of, of, of major indicators that have been in recessionary signaling for a year plus. And so I think the uh, Fed has stopped raising interest rates. I don't think we're gonna do it again. That's clearly the message from the bond market. The thing that worries me the most is the concept of higher for longer and not so much for the economy because once the economy uh, starts to noticeably weaken and it seems like that's almost happening in real time but once that happens the fed will cut interest rates the bond market's forecast is has been at odds with the fed's movements and the fed's dot plots for much of this year and now the uh, bond market's internal pricing suggests that the fed will cut rates 50 basis points or maybe five eighths of 1% during 2024. I, I believe that's the one thing that is not going to happen. I think they'll either stay higher for longer, which is their rhetoric, and I hope they don't, or the economy will noticeably weaken and they'll do what they always do, and that is cut interest rates much more rapidly than they raise them. I like to use the phrase, the Fed uh, takes the, uh, the stairs up and the elevator down when it comes to interest rates. So the reason I'm worried about higher for longer is something that's already in evidence but isn't getting enough attention, and that is our fiscal situation. The interest expense on the debt is exploding in a vertical fashion because all of those bonds that were issued back at 25 to 50 basis point interest rates or maybe uh, only as high as 1%, they're all rolling off, and they're rolling off with great speed. So you'd have to reinvest those bonds that were paying almost nothing at an interest rate of, well, if, at the Fed funds rate is five and three eighths percent. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a tremendous increase in interest expense of the debt. Already, the interest expense since the Fed started raising interest rates has gone up by hundreds of billions of dollars, almost half a trillion dollars per year. Yeah. And it's going literally vertical. And we have 30% of all of the bonds in the national debt, which is now $33.7 trillion. Not all of them are held by the public. Certainly the Fed owns about a little under eight trillion of them. But all of these bonds, about 17 trillion of them come due over the next 36 months. Yeah. So that means that if we keep interest rates higher for longer, these bonds that yield, you know, sort of one or 2% are going to be, uh, re you know, reissued at 300 basis points or more higher interest rates. And on 17 trillion, that's another 500 mm -hmm. you know, billion dollars. So we have a massive problem that's coming, look, that we're staring down because of the low interest rates being in place for so many uh, years, almost a decade, mm -hmm. and now the Fed being higher for longer. And this is happening also to small businesses who used to pay 4%, and now they're paying 9 or even 12%, which is obviously another problem if we're higher for longer because a lot of people can bridge a gap of temporary inflated interest expense, but not if we're gonna be higher for longer. Je so my, my belief is that we're going to be in recession. If we're not already in recession, mm -hmm. we'll probably be in a recession uh, by the second quarter of 2024. So when I hear you say in this room here, uh, in New York City here, as you say, there might be a recession next year, what is your best advice to investors? Where do they go? Well, you should be up in quality. You, you, right now, there's a strange level place to stand because I think in a Pavlovian sense, which you've already started to see happening over the past week, that when people are getting more inclined to believe that the economy is softening, they have a Pavlovian response uh, born of 40 years of experience of falling interest rates on a secular basis that you just automatically want to buy bonds. You want, you want to upgrade in credit quality, and that's working. I mean, bonds have done really well over the past week. Stocks have done well too because they needed bonds uh, to do well to, to uh, kind of uh, stop falling, uh, which happened over the last the last few months. But I think what most investors are going to be surprised by is while interest rates will probably fall in an automatic reaction to weaker economic growth, I don't think they're going to stay low 
because of the supply problem. This fiscal problem is going to get much, much worse in a recession because, of course, there's going to be a strong response. It's going to be probably an inflationary response to uh, this, this, this fiscal situation. And so weirdly, I think we're going to have higher interest rates uh, uh, in the aftermath of the recessionary response. So we may actually have lower interest rates in the first half of 2024, which I think is likely it's already begun. But then interestingly, we might have to pivot to the re reality of a, I don't know, uh, debt to GDP, which is now running at six to 8%, uh, which is already incredibly high given the idea that people think the economy is pretty decent. We could easily see the, uh, the deficit go to 9% of GDP. And it, it, when you start to look at the arithmetic of all of this, it's really uh, rather, rather troubling. I mean, like I said, 36% of the debt rolls off, uh, half of the debt rolls off for the next 36 months. But what if the deficit is 9% of GDP? And what if interest rates are at 6% instead of at 3%, which is the average yield on the entire treasury debt? Stuff that's rolling off in the next 36 months probably has a lower interest rate than the 3% average across the curve. But you can just start to see what's going to happen to the interest expense. And in five years, let's just say we go higher for longer and we have a, a 6% uh, interest rate and we have 9% uh, of, of uh, deficits per GDP. Amazingly, by 2028, using the CBO's own assumptions, which are probably overly optimistic, 50% of all tax receipts would be going to debt payments which of course is an impossibility given that 70% of the of the of the budget is mandatory spending you can't have half of it going to interest rate expense so this is really we're really getting to that moment that we've all been uh, us old timers have been talking about for decades we used to be when i was maybe 10 years into this business it used to be well we all know that we're on an unsustainable path but it's really going to hit the fan in about 2050 and then all of a sudden it was 2040, and now the CBO themselves and the Social Security trustees themselves acknowledge that they're out of money in about seven years. Mm. And that's assuming no recession. So we're basically at the, that moment where it's not our grandchildren's problem, it's not our children's problem, it's our problem. Yeah. And uh, what investors have been trained to think they understand is a secularly falling interest rate regime. Because even if you've been around for 40 years like me, you've broadly experienced falling interest rates and oftentimes of some significance. And our entire economy is debt uh, is based on debt. And you know, one thing that investors think they know is how relationships hold. Mm -hmm. When you're in recessions, interest rates fall. You know, when, uh, when you get, uh, companies get stressed, they're able to refinance because you're in a secular falling interest rate environment, but you're not anymore. Yeah. Interest rates are not falling anymore on a secular basis. They actually bottomed out between 2016 and around 2020. And uh, what will happen if you can't refinance and you would go into recession and interest rates aren't down, but they're up? I mean, these, these are things that people have to open their mind to. It's almost like a, a metaphor that is already happening in real time for the housing market. You know, people thought that interest rates on mortgages going from roughly 3% to roughly 8% would be crippling for the housing market. Well, it's been crippling for uh, existing home turnover because there's no supply because nobody that has a mortgage at 3% wants to sell their house mm -hmm. and take out a mortgage at 8%, yeah. right? So the, the housing market has held up remarkably in terms of its pricing due to no supply. Mm -hmm. So the interest rates have gone up, but the prices have stayed up. In fact, the Case Schiller uh, 10 city index is actually a new high. Yeah. So home affordability is at an all time low. So all of our lives have been geared to low interest rates. And now that we start to uh, understand that higher interest rates have a consequence, I think that this idea that we're going to avoid a recession mm -hmm. is, uh, is really losing steam, uh, thanks to, in particular, the uh, employment data that came out mm -hmm. on Friday, which was definitely weak. But 34% yeah. of the jobs, even though there were only about 100,000 jobs officially created, 34% of them were government jobs. Yeah. So there were hardly any private sector jobs. And there's another survey that doesn't get as much play, which is called the household survey. And it actually has been showing job losses. Mm -hmm. So there's this weird uh, behavior in the labor data that I'm starting to get suspicious about. Mm -hmm. And that is that we get these, these jobs reports and they, they tend to look fairly good until the most recent one. 
But strangely, there's revisions uh, that go back a few months. So the revisions that came out on Friday actually show that the, the, the job market wasn't as strong. And I'm starting to get cynical about some of this government data. I'm wondering if they don't intentionally over-report the, the first uh, headline data number on the first Friday of a month for the preceding month so that we can get sound bites from politicians to say, hey, look, a great jobs report. Yeah. And then they sweep under the rug the fact that there's revisions in the past. Really putting forth the case, Jeffrey, of, of economy that could hit a recession next year. It's slowing. Deficits are out of control. So my question to you is, does that argue the need for a Republican in the White House, someone that may want to wrangle and get down government spending? Because I think a lot of folks in the Wall Street community will acknowledge that this current administration has spent a ton, infrastructure, EVs, you name it, that has contributed to the deficit. Well, I wish they'd actually spent things, spent the money on the things that you you uh, just listed. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of the money gets wasted. I'm sure a lot of the money gets uh, disappears. I know a lot of the money we sent to Ukraine, for example, the, the Ukrainian officials say that they're, 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 the money is disappearing. They're, they're stealing it like there's no tomorrow. So we're not really investing the money, but a Republican coming into the office, how's that gonna help? We run up these deficits under every administration. Uh, it's basically a disease that we, we believe that we can run a $2 trillion budget deficit in perpetuity. Uh, and so I think, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's a Republican versus Democrat issue. I think it's a mathematician versus pseudo economist issue. And I'm a mathematician, and that's what I've been trying to outline uh, so far in this conversation. But the politicians, they actually have put out ideas like modern monetary theory, which you notice how that's disappeared. That was, that was about five years ago. The idea was you could spend endless amounts of money, and they had some bizarre theory that it wouldn't cause inflation. I think all those guys have gone back into their rat hole because <laughs> obviously got inflation when we spent the four and a half trillion dollars which supposedly under modern monetary theory wouldn't have had a problem. So what, what we need is a mathematician and, and, and not, not a supply side uh, economist. Jeff, let's start by taking a step back and okay. talking about where things stand in the media industry right now. We were just listening to Kevin Mayer. He was on stage just before us talking about some of the disruption that's happening specifically at Disney. But when you take in, into account what's happening across the landscape, 
Where do you see the future of media going? Wow, okay. Um, well, look, I mean, obviously this is a very uh, uh, transitional time for media. I mean, obviously every uh, legacy media company for sure, but even many of the newer companies are facing challenges uh, you know, with distribution, with advertising, with the macro economy, uh, how people are consuming. Look, this is, a, this is a difficult time in media. But the one thing that you know is that people are always going to want to watch great entertainment and they're going to want to watch sports and they're going to want to consume news and information. So that is always going to be uh, there. The question is how? And I think that we're in a, we're in a transition time that takes three, five, seven years. Nobody knows for sure. Um, but the reality is great content, great information, uh, great sports will always win out. How it's distributed is, is the question. And uh, there will be new uh, combinations, new forms of distribution over the next three, five, seven years, some of which we don't see today. Um, and, and so, but right now, clearly, it's a, it's a difficult time for all, all media companies, both legacy and, uh, uh, and new, if you're not named Netflix. Yeah, exactly. We talk about the future of cable, a lot of the debate out there is whether or not cable is going to survive. You mentioned the fact that there's a lot to be excited about in terms of how certain things are obviously very valuable still. Mm -hmm. Is cable going to survive? Well, I mean, look, I think cable will be here for the next, you know, cable will be here for the next decade. Yeah. It obviously will continue to diminish. Um, uh, by the way, beyond the next decade, nobody knows what anything will look like, right? But, but cable will be part of the landscape for, for the next decade. It will obviously continue uh, to have fewer and fewer uh, subscribers. But you know, even at 45, 50 million subscribers, cable is still a very powerful uh, distribution outlet. So yes, cable is not what it was when we had nearly 100 million subscribers uh, a decade ago. But even at half of that, it's still powerful. Beyond a decade from now, I don't think anybody has any clue. So Jeff, let's talk about what you're doing right now. CEO of Redbird IMI, you've made three investments so far, Front Office Sports, Hidden Pigeon, and Everwonder Studio. Why do those investments make sense given the changes that you were just talking about within the environment, within I think, the industry? Yeah, well, I think that they make sense because, uh, go back to what I said before, great content will win. And no matter what the distribution mechanism is, you're, you're going to want great content. And so what we're looking at is trying to build over time, build, uh, invest in, acquire uh, platforms in the entertainment space and in the news space. And, um, and scale them uh, and grow them globally. So global platforms on the news and entertainment uh, sides. And within entertainment, that'll be scripted, unscripted, children's, gaming, whatever. And so, you know, the three investments that we've made uh, thus far, uh, Ever Wonders, a, a nonfiction studio producing documentaries and, and series uh, on the entertainment side. Um, Hidden Pigeon Company uh, is the uh, intellectual property of the incredible children's author Mo Willems. Anybody who has kids ages four to nine will know that Mo Willems is the, you know, leading author, and and so that's an opportunity to uh, further uh, push his great intellectual property into into video, and uh, and then Front Office Sports uh, is really uh, a, a new digital outlet that's covering the intersection of sports and business. Uh, and so that, that moves us into the, the digital news and information space. So that's really how they play into our hopes to build over time uh, two platforms, news and, and entertainment, uh, that are global, independent, and scaled. So let's talk a little bit more, more about some of the disruption, not to focus on Disney once again, but I'm curious to get your perspective on what is happening right now. Bob Iger, back as CEO, he's laid out a number of initiatives uh, changes that he has already made to the company. I'm curious what your advice would be to Iger today. Oh, well, first of all, I, Bob has been one of the, uh, the greatest CEOs in all of industry. He, he'll, uh, you know, clearly he has challenges as, as they were just discussing, as, as we were talking about, every media company faces them. I'm in no position to offer advice, mm -hmm. um, uh, but clearly they are going through that transition that I was talking about. and. You know, even Disney is not immune to that, and so I think that shows you that uh, everyone is really uh, struggling. We're in this transition period of the next few years 
where, where what we have known will be very different. Uh, um, the one constant will be the great sports that are on ESPN, you know, or the great content that's on Hulu or uh, the cable networks there. And, you know, that comes back to, I think the thing that will, will succeed is great content, uh, uh, no matter what the distribution mechanism or platform is, whether it's, you know, uh, something like TikTok or something like ESPN uh, or one of the legacy cable outlets. They all need great content. Jeff, let's talk about where you were before Redbird IMI, and that's CNN, mm -hmm. president of CNN. There was a story that ran over the summer talking about if CNN were to ever be put up for sale, that you would potentially be interested in buying it, a potential suitor. Any truth to that? Well, what that story said was that we were trying to, uh, trying to buy it, and there was absolutely no truth to that Why whatsoever. Not? Would you ever be interested in these cables? You know, look, I mean, I think what we've said on that, we're, we're certainly not looking at it. It's not for sale. Um, you know, I think what we've always said is any asset uh, of that stature, CNN is a fantastic asset. Uh, anything that, that came to market, we would obviously look at. Um, it's not something that we're uh, actively thinking about or pursuing. It's absolutely, as far as we know, not for sale. Um, uh, so there was no truth uh, in, in any way whatsoever uh, to that uh, Variety report this, uh, this summer. Um, uh, someday, if it were uh, available, like any other great asset, we would look at it. And, and that's not to uh, um, say yes or no. It's just to say it's a great asset. If the time came, we would look at it. Jeff, let's turn to the 2024 election. Here we are just about a year out. There was a New York Times poll earlier this week talking about the fact that former President Donald Trump is leading in key swing states. When you think about another potential Trump presidency, the risks that are associated with that and what you learned or your biggest takeaways from covering 2016, his presidency, obviously, and then the 2020 election. Yeah, 2016, 2020, and now 24. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, I think that, um, I think a couple of things. One, um, you know, there's a lot of people in this country who don't see risks associated uh, with that possibility. And I, I think that you have to acknowledge that as well, right? I think that the reason that a lot of people woke up in 2016 and were surprised that Donald Trump had won is because they never really uh, took that seriously. And, and I think that, Anyone who doesn't think that, that that's a, a distinct possibility here in 24 uh, is fooling themselves. So that, uh, that is real, and, and you have to acknowledge that a lot of those people who support him don't see it as a risk. Now, on the other hand, uh, uh, I think that the key uh, in preparing for that possibility, and, and I think you have to acknowledge it's a real possibility, is, um, is not to get caught up in the uh, in the polls that came out yesterday. There's so much attention uh, attended to that, uh, and I, I think that continues to be a huge mistake uh, in, the, Why is uh, that? in the media. Well, because, you know, first of all, uh, if you went by the poll in 1983, uh, you would have thought that there's no way that Ronald Reagan could win re-election, or, or the poll in 2011, there's no way that Barack Obama could have won re-election. Now, obviously, things are different now. We're, you know, this is not 1983, this is not 2011. Uh, uh, the media is different, social media is different, the world has changed a lot. Having said that, I think that, you know, I made this mistake, uh, so I always try to, like, be, uh, you know, be self-aware of these things. You know, listen, we would often uh, pay too much attention to polls as well. So this is not like, oh, they're doing it, but we never made this mistake. Of course we made this mistake. Uh, I'm just saying that I think that, you know, I think that this is a time that requires much more reporting. I think I look at the piece, uh, you know, that the New York Times did last week on on the people that the Trump administration would hire or is working with now uh, to, to set in place their plans. I look at the piece that the Washington Post that Josh Dossie and Devlin Barrett wrote over the weekend about what a Trump administration would look like. That's the kind of reporting and, and, and uh, discussion that I think needs to be much more vigorous. Not like, not don't take me through the horse race for the next 12 months. Take me through what, what it will be. And, you know, for some, that will then portray the risks that you talked about. And I think those risks are real. I think that we are at a critical time uh, in America. And, uh, and I do think American democracy uh, is very much 
uh, uh, on the line. You just need to look at uh, the interview that George Stephanopoulos did with uh, Majority Leader Steve Scalise on Sunday uh, uh, to see that election denialism uh, is incredibly uh, strong and rampant in this country and, uh, and a huge issue. So then how does the media then win back that lost trust amongst some? Well, I mean, I think that that, that, I think that is a, that's an issue. Look, I, I think we're at a unique uh, time uh, in, uh, in America. The media has always, uh, you know, everybody's always wanted to beat up on the media. Uh, yes, people say they hate the media, but, or they don't trust the media. Institutions in America uh, in the last five, eight years have come under huge uh, uh, assault. Uh, much of that from Donald Trump. And, uh, and I think that that has torn down many of our great institutions in this country, including media. And, and I think that we just have to recognize that, that there's a reason that they want to take down the media, because they don't want uh, the media to, to do those stories that the Washington Post did or the New York Times did. And they don't want the media to ask Steve Scalise five times whether or not uh, uh, Joe Biden won the election. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, if you focus on how do we win back that trust in the media, then you might be afraid to do your job. Mm -hmm. I think the key is do your job, seek the truth, uh, don't give air and time to those who lie, and, uh, and uh, you know, over time, the truth will win out. But if you don't allow, uh, but if you don't keep going, uh, then I think we could be in for a huge issue, and I think this is as serious a time for American democracy uh, as we've seen uh, maybe in 250 years.